Why, good evening, everybody. My name is Cameron, and welcome back to the floor. About a couple of weeks ago, actually about a month or so ago, I got myself this nice beanbag chair, and it's the perfect place to sit around, relax a little bit, perhaps grab yourself a drink, or perhaps two. In my case, it's water and tea this evening, and a nice book to read. I uh, came across this book. A um, friend of mine let me borrow it said it was a very, very good book. And so I'm deciding to read it this evening. I have not done much of my research on it, but um, it looks like it'll be a nice read, I think. They had a community goal the other day, 30,000 party hat points, properly applied party hats, and uh, we would be reading this book in particular. People seemed excited about it for some reason. And so uh, well, I'm looking forward to it. Tonight's book is called, evidently, Ice Planet Barbarians, a sci-fi romance by Ruby Dixon. The back of the book reads as such. Lost. You'd think being abducted by aliens would be the worst thing that could happen to me. And you'd be wrong. Because now the aliens are having ship trouble, and they've left their cargo of human women, including me, on an ice planet. Found. And the only native inhabitant I've met, he's big, horned, blue, and really, really has a thing for me. SM Book Obsession goes on record as saying a brilliant and extremely addictive story. Ellipses. It's kind of cute. I can see a little, I can see a little galaxy up here. Very nice. I see a barcode. It's also very nice. This little UFO over here, vaguely obscuring my face. And on the front, um, what seems to be um, a nice planet barbarian making a warm embrace with a woman with brown hair. The, the individual has blue locks and blue skin, and there's a lot of sparklies around here. Hello, Annie. I'm so excited for this stream. I don't know why you would be. I don't know what I'm getting myself into, and so I will continue to feign ignorance as long as I possibly can. A little bit of a warning. We're reading a book this evening. So as such, in case I'm not as active on chat, feel free to continue to uh, talk amongst yourselves. I'm just going to try to remain focused on the book. The reward said that we will read. I will read the book out loud. And so such we will. Party party hat points and stuff will still be honored as normally. Consumption, voices, singing, and the such. Let's get things started. I'm looking forward to it. Again, good evening, good morning, good twilight, good dawn to everybody out there joining us now. Ice Planet Barbarians, a science fiction romance by Ruby Dixon. Also, I just noticed my microphone might be really loud. I completely forgot to turn down my gain. So because I the microphone actually fell off of its stand right before the stream started. I apologize if it was loud. It's now better. In any case, here we go. Other titles by Ruby Dixon include The Bedlam Butchers, Off Limits, Packing Double, Double Trouble, Double Down, Double or Nothing, Ice Planet Barbarians. Volume well, sounds good on the phone. I'm glad to hear it. So long as everything's okay. So long as I'm not like killing people is in their ears. I mean, killing people's eardrums. Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. We shared the title at least two or three times. This book is a work of fiction. The names, characters, places, and incidents are products of the writer's imagination or have been used fictitiously and are not to be construed as real. Any resemblance to persons, living or dead, actual events, locales, or organizations is entirely coincidental. No part of this book may be reproduced, scanned, or distributed in any manner whatsoever without written permission from the author, except in the case of brief quotation embodied in critical articles and reviews. Ice Planet Barbarians, copyright 2015, Ruby Dixon, all rights reserved, first edition, April 2015, rubydixon.com. I'm really happy this is not a true story. Anyway, we move on with um, my creative interpretation of Ice Planet Barbarians. I just noticed my face is obscured by chat a little bit. It's gonna be okay. Actually, let me, just for the purposes, just for the purposes of this exposure here, I'm gonna put chat down here. There we go. I hope y'all didn't mind the bumpy ride. Georgie. Up until yesterday, I, Georgie Carothers, never believed in aliens. Oh sure, there were all kinds of possibilities out there in the universe, but if somebody would have told me that little green men were hanging around Earth in flying saucers, just waiting to abduct people, I would have told them they were crazy. But that was yesterday. Today, today's a very different kind of story. I suppose it all started last night. 
It was pretty ordinary. Overall, I came home after a long day of working the drive through teller window at the bank, nuked a lean cuisine, ate it while watching TV, and dozed off on the couch before stumbling to bed. Not exactly the life of the party, but hey, it was a Tuesday, and Tuesdays were all work, no play. I went to sleep, and from there, shit got weird. My dreams were messed up. Not the usual losing teeth or naked in front of the class dreams, they were far more sinister. Dreams of loss and abandonment. Dreams of pain and cold white rooms. Dreams of walking in a tunnel and seeing an oncoming train. In that dream, I tried to lift my hand to shield me from the light. Except when I went to raise my hand, I couldn't. That had woken me up from my slumber. I squinted into the tiny light someone was shining in my eyes. Someone was shining something in my eyes? Someone was shining something in my eyes. I blinked, tried to focus, and realized that I wasn't dreaming at all. I wasn't home either. I was somewhere new. When the light clicked off and a bird chirped, I squinted, my eyes adjusting to the darkness, and I found myself surrounded by things. Things with long black eyes and big heads and skinny pale arms. Little green men. I knew it. I'd screamed. I'd screamed bloody murder, actually. Just like this. Ah. That wasn't in the book. That was my interpretation. One of the aliens tilted its head at me. And the bird chirping sound went, happened again, even though his mouth didn't move. Something hot and dry wrapped over my mouth, choking me. An obnoxious scent filled my nostrils. Oh shit, was I gonna die? Frantically, I worked my jaw, trying to breathe even as the world got dark around me. Then, I went back to sleep. Dreaming of work. I always dreamed of work when I was stressed. For hours on end, angry banking clients yelled at me as I kept trying to tear open packs of twenties that wouldn't seem to come open. I'd try to count out change only to get distracted. Work dreams are the worst, usually. But this one was a relief. No trains, no aliens, just banking. I could deal with banking. And that brings me to here. I'm awake. Awake and not entirely sure where I am. My eyes slide open and gaze around me. It smells like I'm in a sewer. I can feel a wall behind me, and my body hurts all freaking over. Excuse me. My head feels blurry and slow, like all of me hasn't quite woken up yet. My limbs feel heavy. Drugged? I realize someone's drugged me. Not someone. Something. My breath quickens as a mental image of the dark-eyed aliens returns, and I look for them. Wherever I'm at, I'm alone. <laughs> Thank God. I squint in the low light, trying to make out my surroundings. It seems to be a large, dark room. Faint orange light is emitted from small running tubes in the ceiling about 20 feet above. The walls themselves are black, and if I didn't know better, I'd say this looks like a cargo bay from some weird science fiction movie. Excuse me. On the wall opposite me, I count six large, six-foot metal tubes lined up against the wall with lockers. Like lockers. Orange and green lights run up and down the sides of the tube in a variety of squiggles and dots that might be some sort of alien writing. On the far wall, there's an oblong oval door. I can't get to the door, though, because I'm behind a metal grid of some kind. And there's a god-awful smell. Actually, it's not just one smell. <laughs> it's several of them. It's like a piss-shit-vomit-sweat cocktail. Doesn't sound very good. And it makes me gag. I try to cover my mouth with my hand, but my arm is slow to respond, and all I manage to do is flail a little. Ugh. I swing my drugged, heavy head, looking around the room. Actually, I'm not alone. Now that I look around, there are others piled onto this side of the grid. Bodies curled up and asleep. In the low light, I count seven, maybe eight forms about my size, huddled together like puppies. Seeing as how we're all on this side of the metal grid, I'm starting to suspect I'm in a jail cell of some kind. Or a cage. I guess if I have to be in a cage, could be worse. There's room enough to stand, though not much more than that. At least there are no aliens in here with me. I want to panic, but I'm too out of it. This is like going to the dentist's office and getting a dose of laughing gas. I'm having a hard time focusing on anything. My bare upper arm aches and I sluggishly rub my fingers on it. There are several raised bumps on my arm that they weren't there before, and I rub it harder, feeling something hard under the skin. What the fuck? I try to peer at it in the dark, but I can't see anything. Images of the aliens, and the light shining in my eyes, the nightmares, the terror, it all rises, and I panic. A whimper escapes in my throat. Eh. A hand touches my other arm. 
Don't scream, the girl whispers. I roll my too heavy head until I can look over at her. She's about my age, but blonde and thinner than me. Her hair is long and dirty, her eyes big in her lean face. She glances around the room and then puts a finger to her lips in case I didn't understand her earlier warning. Silence. Okay. Okay. I choke the cry rising in my throat and try to remain calm. I nod. Don't scream. Don't scream. I can't keep my, keep my shit together. I, I can. You all right? Yeah. I slur. My mouth unable to form words and I drool all over myself. Lovely. I lift one of my heavy hands to swipe at my mouth. <laughs> Sorry. You're okay, she says before I can panic again. Her voice is pitched low so as to not wake up the others. We're all a bit hungover when we wake up. They drug everyone when they arrive. It'll wear off in a bit. I'm Liz. Georgie, I tell her, taking time to sound out my name properly. I rub my arm and point at it, at the strange bumps. What's going on? Well, Liz says, you were abducted by aliens, but I guess that one was obvious, right? I smile wryly. I try to. I probably just end up drooling on myself again. Liz shifts next to me. Okay, let me see if I can hit the big highlights. Everyone else here? She thumbs up a gesture at the others piled into the cage, still sleeping. They've been abducted too. All Earth, most American. I think there's a Canadian one in there. You 22? Yes? Yeah, I thought so. We all are. Let me also guess. Live alone. Not pregnant. No major health issues. No nearby family. How? Huh? Because we're all in the same boat. Liz says, her tone bleak. Every girl they picked up has the same story, except for Megan. She was pregnant. Two months along, she said, and they vacuumed her out like it was no big deal. Liz shudders. <laughs> so I'm guessing that wherever they're taking us, they don't want pregnant girls. Just young and healthy. Only girls? Evidently. Oh, God. I swallow hard, fighting the urge to puke. There's really no place to do it, though. I'm starting to suspect I know why the place smells like sewage. Liz's scent isn't exactly pleasant. How long have you been here? Me? She asks. Two weeks. Kira's been here the longest that we know of. She's the one with the earpiece. I look around, but I don't see an earpiece on anyone in particular. It's a translator. Liz explains. You'll see soon enough. I'm throwing too much at you at once, aren't I? Okay, let's try this again. See those tubes? She points at the far wall at the things that reminded me of oversized lockers. Kira saw what was in them. She said there are more girls, just like us. <gasps> I gasp. The sound watery and over loud. More people? Liv waves at me, indicating we should be quiet. And I nod, rubbing those itchy bumps on my arm. She peers around to see if anyone's coming and... When no one appears, scoots even closer to me. I smell her body next to mine. Her scent sweaty, but human. Yeah, so they picked up Kira, and she said they keep kept talking to her and she couldn't understand them. So they took her by the ear and more or less stapled in some sort of ear piece that translates things. But I guess they only had one of the suckers, so she has to translate for the rest of us. Stapled? I repeat, horrified at the thought. Yep. Tagged her like a cow. Liz grimaces. Sorry. I'm from Oklahoma. I guess that visual doesn't bother me as much as you. Where are you from? Orlando? I'm not sure if my mouth will work around Florida without a spray of spit. She nods. We're kind of scattered all over the place. Anyhow, from what Kira's been able to pick up, our new friends are smugglers of some kind. Guess what they trade in? Girls? Now, yep. She points at the lockers again. My guess is that they came here to pick up eight, then had such a good run that they decided to squeeze a few more into the hold and make out like bandits or something. Kira says someone new pops up every other day or so. We figure they're going to pack us up like sardines and then sell us off to... I don't know. Wherever. She shudders. I'm trying not to think that far ahead because I'll just start screaming and you don't want to know what happens when you start screaming. Oh no. What? You'll see soon enough. Liz says in a sick voice, Just trust me. The skinny ones don't like noise. Remember that. Okay. I remember her warning from before. Okay. Um, my arm. 
Little bumps on it? Yeah. They have a doctor of some kind, or a veterinarian. Who knows? He shows up when we just first get here, jabs a bunch of needles into us, sticks the silver thing in, our, in your skin, and then leaves. I'm thinking it's kind of like when the vet shows up at the farm, inoculates the cows, sticks a tracker in their ear, except ours is in our arms, but they're comparing us to cows again. There, there I go. Comparing us to cows again. I probably shouldn't, right? Because cause we ate cows. I mumble between drooling my, to myself. List snorts. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I think they're talking too much trouble with us, us to eat us. Um, unless we're a delicacy of some kind. Which I wouldn't rule out. But... Yeah. Yeah. I echo. Try and get some sleep if you can. Liz murmurs, patting my sore arm. Sleeping's pretty much the only escape we have. Enjoy it. That Liz. Such an optimist. I wrap my arms around my chest and notice I'm still wearing the sleeveless shorty pajama set I'd gone to sleep in. It's not very warm or very concealing, and I absurdly wish that I'd gone to sleep in a big flannel pajama set. And then I went out to weep. To think I haven't dressed properly for alien abduction. My shoulders shake with mirth until mirth turns into tears. So yeah, yesterday, I didn't believe in aliens. But that was yesterday. I quietly weep myself back to sleep. Good evening to Annie and Lil Abe, who I see who have popped into chat so far. If y'all haven't caught on, you can see that my heart rate is in the corner. No particular reason why. I just wanted to see. LMAO, what is the proper outfit to be abducted in? Full suit. Always. Male, female, or otherwise. I figure out a few things over the next day on the spaceship. I figure out that there is no toilet. It seems our captors hadn't thought through the whole stuff, the whole full of stolen girls thing. We have to make do with a bucket in a corner, hence the sewage smell. Dignity? Gone! Nothing like waiting your turn on the poop bucket to make you lose what little humanity you have left. I figure out that food is tiny little bricks that look like dried seaweed and taste like shit. We get two of those a day. Water? It's dispensed from a faucet of some kind that reminds me of a gerbil feeder set in the wall. The welts on my arm go down over the next several hours, though one rough little bump remains. Through feeling it and peering at the other girl's arms, I'm guessing it's some sort of electronic tracking device they've implanted. Cattle tags as Liz had called them. At the moment, I think it's pretty damn apt. I figure out that there are two kinds of aliens. There are the fragile green ones that seem to be in charge and the basketball-headed ones that are security. I call them basketball heads not because they've got oversized brains, but because of the pebbly, hairless, orangish texture of their skin. It looks bizarre above the collar of the gray bodysuits they wear day in and day out. The basketball heads are pretty horrific. And no matter the stupid name, they have weird little bug eyes with an opaque eyelid over them and needle-like teeth. They have two fingers and a thumb instead of five, and they're tall. The little green men, the ones that make the bird noises, they're not more than three feet tall or so, and they rarely show up. The basketball heads, though, they're in the hold. Constantly. Everyone's terrified of them, too. I figure this out when I wake up the next morning, though I suppose it could be the afternoon, and see everyone else is awake. The last of the dopey meds seem to have worn off, and I stifle a yawn, <sighs> blinking. I want to be silent, because silent is good. It takes me a moment to realize everyone's moving to the far side of the cage, huddling away from the bars. The hairs on the back of my neck rise, and I follow the others. Heading to the back, I want to ask what's going on, but the moment I open my mouth, Liz shakes her head silently, her gaze fixed on something over my shoulder. I turn and flinch at the sight of a basketball-headed alien peering through the bars at me. I flinch again when he gives me a leering grin and I scoot closer to the others. No screaming. Someone murmurs as a warning. God, this is freaking me out. I nod. No way am I making a sound. The ball heads remain in our room all day. It's like they're waiting for something. I'm afraid to wonder what it is. We huddle in the corner of the cage on edge and another unconscious girl is brought into the room after a few hours. No one even tries to escape when they open the door. We just sit and watch as they shove the newest girl inside and close the door again. I can guess why no one wants to attempt a breakout. Where would we go? And the consequences of disobedience must be bad, because everyone in the cage is utterly frightened by the basketball heads. Someone grabs the new girl by the arm and tries to pull her into our huddled pile. She's about my age and has pretty red hair. 
I noticed the ball heads keep coming back to the cage and commenting on her in their weird, garbled language, making hand gestures from time to time. And then they laugh. Yee! High pitched, eerie sound that grates on my freight nerves. Yee! Yee! Is what I imagine they would sound like. It's almost like they're taking bets on the new girl. A few hours later, she wakes up. I'm hunkered down next to Liz and startled out my stupor when she inhales sharply. The girl sobs aloud, her eyes going wide. Don't scream! I hear a low voice hiss. I can't make out who said it, but I know we're all thinking it. The redhead isn't listening, though. She takes one look around her, panics, and begins to scream. Her shrill cry echoes in the hold. She won't stop. Even though others are waving their hands and touching her, trying to calm her down, she's hysterical. Her cries go louder and more panicked the more awake she gets. The flails and thrashes against our warning touches. Something keep beeps overhead. The others in the cage go utterly still. Weird bird-like chirps fill the air from the intercom. One of the ball heads touches a panel that lights up, and he gargles a response. The crowd of girls seems to shrink back as the other ball head approaches the cage and opens the door. It's freedom, but no one's reaching. The redhead is snagged. She's a fighter. I'll give her that. She thrashes and flails as they touch her, screaming obscenities in French and shrieking for help. Everyone else sits quietly, watching. I can't stand this. I try to get up to go help her. Liz grabs my legs. Don't, she hisses. Don't call attention to yourself, Georgie. Trust me. Even though it goes against everything inside me to do nothing, I'm terrified too. It's too easy to sit down and huddle with the mass of girls again, to hit, sit and wait and see what happens when someone disobeys the unspoken gag order, and I hate myself for it. A moment later, the redhead's dragged to what I thought was an examining table. I watch in horror as one of the ball heads slaps some sort of mask over her mouth. When she goes silent, I realize it's a muzzle of some kind. My own mouth thins, my teeth clamping together. I feel sick as her hands are stretched over her head and bound at the far end of the table with a cord that snakes around her wrists. Her hips and legs hang over the edge, and I start imagining the worst. She continues to kick and flail as one of the aliens grabs her skirt and rips it from her body. Don't look. Liz whispers to me. I look, though. Someone has to look. Someone has to see. Oh, God. Sick at heart, I watch as the redhead bucks and tries to free herself. I would like to give a content warning, first and foremost. Content warning. Sick at heart. I watch as the redhead bucks and tries to free herself. I watch as the first alien undoes the front of the uniform with a touch at the collar. I watch as his friend makes laughing comments as he mounts the gagged woman. I watch dry-eyed, and full of hate as they laugh to get on top of her over and over and over again. It seems to go on forever. At some point, she stops fighting and goes limp, and I hope she's passed out. I hope she doesn't remember any of this. Liz squeezes my hand. Kira says they have standing orders that they're allowed to discipline any misbehaving captives. I nod and finally look away as the aliens talk in their weird language and switch places once more. I'm guessing she's good in Discipline by now? I want to scream, but loud noises aren't allowed. I dig my nails into my palms and gaze down the row of pale faces in the pen with me, trying to figure out which one is Kira. A girl at the end with silky, flat brown hair is weeping with her hands pressed to her ears. It's as if she can't stand to hear what's going on, but the redhead is silent. There's only alien chatter. That must be Kira. She's the only one who can understand them. Thanks to the device implanted in her ear, I scan the others. They're in shock. Eyes averted. One girl wears a look of horrified grief, and I wonder if she, had, she was a screamer too. I decide I don't want to know. I squeeze my eyes shut, trying to drown out the world. Trying to exist in a quiet bubble where none of this is real, where if I pinched my arm hard enough, everything will go away and I'll wake up. But when I close my eyes, I realize that I'm in a book, and it's all fiction. I see the redhead's face and she's raped. I see the ball head's face as he jokes and yammers away in his alien language as he does that again to the girl. As if, it, as if it's no big deal. Just another day at the office. Typical water cooler shit. <laughs> Liz is right. We're nothing but cattle, these things. They're going to sell us to someone else to go at, to eat, or both. Something else more horrible than I can, can't even imagine. I'm not going to take my fate. Sitting down, though, I cross my arms tightly 
over my pajamas, draw my legs up, and study my surroundings. I look at each nook and cranny of the strange walls, trying to determine if there's anything I can grab that can be used as a weapon. Because I'm going to kill these pebbly, gross bastards if they ever try to touch me. No one else comes on board the ship for the next week, so I'm starting to suspect we're full which is good, considering that our tiny hold gets more and more crowded feeling with every hour. Now with Dominique. The brutalized redhead squeezed in with us? We feel like sardines. Not that anyone is jumping up to complain. Liz and I talk quietly during the night. When the guards leave us alone, we must be heading out to space now. Our ears have been popped repeatedly during the last few days, and we suspect we've begun traveling at a high speed. And we don't know what to do about it. We start with killing the guards, I tell Liz, and Kira for the second time tonight. The little green men seem to have the basketball heads doing all the grunt work. I think if we get rid of the orange ones, maybe we can bully our way into a demanding return over to Earth. Tiny flaw in the plan, Georgie, says Liz. Ever the practical one. She gestures at the bars of the cage. We're on this side, and they're on the other side. With guns. We need to do something to prompt them open the door. Kira's quiet voice cuts through the darkness. I'd say we could wait for another captive to show up, but... Yeah, I say thoughtfully, my gaze sliding over to where Dominique huddles in a corner, alone. She's been a straight-up mess ever since they'd returned to her to the cage. She's quiet now, of course. She spends her waking hours with her fist stuffed against her mouth and biting down on it, tears streaming down her face. And she resists all attempts to befriend her or calm her down. It's going to take time and patience. And because we're all crammed into something the size of a closet, patience is running short at the moment. I look back over at Kira and Liz's grim faces, thinking hard. What if we all pretend to be sick the next time they come to feed us? That won't be too hard, Liz says. Those seaweed bars are fucking nasty. But Kira shakes her head. And what if they decide that since we're all sick, they'll just dump everyone into space? We're extras, remember? As long as they have their quota in these pods, we're expendable. She gestures at the lockers on the opposite side of the room. I can't forget them. I don't know if I'm jealous that they're completely unaware of our situation, or even more horrified at what they're going to go through when they wake up. But she's right. The pod people being safe and secure makes us superfluous. And I'm not willing to add, sabotage the pods, to the escape plan. Nor am I willing to leave them behind. We'll simply have to factor them in. Well then, I say, what if we scream? Kira swallows audibly. That terrifies me. She peers over my shoulder at Dominique and shudders. I don't like it either, I tell her. But what are our options? One misbehaving person ensures that everyone else stays safe, right? So we get their attention, get them to open the doors, and... Liz prompts. What? Get done on again? No. I don't even want to think about that. We need a distraction of some kind. We can rush them when they open the doors. There are more of us than them. But they have guns. But if we all rush them, then the ones in front get shot, Liz says. I don't want to be here, but I don't want to die. I don't know what the others do either. They're not really fighters. None of us are. But what choice do we have? I protest. We can be good little slaves and still get done on and still get sold off for God knows what. At least if we fight back, we have a chance. No, you're right. Liz draws her knees up close to her chest thinking, so... We make a distraction, have them open the doors, rush them, take the guns, take control. We just need to make sure Kira's protected through all of this. Me? Kira looks surprised. Why? Because you're the one with the translator, Liz says grimly. We're not going to be able to convince them to turn around and go back to Earth if you get shot and we can't talk to them. She has a point. I'll be the distraction. It's my plan. You sure? God, no. I'm not sure. Every part of my body vibrates with terror at the thought of those pebbly skinned creatures touching me, but what choice do I have? Sit back and do nothing? Roll over and let these creatures decide my fate? Screw that! I'll do it! As if agreeing with me, the ship lurches and dips, sending us sprawling. Not a single person screams, of course. We know better. Tea break. How's my heart rate doing? It appears that it's sub-100, at least for now. For the second time that day, the ship lurches, 
Turbulence is a little ridiculous, considering that we're in space. Isn't it supposed to be a smooth ride? My stomach lurches along with it, but I ignore it. It's almost time for our plan. I stare at the guard pacing outside of our cell. It's what we consider bedtime, in which we've received the last seaweed bar of the day, and the guards are getting bored with harassing us. Normally after the last feeding, they change our waste bucket and then head out. But tonight, things are off. Even though our waste bucket is nearly full, the ball head isn't coming to get it. Chirping sounds keep coming over their intercom, and the guard of the room is more and more agitated as the minutes tick past. And the whole time, the ship keeps lurching. What's going on? I whispered to Kira as we watch the single guard pace back and forth, distracted. Where's the other basketball head? I don't know, she admits, her hand pressing to her ear and the silvery device curled there. Some of the words don't translate over, or they do, but I, I don't know what they mean. She shakes her head. I think there's something going on with the engine, though. They keep talking about detaching the cargo and offloading to a safe location. The pit of my stomach curdles. Um, we're the cargo. She grimaces. I know. Apparently they're going to miss a ship date if they do, though, so they're trying to work around it. Lucky us, I murmur, glancing at the one guard, only one. Normally there are two. My body tenses with realization. If we take down the one guard, there will be one to deal with later. Our odds are much better if we divide and conquer, and if we have his gun. Think we should move ahead with our plan, I say in a low voice as the guard begins to pace again. I don't know, Kira says, chewing on her lip, but Liz nods at me. We're going for it, I whisper to the others in the cage. The girls look uncomfortable, but they move aside to give me room. If I'm willing to be the sacrificial lamb, they're willing to let me sacrifice myself. So I steal my courage head to the cage bars, and stick my face between the slats of the prison. Hey! The guard doesn't turn. He keeps pacing, his gaze flicking at the ceiling as if expecting more of those weird chirping orders to come down. I try again. Hey! Over here! When he doesn't pay attention to me, I admit, I'm surprised. Normally, they take any excuse to punish us. I've seen another girl done up on over the last week because she cried out in a nightmare, so I'd try a new tactic to get his attention. <laughs> I hawk a big wad of spit at him. It lands on the back of his big bald head, and he stops in his pacing. His weird little fish eyes get round as he turns to glare at me, then stalks across the storage bay toward our cage. Good job, Georgie, Liz breathes. I suck in a deep breath and nod. I don't feel so good about it, but hey, I retreat to the back of the cage like we've planned, so he'll have to come in after me. And when the other girls close ranks around me, I haul the shit bucket up into my arms. The idea we've come up with is that I'll throw the crap on him to further distract him, and then the others will use that time to jump him. We'll overwhelm him and take him down. Then strip him of his gun. Not that we know how to shoot an alien weapon, but eh, one step at a time. As long as he doesn't have it, that's half the battle. Of course, hefting the shit bucket into my arms shows just how heavy it is, and just how weak and lethargic I am from the shitty rations they've been giving us. I stagger under the weight of it, wincing when some slops over the edge and onto my arm. Fuck it. He growls out something that sounds like a cuss word in alienese and unlocks the cage. Unlike how we've planned, the other girls fall back, cringing, leaving me there with the waste bucket and a stupid expression on my face as he slams toward me. I throw it at him, just as he grabs me, but it's too heavy and ends up slopping on both of us. He grabs my arm and I shriek in surprise as his fingers dig into the meat of my bicep. Not only is his pebbly skin ugly, it's rough and tears up my skin like it's sandpaper. He spits an epithet at me and drags me forward. No, Liz says, grabbing my other arm, even as I twist in his grasp. Where was our big fucking attack plan? Where are the others all huddling like scared rabbits? I look to Kira, my other co-conspirator, but she has her head tilted, a funny expression on her face as she stares at the ceiling. Faint bird-like chirping comes from above. Detachment commencing, Kira asks, a confused look on her face. The entire floor shifts to the side, and we go flying. I slam across the room, my body soaring through the air. I land hard against the stasis lockers, and all the air leaves my lungs. The entire world tilts, topsy-turvy, and the hold is filled with screaming women. Splashes of something wet hit my arms, and the waste bucket flies past overhead. Then everything hangs in the air. The lights go out, leaving us in the darkness. A red light flickers on. No, oh, that's not good. Red lights are always emergency lights, aren't they? I stare into the now red room, watching as globules of waste soar past. In the background, someone tumbles in the air. We've lost gravity. What the hell? 
I try to focus my eyes as something dances past my head. Black, oblong, with a thick barrel. The gun! Holy cow! I push off one of the lacquers and swim through the air for it. Just as gravity kicks in again, I slam to the ground. On top of the gun. A few feet away, the guard slams down as well. All the while, that weird bird-like chirping keeps going over the intercoms. I grab the gun and look for a trigger as the guard groans and shakes his head, trying to gather his thoughts. There's no trigger. Well, fuck it. It'll work just as well as a bludgeon. Grabbing it by the thick, heavy base, I raise it over my head and bring it down on the guard's head. Crack! The guard flails. I don't stop. I hit him again and again. Crack! Crack! Over and over. I slam the butt of the rifle into his head. He doesn't move. I don't stop. I'm terrified he'll somehow have a granite skull and will roll over and overpower me, so I just keep hitting him. Hands grab mine. Georgie, hey, Georgie, stop. I, I think he's dead. Liz's voice cuts through the haze in my brain. You can stop now. I slow, staring blankly at her, then down at the guard. Or what's left of the guard. His face is nothing but a pile of meat atop his neck. I stare. Then I throw up. You did it, Liz says, rubbing my back. Holy shit. You did it, Georgie. You're a fucking Billy badass. I don't feel so badass. I feel sick. I've just killed a man. Kinda a man? Sorta? Well, definitely a rapist. Still a living creature. Was... was a living creature? My stomach roils uncomfortably again, and I go to wipe my mouth with the back of my hand, then stop. It smells like sewage. Oh, I'm covered, too, and the cabin is splattered. The heck happened? I don't know, Liz says, helping me to my feet. I ache all over, my ribs feeling bruised from where I landed on the gun. I hold on to it, though. I don't care if it's covered in poop and brains and everything else. It's mine now. My gun. A metallic-sounding chirp blares over the loudspeaker. Just as my ears pop hard, Liz clutches her ears at the same time as I do. Then we look at each other in surprise. Excuse me. Kira comes running out of the cage. Ladies, we've got bigger problems. The message overhead is now saying, prepare for re-entry. I think that means we're crashing. Fuck. We pitch again, and I tumble through the air, banging into the lockers. Something smacks my head, and everything goes black. I don't think anybody's okay in this shit. And you should feel very concerned. I am starting to realize what kind of book this is. <clears throat> and we move on. By the way, how y'all doing? It's Friday night. We never stream on a Friday night. I love this world. Hey. A familiar voice sounds in my ear. Hey, wake up. You okay, Georgie? slowly come to and groan at the fierce stab of pain shooting through my forehead. Then, a moment later, the pain isn't just in my head, every part of my body aches. My wrist most of all. It throbs with an uncomfortable fire that seems to radiate all the way up to my elbow. I squint up at Liz. She's hovered over me. Ow! She grins back, displaying a fat lip and a growing bruise on one cheek. You're alive. That's always a plus. She sits back on her haunches and offers me a hand. Can you sit up? With her help, I get to a seated position, wincing. Sitting up just makes everything hurt even more. What happened? We crashed, she says. Most of us got knocked out from being bounced around. There are a few broken bones, a few bloody noses. Two who didn't make it. I stare back at her in shock, then scan the cabin. Two people... died? Who? In addition to the guard you took down, Chrissy and Peg... Looks like broken necks. She nods over at the far side of the room. Poor kids. I swallow the knot of grief in my throat. I didn't know them well, but I knew their terror and fear. I'm just glad I'm alive. I hug Liz. She hugs me back. And for a moment, we're just relieved to be breathing. And mostly whole. Over her shoulder, I squint, noticing that the entire cargo base seems to be slanted at an angle. The metallic floor is covered with debris. Tilted. Icy cold. I get to my feet with her help wobbling, and gaze around in shock. Several of the girls cling together at a corner. Megan is hugging Dominique and trying to calm her, the latter choking back bare, braying sobs. Other girls are still sprawled on the ground, unconscious, and I see two bodies piled in the corner next to the dead guard. Chrissy's dark hair tumbles over her face, obscuring her features. It's for the best. I look away, one off to the side, over there. Kira's, Kira's trying to help another girl, straighten an obviously broken leg. 
Kira's own face is bruised. Blood's running down from her ear implant. Everything looks beaten up. Bruised. Damaged. I gaze down at my own legs, but they seem to be okay. My wrist, however, is swollen and getting a little purplish. And my ribs feel like they're on fire. I think I broke this, I say, holding my bad arm out. I gingerly rotate my wrist and nearly pass out at the shockwave of pain it sends through my body. Guess you won't be clubbing any more aliens today, Liz says cheerfully. It's not broke. It's sprained pretty bad. You should see my toes on my left foot. They look pretty awful, too. Like they tried to make a strategic retreat into my foot <laughs> and failed. I glance over at her skeptically. Then why are you in such a good mood? Because we're free, she says enthusiastically. We're fucking free, and we've landed somewhere. I already counted those as better odds than what we had before. How do you know we landed? Liz hobbles to my side, favoring her leg. Because the floor is tilted and cold. And because of that, she points at something behind me. I turn and look. Overhead, it seems as if one of the compartments has peeled partially away, leaving a long, narrow scrape in the hole of our storage bay. Through the scrape, weak light filters in, and what look, look like snowflakes drizzle down. I gasp and push forward, trying to see. <gasps> is that snow? It is, Liz says happily. And since we're not all asphyxiating from breathing methane or something, there's also oxygen coming in. Hope thuds in my heart at 101 beats per minute. I don't... <laughs> I turn back to Liz, full of excitement. Do you think we landed back on Earth somehow? I don't think so, Kira says, her soft voice interrupting my thoughts. I glance over at her and wince. She looks pretty rough, the entire left side of her thin face, purple and bloody. One of her eyes has a broken blood vessel, the red stark against her pale skin. And she's limping too, her knees swollen. How do you know we're not on Earth? I ask. I refuse to give up hope just yet. How many places can have snow and oxygen? We just might be, I don't know, in Canada or something. Mars, maybe. Except, I heard through this thing, she says, pointing at the bloodied earpiece still attached to her head. That they're dumping us at a safe location for our return pickup at a later date. Liz crosses her arms, frowning. Return pickup? So they dropped us here so that we can sit pretty. And they're going to pick us up again in a day or two? Fuck that. I don't know when, Kira says. Her face solemn. But when they mentioned this place, it definitely wasn't Earth they were referring to. They kept talking about a particle cloud, but the only particle cloud I remember from science class was on the edge of our solar system, the Oort cloud. And if we're getting that much light, she says, pointing at the scrape in the hole, we're not anywhere close to Pluto. I don't even think we're on Earth at all. I don't think we're in our solar system either. Gotcha. Liz agrees. She sounds glum. I'm still skeptical. Glancing up at the snow falling into the crack, it's hard not to get excited. We had to be home, didn't we? It's winter out there. They could have dropped us in Antarctica. Right now, I'd take Antarctica over a random planet. I don't want to stick around until they come back. Me neither. Kira, Kira sighs and winces, rubbing her shoulder. Bet everyone's hurt. I don't know how fast we can move or if it's even safe to move. For all we know, we could be floating on a sea of ice filled with man-eating ice sharks. Good God, you're Susie fucking sunshine, aren't you? Liz says, staring at Kira. Sorry, Kira sat grimaces, pressing a palm to her forehead. It's been a hell of a day. I feel like it's just getting to get worse. She looks so morose that I want to hug her. I refuse to be down about this. One guard's dead. We have his gun. And for now, we're away from our captors. It'll be fine, I tell them brightly. We'll figure something out. Can we figure out food? Megan calls from the corner of the slanted storage bay. We're pretty hungry. Food is a good start. I agree. Not again, Liz. Let's see what we have if we're supposed to ride out this and wait for the little green men to return. An hour later, though, things are looking grim. We've found enough bars for a week, and we have enough water for approximately as long. Beyond that, though, there's nothing. In addition, other than what belonged to the guard, we'd killed, well, I'd killed. There were no weapons and no additional clothes. We went through everything, pounding on walls and trying to find hidden compartments in the shuttle bay, but we didn't find much. The only discovery was some sort of thick, plastic-like sheet material, but it wasn't warm or flexible enough to be used for much of anything. Pretty sure Robinson Crusoe wasn't nearly as fucked as we are, Liz jokes. I haven't read Robinson Crusoe. Neither have I. But I agree. And so do I. It's clear we're not equipped for survival. We're not equipped for anything, and it's getting colder in the hold by the minute, thanks to the snow and cold air that steadily trickles in from the gap in the hole. 
I mean, I don't understand this, Liz says, handing out a few seaweed bars. If they want us to sit and wait, don't you think they'd have to leave us with more supplies? You forget that we're the extras, I point out, waving away my bar. Someone else could eat it. My stomach was as upset enough as it is. As long as they're in intact, that's all that matters, right? And they're not eating. I thumb a gesture at the locker still lining the wall. They're still in perfect condition. Naturally. Should we wake them up now? The thought of a handful of women floating in stasis a few feet away from me with no comprehension of what's going on is rather unnerving to me. If I'd crashed landed, wouldn't I want to know? God, no, Liz says. How do we even know that they're aware of where we are? For all they know, they're still tucked in the bed and little green men don't exist. How would you like to wake up to find all this and, oh, by the way, we're stranded and don't have much to eat? Good point. I gaze around the empty room, tapping my bare foot and thinking. So what do we do? Kira asks, sliding in next to the other girls, huddling together for body warmth. She looks exhausted. Liz glances at me, waiting. Am I the leader now? Uh, crap! Ooh. I just had a question. Am I listening to anything in those headphones? I have the lo-fi music playing. I believe y'all should hear it as well. Hopefully? Maybe? If it's distracting or a little too loud, let me know and I can adjust it. Am I the leader now? Crap! But someone's gotta do it. And I'm tired of no one having ideas. I consider our options for a long moment. Well, if we're on a planet with oxygen, I'm guessing there are other things living here. I don't know a lot about science, but if Earth can support all this kinds of stuff, doesn't it stand to reason that the planet could too? We could be really close to a city for all we know. Oh yes, it's nice and subtle. Excellent. City full of aliens, someone mutters. True, I agree. But we can't stay here and starve to death. Or freeze. The sun's shining right now. We don't know how long we have until night. Or how long night will last. Maybe you quit hoping out, Liz tells her. I'm just, I'm just saying. I think we need to scout around at least, I suggest. Find out our bearings, look for food and water, and report back. But most of us are injured, sniffs one girl, Tiffany. She looks like she is fresh off the farm and utterly terrified. Some of us have taken our captivity with grim determination, and some have completely fallen apart. Tiffany is in the latter category. You should go, Georgie, Liz chimes in. Me? I sputter. You're kind of our leader. God, I hate that I'm not the only one who thought that. I glance up at the snow pouring through the crack overhead. It looks cold, and I'm in shorty pajamas. How am I the leader? I'm practically the last one to arrive. Only Dominique was captured after me. Yeah, but you're the only one with the plans. You're the one who killed the guard. Kira needs to stay here. In case the others return, because she's got the ear thing. And my knee's all jacked up. I wouldn't get very far. Besides, you're the one who's good with a gun. Liz flutters her lashes at me. <laughs> good at bashing things, you mean. Hey, you did better than the rest of us, Georgie. Seriously. She mock punches the air, pretending to box. Want me to hum you some? Eye of the tiger? Want me to get you pumped up? She thanks, I tell her, trying to be upset that I just got volunteered, but it kind of has to be me, I think. Other than Kira and Liz, the others aren't much of leaders. Everyone's hurt, and I want to point out that my wrist is fucked and my ribs ache, but everyone's hurt. Liz is limping, Kira's got a busted leg, and the others are a mess. Do I want to leave my fate in the hands of another and hope she could scout decently? Anyone in here have any survival experience? Someone sniffs back tears. Other than that, Silence. Yeah, no one is equipped for this. At my side, Liz hums. I had the tiger. I shoot at the bird. Okay, fine. If I'm going down the snow, I need a couple of bars, the gun, and some water. We don't have canteens, Liz points out. Just to eat the snow. <laughs> Not the yellow snow. Someone else clip quips. Oh. Oh, sure. Everyone's a comedian now that I'm the one going out to scout. Ugh. I stretched my legs and tested my wrist and ribs, wincing. It sucks, but we're low on options. Okay. I'm somehow going to climb out of the hole in the roof. I guess I need some clothes. I gaze down at my dirty, shorty pajamas. I'm guessing these won't cut it. 
I know where you can get some nice warm clothing, Liz says, and points at the dead guard. Ugh, I say. Though I was thinking the same thing. I was kind of hoping someone would miraculously spring out a parka or something. No such luck, says Tiffany, getting her feet. I I'll help you undress him. A short time later, Tiffany and I have stripped the body of his clothing and tried to figure out how to put it back on me. There are weird invisible buckles and fastenings instead of usual zippers and buttons, and it smells like sewage and blood and some other spicily nauseating scent. But it's surprisingly warm and lined. The jacket's a little tight across my breasts and makes me look like I have a uniboob, but I'm not wearing this for fashion. The biggest problems are that there are no gloves for my hands, and the shoes are designed to fit something with only two big toes instead of five little ones. I squeeze my feet into each shoe, but it hurts. I've worn high heels before and have been in a very similar situation, although I think those high heels called for only one big toe, nothing else. Still better than nothing, I suppose, which is what I had before. Keep your hands tucked in your jacket, Tiffany suggests. Your body warmth should help. I nod and shove the gun down the front of the jacket too, letting the long barrel rest right between my boobs. I braid my dirty hair to get it out of my face and take the bars Liz offers me and suck in a deep breath. I'm gonna go as far as I can, I tell the others. I'm gonna look for help or people or food or both, something, but I'll be back. If I don't come back by tomorrow, um, don't come looking for me. God, I wish I had some wood to knock on right about now, Liz says. Don't say shit like that. I'll be fine, I tell her, bluffing. Now, let me get up to the ceiling so I can climb out. We maneuver the table over, and the two girls hold it in place while I climb, and Liz and Megan push me higher. My wrist screams a protest, but I keep on climbing, wriggling my way to the top of the breached hole. The scrape is big enough for me to squeeze through, and by the time I make it up to fresh air, my wrist is screaming in pain, and it's getting colder by the minute. I wrapped my sleep shorts around my neck as a scarf and hood. The extra fabric bunched around my th exposed throat. My face sticks out of a thigh hole. My face sticks out of a thigh hole. That is what that said. I'm sure it's not a sexy look, and the shorts are filthy, but I'm glad for them. Ah, the wind is better. I haven't even suck stuck my head up through the hole yet. I put my hands on the icy metal, hissing when my fingers stick to it. I pull them away carefully, wincing at the needle-like feelings pricking at my skin. Not only cold out there, it's damn cold! I use my good arm, now sleeved in the thick jacket-like uniform of the alien, to propel myself up a bit higher as I hoist my torso through the crack in the hole. I have a momentary vision of sticking my head out and having an alien chomp it. Not helpful, Georgie, I tell myself. I shove the image out of my mind as I push through the gap and stare around me. Good news is that the wind isn't as bad as I thought it was. Instead, the snow falls in quiet, thick flakes, the two suns shining overhead. Two suns! Two freaking suns! I squint up at them, making sure I haven't hit my head in the crash and am now seeing double. Sure enough, two of them. They almost look like a figure eight, with one thinner, tinier, much duller sun, practically overlapping a larger one. Off in the distance, there's an enormous white moon. Not Earth, I call below. Fuck. I fight back the insane urge to weep in disappointment. I so wanted to climb out and see a building in the distance that would tell me, oh, it's just Canada or Finland. Two suns have pretty much destroyed that hope. What do you see? Someone yells up. I stare around the crashed ship at the endless drifts of snow. I look up. In the far distance, there are other mountains. Or at least I'm pretty sure they're mountains. They look like big, icy, purple crystals the size of skyscrapers. They're a bit different from this mountain. This one is nothing but barren rock. There are no trees. Nothing but snow and jagged granites. Our tiny ship looks like it bounced off of one of the nearby jaggy cliffs. That was probably how it torn open. I look for living creatures, or water, something, anything. There's nothing but white. What's it look like? Someone else calls up. I lick my lips, hating that they already feel numb with cold. I'm a southern girl. We do not do well with cold. You ever see Star Wars? The original ones? Don't tell me. Yep. Looks like we landed on fucking Hoth. Except I see two itty bitty suns and a huge ass moon. Get it? Not Hoth, Liz yells. It was the sixth planet from its sun, and I don't recall it having a moon. Okay, nerd, I call back to her. We'll call this place Not Hoth, then. You guys cover this hole with the plastic while I'm gone. It'll help keep things warm. Stay safe. Your lips to God's ears. Your lips to God's ears, I yell. Then I haul my ass out of the protection of the ship. Walking out into that snowy landscape with nothing but borrowed alien clothing 
and a gun. I don't know how to fire? Pretty much takes every ounce of courage I have in my body. I tremble as I trudge through the snow. I don't know squat about winter conditions. I'm from Florida, for Christ's sakes. Palmetto bugs I can handle. Gators, I can handle. My pinching boots sinking up to my knees in the snow with every step? I can't handle that. But there are half a dozen girls waiting for me at the back of the ship, depending on me to find something, anything. And we don't have much in the way of options. I can always turn around. I don't think anybody would blame me for being afraid. And then I'll just sit in the cracked hole, slowly starve to death with the others, or we'll get picked up by the aliens again, or I can risk freezing and try doing something out here. So I walk on. I'll say one thing for the ball-headed alien I killed. His clothes are decently warm, despite the fact that every step is struggling, and I sink into the powder with each step is a struggle. Oh, I sink into the powder with each one. My feet are doing all right. My face feels like a block of ice, though. My hands, too. The sleeves are too tight for me to pull them down over my hands, so I walk with one hand tucked inside my shirt and the under under my armpit. When it gets too cold, I switch them out. My bad wrists hurt like hell, and my ribs still burn. Actually, they burn worse now because I have to take deep breaths, and that makes a stabbing pain shoot through my chest every single time. Most of all, I just want to curl up and cry, but there are others depending on me, so I can't. After walking for what feels like forever, the ground starts to slope a bit more, and I follow it down. In the distance, I see stalk-like tall skinny things that I think are trees? At least, I hope they're trees. There's no other foliage to be found, so I head toward them. The wind is picking up, and my suit, no matter how well it endures the weather, is starting to feel cold. Actually, I'm cold. All over. It sucks. I wish I was back at the hole. I turn around and squint up the side of the rocky hill. The hole is like a small black dot against the hillside. It looks fragile from here. Broken. And there's still no food or animals or even water. It's just snow. Well, shit, I guess. I'll just keep walking. The stalks are farther away than I realize, and it feels like I'm walking forever down the slope of the mountain. As I do, I start to see things. Foliage-looking things. At least, I think they're foliage. There are tufts of pale, bluish-green that look more like feathers than actual leaves, but there's a veritable forest of them. It must be the, the, tri the trees of this strange place. As I pass through them, I touch one. The bark, if you can call it that, feels moist and sticky, and I wipe my palm with a wince. That was gross. Alright, I found trees, if there are trees. I'm hoping there's a way the trees are getting nutrition. Trees need sunlight and water. I squint up the double suns, though moving, they're moving toward the edge of the sky, and the enormous moon is rising higher. A sudden thought occurs to me. What if I'm out, out here alone at night? That'll suck! I mutter to myself. I pull out the gun just because it feels good to have a weapon in hand. It means my fingers feel like ice as I hold it. But I don't care. I'd rather have a shitty weapon than no weapon. As I trudge onward, I'm starting to feel despair. What if they dropped us here on this planet precisely because we won't be able to fend for ourselves? Even as, the, even as the terrible thought occurs to me, I hear the sound of trickling liquid. Water? I stop, my heart hammering. Well, please let it be water. If it's water, that means it's warm enough to not turn to ice. That means something is warm. And right now, I need a hot drink. I rush forward. The water seems to be coming from the same direction as the weird, tall stalks. The stalks keep growing bigger the nearer I get, naturally. And by the time I find the edge of a burbling, steaming stream, the stalks are hot, taller than some than some buildings. They tower over me, like a forest of bamboo shoots that stick out of the water. Each one is tipped, a pale pink, sluggish-looking thing. It's rather bizarre-looking, but maybe it's normal for this place. There are a few stalks close to the muddy bank that are human-sized. I grab one. It's warm under my hand. That's a good sign that the water's warm, too. Maybe too warm to touch. I lean down to the surface, holding onto the stock. As I do so, I realize there's a face on the other side of the water staring back at me. A face with a huge mouth, jagged teeth, bulging fish eyes, and the stock I'm holding appears to be attached to its nose. I scream, stumbling backward, just as the thing lunges forward, snapping at me. I keep screaming, and crab walk backward, away from the edge of the water. The thing stirs, moving slightly away from the surface, its nasty mouth working. Then it sinks in, and the stock gives a small shiver before moving back in place. Holy fuck! Holy fuck! I just nearly got eaten by an alien fish! Thing! I stare, wide-eyed, at the happily burbling stream, at the enormous stock sticking out of it, at the ones that are taller than a two-story building. Are all of those... monsters? I turn and run.
breath huffing. I sprint as best as I can through the snow, back up to the hill, back through the feathery blue green street, blue green trees. Screw all of this. I am not equipped to deal with alien life forms on an alien planet. My lungs rasp and my ribs hurt like the blazes, and I landed on my wrist back there, and none of that matters because I am not stopping. As I pass one of the strange trees, something whips around my ankles. I barely have time to scream before the thing drags me backwards, and I'm hauled upside down into the branches of the tree, my feet caught and bound together. I scream over and over and over again, twisting and turning. The ground is at least a foot or two below me, and I can't touch it. Down there, my club slash gun. I dropped it, when whatever this thing hauled me backwards. When nothing happens, I stop flailing and panicking and try to figure things out. I bend over, flopping through the air to get a good look at my feet. They're tied with something that looks like rope. If I wriggle enough, it definitely looks like a knot. The other end of the cord is tied higher in the branches. I whimper and fall quiet. I just sway back and forth, gently in the tree. Ugh. I've walked with a snare of some kind. On one hand, this is encouraging. There's intelligent life here, right? Right? Which is exciting because it means we're not alone. But I can't overlook the fact that I'm in a haunting, I'm a hunting snare, and something could decide I'm dinner. I remember a scene from Star Wars where. Lucas found himself upside down in the snow creature's cave. And I start panicking again because I know how this sort of thing goes down. Luke's able to free himself before the creature eats him because he's a Jedi. Me? I'm just a Floridian in a stolen spacesuit with no weapon and a busted wrist. I know how this is going to end. I whimper and wriggle some more, working on my feet, working my feet and trying to free them from the noose that's holding me fast upside down. I don't want to be here when the owner of this thing comes back looking for dinner. Wiggling my feet doesn't work, so for the next minute or two, I concentrate on trying to stretch far enough to reach my gun. Not that I know how to fire it, but I'll feel better if I have it. It's getting harder to think, though. The longer I hang here, the harder my head pounds. It's probably not good for me to hang upside down for a long time, I realize. How long can a human hang upside down before all the blood rushes to their head and they die? I twist even harder. As I do, I realize there's something new on the edge of my vision. I stop moving and stare as a white, furry figure approaches. Oh shit, it's too late. I'm dinner. No, I moan and struggle again, but my body can't keep up with the, the demands I'm putting on it. My head throbs, and then I pass out cold, just as the monster starts to move toward me. At least I won't be awake to feel it eat me. In all caps, a single letter. Vectal. I don't recognize the thing squirming in my trap. Oh, this is, this is Vectal speaking. Excuse me. It's a new character. This is a different format of book than what I've usually read. All right. <clears throat> Vectal. I don't recognize the thing squirming in my trap. This is new. I approach it cautiously, my blade drawn. A moment ago, it was dancing and writhing, and now it's grown limp. The smell is sakui, and yet not. Curious. I poke it with the tip of my sword to see if it'll jump once more, but... It doesn't. The wind is picking up, the cold air preparing for the little moon's arrival, the twin suns heading to their beds. With the tip of my sword, I slice the cord, binding its legs, and it flops to the ground, lying in the snow. And then I'm shocked anew, as my cooey resonates inside me, my inward being, which has lain dormant for so long, which recognizes no mate amongst my people. It vibrates and sings at the sight of this new creature. I stare at it, my thoughts confused and whirling. I snatch it into my arms and sprint for the nearest hunting cave. It is the bitter season, when hunters must be cautious when journeying out far from the home caves. There are a series of hunting caves that only see use on the coldest of nights, when a hunter is in many sprints away from home. They are ingrained into my brain after turn upon countless turn of hunts, and I find the nearest one's location easily. I push aside the leathery flap protecting the entrance, and I set my burden down on the floor. I qu a quick shake of the furs does not reveal hidden occupants, so I move the she-creature, for it must be a she, to them. Her teeth clack together, making the cold sound that young sometimes make before their sakui, so I touch her eyelid and pry it open to she if she see if she is lit from within. The eye underneath is white, dull. There is no kui inside her, or if there is, it's dead. She will need to be treated as a child. I say, losing my place. 
I make a fire quickly and wait for it to warm her, and because my curiosity has best the best of me, I examine her. I tell myself it's simply to determine if she's wounded, but my mind sings with curiosity, my cooey vibrating within my chest with a song that's growing greater with every possible moment. She's making me resonate. She's mine. I run a hand over her limbs. She's wearing some sort of clothing that stinks of old, bitter memories. I want to rip it off of her, but if she is as helpless as a kid, she will need it. So I take time to find the fastenings and undo them, revealing the flesh beneath. She's smooth, not like a sakui. Her flesh is almost completely hairless, save for the long, flowing locks on her crown and a small tuft between her thighs. That's revealed as I pull their leathers from her. I snort <laughs> with amusement at the small tuft. Adorable. Adorable. And nonsensical. Non nonsensical. She has no ridges under her skin to define her muscles, and the overwhelming sensation I have as I view, view her body is one of softness and weakness. Perhaps she has been sick, and that is why her cooey is gone. I run my fingers over her strange face. It's smooth, too. Her brow flat. She has no ridges anywhere, just softness. How did one so weak as her find their way to the outer hunting grounds? It's a mystery. And almost as much as the one as the fact that she's making my cooey resonate hard in my chest. It's thrumming with the call, and the need to mate slams through my body as her soft, rounded thighs part, and her scent fills my nostrils. Oh my. A groan escapes me as my flesh grows hard, the ridges on it swelling. I bury my face between the legs so I can taste it. Now Georgie's point of view. Pretty sure I'm dreaming. That's all this is. One... Big, bad dream. I've just been stuck in the bad part of my head for a while. And now, I'm getting to the wet part of the dream. Because I'm pretty sure I'm naked, and there's a mouth between my legs. Doing stuff to me. Like there's no tomorrow. Just really going at it. I moan softly, because this? Eh, this is pretty good. Much better than that spaceship crap. Something slick, hard, bumpy. Runs up and down me. A mouth. A tongue? Glides through me. I press a hand to my forehead because it feels pretty good. Flash of pain shoots up my wrists, but hey, quickly buried under another round of pleasure. Soft rounding sounds come from nearby, almost like a language, except I can't understand a word of it. This guy is eating me up like a total champ. His head lifts and he nuzzles at me, mumbling something again. My hands go to push his head back down exactly where I wanted, except horns? I jerk awake, realizing it's not a dream. None of this is. I looked out at my body in shock. I'm naked. I'm naked. And there's some dude with a pair of massive curled horns rising from his head between my legs. And as I watch, his tongue, I see it again. Oh my god. I whisper. I push at his head, trying to shove him away. This is not normal. This is not normal at all. He's not human, I mean. I, I knew that with the horns and all, but like looking at his face, I can tell he's really not human. Horns, horns rise from his hairline and curl around his scalp like a spiky, lethal helmet. He's blue, for one thing. Well, like a like a bluish gray with a black mane of hair that reminds me of a lion's mane. His brows are heavy, heavier than any human brow I've seen. Excuse me. His face rugged like it's carved from stone. Going straight down from his forehead to the tip of his nose is a striated pattern of ridges of some kind. His bluish gray skin, slightly darker there, and his eyes are a glowing shade of blue that I've never seen. Blue, like Caribbean waters, but completely without pupils of any kind, and they're glowing as if from within. A small whimper escapes my throat as he rises up over me. I see the shaggy white furs covering his shoulders, and I realize I saw them from hanging upside down. It wasn't a monster come to eat me. It was this monster, also come to eat me, in a completely different way that I'm now just realizing is happening. Who's come to eat me out. Yep, there we go. It strikes me as incredibly ludicrous. And I, I want to laugh, but I'm just too terrified. What are you going to do with me? I ask softly. <clears throat> what are you going to do with me? I ask again, this time much more softly, as the book implies. My eyes wide. The refrain of, please don't kill me, 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 please don't kill me echoes through my head. He says something and runs a hand down my stomach, and then those weird glowing eyes break my gaze, and his head dips. And he begins to go at it again. Long, slow, delicious! I can't help it. I start to giggle. <laughs> it's ticklish. 
<laughs> and I'm squirming, and I should be screaming, no, help, don't do it. And instead, I'm giggling <laughs> because he doesn't want to eat me. He just wants to eat me. Get it? I'm taking some creative liberties here. Please excuse me. I'm not gonna die yet, and a strange guy with horns is determined to give me oral pleasure. And just that! Out of all the worst case scenarios, I've come up with some sense being abducted by aliens, being licked like this until I go anywhere. Is isn't anywhere on this list that I've imagined for myself. And he's really good looking. And good at licking. Something ridged and slightly knobbed slicks against me the entrance, and I realize he's got a texture on his tongue. Feels pretty good, unlike the sandpaper of the basketball aliens. And even though my every instinct is telling me to find my clothes, get the hell out of Dodge, I don't move. I'm barely even breathing. When one big hand pushes on my thigh, urging me to spread wider, number 17, the spread eagle, that's a reference, I do so. I'll get up and protest in just a minute. Just a uh, minute. He goes at it as he, at again. Yeah, he does. And his tongue grazes my innermost areas, and I just can't help it. An undignified squeal erupts from me. Oh, God! My clit's especially sensitive. Oh, my God. And he's been avoiding it until now. Interesting. The horned man head, man's head jerks up, and he looks at me in what I can only assume is surprise. I'm quivering because those eyes are staring right at me, and I press my good hand to my mouth and determine, I'm determined not to make another noise and startle him. What if he gets mad and, like, I don't know, stabs me with the horns? But he only looks confused for a moment. Then as I watch, big fingers spread across me, and he studies me intently. Humiliation burns, and I'm trying to close myself up. Fuck all this. His big hands hold my legs down, though preventing me from doing that, and he goes to go at it again and check a little bit closer. He looks shocked, downright shocked, at the sight of everything. He says something that sounds like, sa sa. It's definitely a question. I'm trying to close myself up, and then I try to rise. Now's not the time for an anatomy lesson, buddy. <laughs> the big alien pushes me back down on the furs with a stern word. It is not implied what that word is. In the book, I mean. I shove at his hands, but he's very strong and determined. He keeps me pried apart, and I can't help but notice that his hand's really big, like a baseball glove. How tall is this guy? His hand spreads the folds of myself again, and to my utter humiliation, he's poking around like it's going to bite him. I remain perfectly still. That apparently doesn't satisfy him. He mutters something, and then he begins to rub things, as if trying to figure out just the right motions to get a reaction out of me again. And I respond despite myself. I close my eyes so I don't have to see the look on his face. He continues to touch, stroking me ever so carefully. I'm doing pretty I'm doing pretty good at controlling my reaction, even though every touch of his fingers makes me want to vocalize. And then I feel his mouth yet again, and he's sucking at me now. My hips buck against him, and I cry out. He murmurs something and sounds pleased and continues to go at it, sucking, licking, until my thighs are absolutely shaking. I'm gonna get there. Oh, damn this guy. Damn him and the fact that he's making me feel pretty damn good. Those bumps and ridges, for her pleasure, I'm sure, move against me, and my entire body quakes. And now, I've hit my peak. Over and over again, I'm convulsing and clenching, and I'm rocked hard. My entire body has been locked, tense, with the strain of my cataclysm. I collapse on his furs, exhausted. My hand goes over my eyes and I rub my face. Okay. So I just did that. I orgasmed from an alien. I have no idea how I'm going to explain this to Liz and the others. I was supposed to be scouting. And here I am. Incredible. The alien says something else and I open one eye to peek at him. The look on his face is fierce. And there's no mistaking the masculine look of pride on his inhuman face. He's pleased he'd made me do the thing. I shoot him the finger. Or maybe it's this figure. You're an asshole! I mutter. In response, he says something else. And then he grabs me by my hips and turns me onto my stomach. I know what's coming next. And even though I just had my moment, a girl's gotta have boundaries. I don't want it. Oral is fine, as long as I'm the recipient. This is a bit much, a little fast. 
I twist in his grip, then kick and lash in him. My foot connects with his chest. It feels like I broke it. My foot, that is. Not his chest. My foot may be broken. It feels like I kicked iron. I give a cry of pain and collapse on the blankets again. My leg is throbbing, and my ankle shooting pain clear up my entire body. When I look up, the alien is furious. This is the end of part one of a book called Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. I need a bookmark. This haiku will do. As with all vulnerable experiences that we experience in life, I'd like to check in with everybody and see how we're doing. Interesting. I walk out of my room to hear oral is fine, says Anna. Do I want to know? No, you probably don't. That's definitely not what's occurring in this book, although it definitely is. So, I see where this is going, and we're about... Oh my god, okay, Anna's Anna's on break. You're coming up here. Anna, what's going on, girl? I need stuff. You need stuff? Oh, okay. I was waiting until you weren't Would you like to entertain the crowd with innocent content while I go take a break? Oh, why are you taking a break? I need a bathroom break, dude. I drank a lot of water before this. And I think I need a moment to call that look at my heart rate, it's still going. Yeah, why is your heart rate so high? I have no idea. Maybe I'm just stressed out. Oh, get out. Okie dokie. Please excuse me all everybody. Well, my dearest takes over for just a brief moment. You will also still be able to see my heart rate. I can't turn that thing off. Also, I am wearing pants, I promise. <laughs> if you saw something red, it's my pants. Oh, God. Excuse me for a minute. Hey, y'all. Oh, how do I read this? This is so far away. Anna, do not open that book. What book? Oh, I don't... Don't open the book. Don't do it. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> Please do not open the book. I love how... It... Oh, my God, 120. Cameron, you're just going down steps. Are you okay? I don't know if I trust this thing anymore. Hey, y'all. Anna stream. Yes, hi, how you doing? Um, I don't know where to put my feet on this thing. I'm like sinking in. Whee! <laughs> uh, don't do anything sus in the bathroom. <laughs> oh my god! No, I, I honestly, I don't know if I should trust that because his heart rate is usually at 60-ish. 70-ish if he's like, okay. Watch. <laughs> You guys are horrible. <laughs> that is a lot. So, um, wait, why are we taking pictures of me? I haven't even done anything yet. Well, I'm not, so, I don't know. <laughs> I'm hiding in my room because I don't do smut because it's terrifying, like weird things. Yes. <laughs> so I walk out of my room and I'll hear like random comments like the last one <laughs> that just creeped you. Anna, the best streamer. Yes, that's it. I don't stream. Honestly, so I used to play games with him consistently on the weekends, and we would do that. And so, like, we haven't, because I've been basically working 60-hour weeks, plus an online class. Plus, I'm trying to study for boards. So I'm a little uh, overwhelmed all the time now. So <laughs> maybe during break, we can, like, do a stream or something. This is observed. No one. This is a secret. Yeah, the, are you, what are you watching? I past the computer, you're watching it. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I have my computer on downstairs. Hi. Hi. Does this mean I have to get up are now? Are you Anna with the X? Why did you throw the book? Right. I don't want that dirty thing near me. It's not dirty. The content is. There is smut in that book that is terrifying. No, this is not smut. This is not smut. What is it? This is not erotica. What this is, is it? This is not anything that is supposed to evoke feelings of sexual gratification or pleasure. And that is the only thing that I will say about the book, ever. Eventually you'll get the right amount of whelmed. <laughs> I like these people. Oh, I'm about to get up. Nah, you don't oh, I mean, sorry. The, longer, I mean, the, longer you sit the there, book is the very I descriptive. It's called the refractory period, Anna. You're aware of it, I'm sure. I don't want to know what descriptive mean here. Considering I walked out. In the middle of some weird- I, Literally, he's very clear as soon as I walk out of the bedroom. So I've just been hiding in the bedroom. <laughs> Sorry, are you okay? Yeah, it's okay. I've been watching that one- So I'm watching an anime, and it's very feel-good. But you're just sitting here like, You two love each other! Just get together already! Like, what the frick is wrong with you? And they introduced another couple? It's okay, Anna. Reads these books of- Wait, what? It's okay. Anna reads these- I can't read today. Camera can- Oh! 
case you make sense. That's too far. Let's see, what does it say? I don't it's know. okay, Annie reads these kinds of books, and I run and hide. This is little A. <laughs> it's okay. Everyone's got their preferences. That's what it's all about. So we had our friend here one day, and so like literally it's all Cameron's frat brothers. It's my like it's two of the friends and I like interacted with them. And so she's telling me, like, her one friend bought her this manga for like Christmas. And so She's going on about this, and she basically describes it, and the way she describes it, it sounds very much like smut. Very much like, very pornic. But I, I don't even know what the pornic heck was going on. Pornic is a term? Is a term. I thought I just made it up. That's okay. Whatever. But so, like, Jesus, all of a sudden, so everyone goes you. really I'm pour I'm quiet. filling up my water behind you, I promise. Okay, sure. That's all I'm doing. Everyone goes really quiet, and they're all like, are you reading smut in public? <laughs> She's like, no, my friend bought me this. I don't even know what I'm supposed to Hydration. do. And then he starts, she starts talking to them. And the one guy turns around, like, I think five minutes later, he's like, I understand why your friend got you smut now. Oh, my God. Oh, should I leave? Again, like, you're determining the length of the Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Not you to do anything. That's not very casual, I'm just right? so lazy because I have to write. I still have to write two more patient notes. Well, I have to finish two more patient notes. Dude, just feel the vibe. It's cute. It's cute. What's my vibe? This is vibe night. We never stream on Fridays. This is vibe night. We can do whatever we want to. We could man. technically stream on Fridays. I can do whatever I want to, man. I save Friday for special Like this one. No, might, I, might I sit beside you? Okay, cool. You're gonna fit here? How are we gonna Probably do that? Probably not. Oh. You know, so, technically, if we did- Whoa! That's a very nice vibe. Very nice vibe. How's it if going, If we dude? didn't have, like, How's a- How's it going, dude? Just hanging. Chill. Bro. Chill, bro. Bro. Chill, bro. Right. Maybe he's- Bro. Oh, watch, 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 watch yourself. What? <laughs> watch yourself. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. This is actually kind of confident. Right? Yeah, wait, so like... I should just keep this bag over here the whole no, time. No, 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 no. Yeah. This is my I'm dead in the morning chair. I literally chair, had to and take I put my, it over there. I took my gaming chair and I threw it over there. Yeah, he basically replaced him. Oh my god, guys, I got a dresser and it is like the best thing ever. Yeah. Sorry, I have to discuss this. No, I no, am so go. happy to have a dresser. Context, context. Anna has been complaining about not having a cabinet or dresser to place her clothes in for about three months now, and almost every single time I've been like, why don't you buy one? She's like, hmm. It finally got this to a point where like all of my stuff was on the floor, and I'm just sitting here like, ooh, this is bad. And then it freaked me out enough like two days ago where we actually just bought it. Yeah, it was kind of funny. No, I have this like, it's like a, what is it? Is it plastic or metal? Both. And fabric. Yeah, there's like little fabric drawers, so basically it can be transitioned into like a play cabinet when we have kids. But for right now, it is my dresser and I like it. I have a dresser. Brett says he's got a dresser and everything leaves in the clean hamper. There's a not clean hamper for all the not clean things. Our hamper switches between- now that I think about it, that's kind of gross. It switches between clean and not clean. Maybe we should get a- It's kind of gross. And it's also falling apart, but it's got a pink butterfly on it. What if we just get a Where's unicorn hamper? hamper? No, no, it's downstairs. downstairs. It's downstairs in the corner, currently surrounded by- So we don't exactly use the hamper, we literally use the floor around the hamper at this point. Which <laughs> just means it's I mean, it's dirty. fine. Yo, if you find clothes on the floor, they're probably dirty anyway. So you're just kind of saving yourself the trouble and mm. making it so that you have one less logical hoop to jump through. How many more pages do you Don't touch like? the book. I, I really- if, you, it's, if it's dirty, you don't, you don't touch it. You think it's dirty? You how, are you li how far are we into the street? We are part one, and we are about an hour and a half in. About damn. an hour and 20 minutes. Oh, man. I'm reading the whole damn thing. There is an ex- oh, Sorry, I'm like trying to Say more it. than awesome, says Lulay, okay. but there is an exclusively clean one, and one day I'll have dopamine- to have the dopamine to put the clothes away. Same, says Annie. We have so many piles of laundry. I I think I caught up on laundry. Oh uh, yeah, there's a piles right there's in front also of our piles TV. Of clothes. And to be We're fair, so <laughs> contrary to my statement previously about if it's on the floor, it's probably dirty. Those ones are specifically not dirty because they're folded. If they're on the floor and folded, they're not dirty. Okay, I need to inform you. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't need to fold my laundry. Just put it in the drawers at this point. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it. In I don't laundry. I don't care anymore. But I care about you. That's why I fold your laundry. Dude, literally, I just took everything from the drawers and the floor and I just threw them into the laundry bins. I'm like, this is perfect. I don't care anymore. I give up. I'm Incredible. being an adult. Incredible. I try to do nice things for you and you're like, oh, you didn't have to do that. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I love you, so. Oh, you're so sweet. Hey, no sexual content. No PDA. Ew! Karen! Ugh! Uh, let me barf. <laughs> Ouch. Right in my cooey. I still don't know what a cooey is. It's in the book. I and thought it, you meant and like it, and it reson it, and it resonates at the at the center of the body, the cooey. I think whoa, it's to whoa, imply whoa, that when the cooey resonates, whoa, whoa, it means whoa. you found your mate. 
I resonate for you, baby. See, first when you said cooey, I was like, cooties. No, no, no. And Coo then, Coo after you were like, when it resonates, I'm thinking of like, you know that rooster, like gobble thing, except it's going up and down. And that's all I can think about. As Wait, a cooey. Little Lame and I just realized we have tier one subscriptions. Where did this come from? I don't know. Maybe there was a, an anonymous donor out there who bequeathed these upon you. It wasn't me. I don't have money for that. No, it was probably Brad. He's really nice. He's oh really my nice god, guy. yeah, wait. He's a really nice guy. Yeah. Brad, how was your concert the other day? I didn't I didn't recognize the band, but Cameron, I wanted to inquire about it, but it's been above. a really, really it's been a Sorry. really, really busy week. So I completely forgot to. It might has been Oh, there He's we so go. So nice. Such a nice guy. Sorry, I'm like so tired. PDA. PDA. I'm literally only reading parts of this. Open was party, great. Party, party. This is so good to hear. Okay. Let's see, what was the last concert I was at? Ooh, I saw Sammy Ray and the Friends. Oh, that was- with you I thought it was and Cave my two Town. Younger brothers. No, 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 we went to- No, it was Sammy Ray and the Friends. No, it was I went with Ninja Sex Brennan. Party. Okay, well, in the past year or so, we've seen Ninja Sex Party for like the 50th time. It's amazing. Okay, there's one. We've seen four. I, Sammy Ray and the Friends and, and Cave, Cave Town. Town. Yeah. Which was awesome. Oh my god. Consumption! Oh my god. <sighs> what am I supposed to consume? Uh, do you want water or tea? I don't like Earl Grey. Uh, water. Do you like water? Do you have my grape juice? Behind the bar, yeah. Do you want me to get you some grape juice? I'm gonna get the grape juice. I you will get, get up juice? officially. Okie dokie. Uh, Is that the proper way to get up, Miss PT? No, actually. Let me inform you of sit-ups. Here she comes <laughs> no, again. again. She's back. Yes. Um. Ooh. That's that chair. Don't worry, to my knowledge, that microphone ain't going anywhere. Although I'm becoming more and more or less convinced of that as the time goes on. Grape juice. grape juice is behind the bar somewhere on the floor. It's labeled Welch's because it's Welch's grape juice and not anybody else's. Although technically it's my grape juice. It's so. Anna's. It's Anna's grape juice now. It's Anna's grape juice. That's what I it's like all sugar. about. Why I like your sugar. Wrench called Rose. Um, because somebody named the Mighty Wrench Rose. It's this 15 inch Rose craftsmanship. If if I if is I. That full name? I, I don't know. Rose, it's just called Rose. The 15 inch Rose, uh, apparently. It's a it's a wrench. It's a crescent. It's an adjustable crescent wrench. And we, Glenn and I, whoa, Glenn and I used it to crush ice on Wednesday. It was awesome. Did it always have this thing on it? It always has. It always has. Would you like to show the folks what you're talking about and brandishing around haphazardly? This is my wrench. <laughs> This is my 380 milliliter uh, Forged USA 44662 um, adjustable wrench. Where did you get that? 15 inches. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> is this a metaphor? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it is. Take this away from me before I hurt myself. Wait, I thought you used to use that thing. Is this the thing you found? No, that's not the one I found on the streets of Philadelphia. That's smaller. Why does this say your fingers here? Uh, because somebody wrote it there. It looks like my handwriting, but I don't think I wrote that. It does look like my handwriting. Ooh, chocolate cheese almost falling off the book. <gasps> don't hurt the chunk. Don't hurt the chunk. Okay. Don't hurt the chunk. Let me go and stop it. Oh, Pika, Pikachu, Pika, Pikachu. Go, oh, Pikachu. Alrighty there. Okie dokie. Bye, dearest. Break over. It's time to get back to the planet that's chilly with the people who are potentially aggressive. I don't really know. Excuse me. I will be going back into the zone, vibing around with the lo-fi music. If it hasn't been obvious already, any time that we have music, it's the lo-fi girl. The lo-fi girl rocks. So thank you, lo-fi girl. Planet of Chill, can we trade theories first? Oh yeah, sure, no, let's, let's see what these theories are. I think, I think the part of the title that gets you is the fact that they're not really barbarians. I think they're mated, like soulmates. I think so too. I think but that's what the Kui is supposed to represent. I don't know what a Sakui is. They, we've had Sasa, Sakui, and there might have been another form of Kui so far. And I'm curious to see where exactly that goes. I actually want to see if we actually get a whole alien language out of this, because I love stuff like that. Like the fact that people go to conventions and stuff and are able to like speak on speak and like cling on to each other for like the Trekkies and stuff, that's awesome. I've always wanted to learn another language that is like a, a fictional language. I mean, I mean, seriously, if people are communicating with it, is it really a fictional language? If you can actually have a conversation with somebody about it, is it fictional? The race and I guess species or the, the population that it came from are fictional, but the language itself, if it is used to communicate, is is a language. Alexa, define a language. It's okay. It, she doesn't need to be involved in this stream. In any case, I think it's a soulmate thing. That's what I'm thinking. 
All right. Does anybody else have any comments and stuff that they want me to see immediately? Just just making sure because I'm, I'm going to probably be looking away from the stream. I can't wait for them to speak together and him just to be like, you taste good. And him be and she be like, I mean, I guess. <laughs> I also know. Actually, I have a question for everyone else. I haven't been watching my heart rate. Apparently, it's been above 100 this whole time. Or around the like 90 range like my resting heart rate believe it or not is like 50 to 60. i am a very chill person when i don't have a camera in front of me or i guess when i'm not just like vocalizing all the time i love the ethics of not unfreezing the cryo girls like such a hard choice this is actually like this is apparently when when i looked up the genre for this book which is wholesome romance it's like a really really popular one like people are like this has got some this has got some character to it but like it's legitimately good Dude, I hit like 125 when I took my bathroom break. 130 would have been sus. Oh god. Oh no. Oh god. Exactly. And my PT Anna is my PT my PT love Anna is defending me. I was going up and down the stairs. That's a it's a pretty rigorous activity. Meanwhile, sitting in the chair actually, let's see. If I just like just like chill out. Here comes Anna. Closing my eyes. Okay. PT time. Breathe in, close it. Okay, everybody follow along. Close your eyes, breathe in for four. Cool. Evidently, I'm still at like 90. Oh, in any case, if I continue it, which that makes sense. Regulate your breathing. That's like most important to do in like any physical activity. It's all about your breathing. Oh my gosh, Annie says if you think this is this is good, I gotta read Akatar. Oh, was that the um, a, like a, a thorns rose or something? I wrote it down on one of my post-it notes somewhere. <laughs> It might just be a reading high. Having the camera on is also a stressor. Oh, yeah, I, I guess I'm stressed right now. It might also be the reading high. The system needs to learn your base rate. Ah, my system. Yeah, actually, I really don't read that much. Like, at all. Yeah, it was the rose. A court, a court of thorns and a court of thorn and roses. That's what it was called. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm actually enjoying this so far. This is this is kind of cool. And I think my improv skills are coming to test here because... um. There's a couple of interesting words in this book that I'm just choosing not to use and talk around. I'm cre taking creative liberties with it because, lo and behold, a piece of this makes me uncomfortable. But I'm dealing with it. And I'm making it my own. And your own. Improv is great. The voices are a really nice touch. Thank you, thank you. In any case, I feel break is adequately over. To everybody out there who is watching, welcome. You asked for it. We have it here. I hope you're having a good time so far. Sit back and relax. It's time for part two. I wonder if any like the book churning pages and stuff are getting caught by the microphone because that's that'd be that'd be that'd be nice. <clears throat> part two, Vectal, my mate, the resonance of my cooey, my new reason for existing, has just planted her tiny, strange foot in my chest and kicked. It's almost as if she does not want to mate. Her strange, dead eyes are wide with fear, no comforting glow in them. I want to tell her that she'll be fine, that she's mine now, and I'll take care of her, that we'll take down one of the monstrous Sakosks and pull a new cooey from its depths so she will no longer suffer. But I'm puzzled as to why she would hurt herself. I rub my chest where her tiny foot landed. Without her leathers, her body seems even smaller, and she's soft and ridgeless. She seems to have forgotten this too, as she gives me an indignant look, then howls with pain and clings to her foot. I don't understand her. Uh, maybe her lack of cooey is affecting her senses? I will not harm you, I say to her slowly, because she looks terrified. You are my mate now. Get her dame! Let me see your fit, I demand. If she has no cooey, she probably does not heal as she should either. When she continues to give me a frightened look, I reach forward and place my hand on her ankle. Sorry, the voice requires a certain type of position from me, or else it's a little straining. Voice acting stuff, I guess. 
When she continues to give me a frightened look, I reach forward and place my hand on her ankle. She bellows something and thrashes at me again. Her hand curls into a fist, and she smacks it into my face, knocking my lip against my teeth. A flash of pain shoots through my mouth, and I snarl. She immediately goes quiet, flinching backwards, her hands raised to shield herself. I'm sickened at her reaction. This woman, this small creature who has half the stature of a Sakui as my mate. How can she possibly think I would harm her? But she is cringing back even now as I, if as if expecting a blow to fall. Rage fills me because this is not a normal response. Someone has hurt my mate in the past. I reach forward and turn her pale face towards me. She fights, but her eyes close again and she begins to tremble. I gaze at her small, flat features. Her skin tone is regular, except for a mottled bruising along one side. There is the evidence I suspected. Who did this to you? I ask. She trembles, but she doesn't answer me. She's not mute. She makes sounds, and I wonder if she hit her head. Or perhaps her people speak the nonsensical language of hard syllables she's been filling my ears with. It sounds nothing like my language. But then again, she is nothing like one of the Sakui. I should not expect similarities. I'm fascinated by her, though. The men of my tribe say there is no pleasure like the taste of a resonance mate on your lips, and they're right. Bearing my face between her was one of the truest pleasures I've ever felt, and I want to feel it again. It's clear from her reaction and the way she cringes away that I'm the only one feeling this way, though I'm mystified by her reaction. It must be her lack of Kui. She doesn't feel the resonance like I do. She doesn't feel the teeth-aching need to claim. She doesn't feel the hollowness of a lonely spirit. How can she? she? There is no Kui inside her to resonate. Clearly, the gods have sent her here to me, so I might learn patience. I smile, ruefully. It is not my strongest trait. Very well, little one, I say to her, and brush my fingers over her strange, smooth skin. You and I shall learn patience together. I don't understand you! Her words trip and tumble off her agile mouth. I notice her fangs are gone, and my heart stills in my breast, my cooey ceasing its resonance. Despite her slapping touch, I peer her, peel her lips back to examine her teeth. Are they broken? But no. It appears as if her small teeth are just that, whole, and not nearly as large as my front tusks, strange creature. I release her, and she slaps my hands away, her strange eyes narrowing. Fuck off with that! Her body is different than that of a Sakui. She's soft and hairless in most places, and I haven't seen a tail. And then there's that strange nipple between her legs. I find it arousing because it makes me think of how the taste was. I want her with my tongue again. Even now, my mouth waters in remembrance, and my cooey resonates in my chest. So I just sit back, and I watch her to see what she'll do next. She gathers her strange leathers around her, determined to cover her small, soft body. Is she cold? My protective instinct rises, and I turn to the fire, feeding more of the stored wood to it. I will need to chop wood and refill the stores here for the next hunter, but it's a task I will gladly do for my mate. I want her to be warm and comfortable. Once I build up the fire, she moves closer to it and puts her hands near the flames. They look strange. You have five fingers! I tell her and hold my own hand up. I have four. It is yet another difference between us. I am fascinated and a little revolted by those extra fingers. Her hand touches her chest. Georgie! She pats her breast again and looks at me. Ham Shorzy! Is there something wrong with her chest now? Is she trying to tell me her cooey is gone? Is It's as obvious as her dull white eyes. Yes. I know. I tell her, Fear not. We will perform the ceremony when we return home to the tribe. Shorzy! Georgie! She pat, she says, patting her breast again, and then reaches out and pats my chest. She looks at me, expectantly. Is she asking about my resonance? I press her small hand to my chest so she can feel my cooey vibrate. She jerks away, startled, and looks up at me with wide eyes. What's that? That... That's your name? Resonance. I explain to her, and my cooey hums at her touch. She looks at me with such shock that I start to feel a sense of unease. When she puts her hand on my chest again, and I resonate, she pulls her hand back away so quickly that's, that, as, that it's so quickly that it's as if she's touched something ice cold. 
He can't pronounce that, she, she tells me, and presses her hand to my chest again. Then, back to hers. Georgie! Shorzy, I echo. Her face brightens. Yes! She gives me her chest, a happy pat. Georgie! I'd like to make it clear. The, the text for when Georgie's speaking is like misspelled with only like the hard syllables. I'm figuring out the best way to say that. What's going on, yo? Looking comfortable. Dude. Robe. And book! Kui. Kui is K-H-U-I. What do you think his thumb is? Like two thumbs? I bet it's like this. I want to think they're like four, four thumb, four fingers, all like this. Maybe one's like off to the side or something. I, I can't do that. I, I cannot do that. <clears throat> it's not her trying to tell me that her Kui or her lack of residence. It's her name. She touches her chest again and looks at me expectantly. Baffled, I touch my own chest. Vectal. Her jaw juts, and she tries to say my name properly. It comes out more as... Hoptal. She's unable to make the swallowed first syllable properly. It's all right. It's a start. Hoptal, she says happily, and she pats her shoulders again. Georgie. Her own name is garbled syllables, but I try to pronounce it to make her happy. Georgie she is, and Georgie is a mystery to me. She has no tail, no fur. She wears strange leathers and walks the dangerous hunting lands with no weapons. She's weak and soft and has no cooey. And she does not speak a word or proper language. Makes no sense. How can Shorzy be here? Every creature has a cooey. My people, the Sakui, are the only intelligent people in the world. There are metleks, but they are covered in hair and no smarter than rocks. They have not yet mastered fire. Shorzy is smart. She doesn't flinch away from the fire like a metlek. She re recognizes it, and she is wearing cured leather. Her boots are finer than any I've seen. Shorzy has come from a people from somewhere. But where? I can't ask her. We can barely communicate, and then it occurs to me. She's not resonating. She doesn't feel what I do, because she has no cooey. Maybe she never has. I'm hit with a sense of loss so strong it makes me bare my teeth. This cannot happen. How is it that she cannot resonate to me? That we are not connected? It's as if I found my other half after so long, and she's dead to me. The thought chokes me. To lack a cooey is a death sentence. To see Shorzy so vibrant and so doomed makes my soul's ache. But no, she is my mate. My other half. And I'll do whatever is necessary to keep her. Back to Georgie. He's got fire. That's a big plus in my book. I rub my hands close to the flames and bask in its warmth. It's driving away the chill from the outside. The wind is whistling through the door flap, and I can see it's getting dark outside, but I'm decently warm in this cave, as long as I'm near the fire. Guiltily, I think of Liz and Kira, and the others. Surely they can stay warm by huddling together, can't they? I look up at Vectal as he begins to pace in the small cave. He looks troubled, and that makes me feel edgy. It's like I've done something wrong. I've no clue what. He keeps purring at me, so I thought he was happy, but I guess not? My stomach growls, and I press a hand to it. Time for a seaweed bar. I check the pockets of my stolen jumpsuit, but I don't find anything, and I begin to panic. Now I've lost my food and my weapon. Man, the only things I've got left are the boots that pinch my feet and the jumpsuit. Man, I'm sh shitty at this exploring thing. Ugh. Excuse me. He moves and kneels next to me, and I instinctively shrink back. I give Vectal a wary look. His mouth felt good a short minute ago, but I don't know what he wants, and I'm leery of him standing too close. But he only gestures at my stomach. Kusk. There are a wealth of tones in that word that I won't be able to emulate. It's like he's doing some weird vibrating thing in the back of his throat. Hungry, I say to him, and pat my stomach. Then I mime eating. He points at my teeth and asks another question. Right, something about that bothers him. I bear them to him to show him they're fine. He and he bears his own in response to me. Fangs. Of course he's got fangs. His canines are three times the size of mine, and they look brutal. No wonder he's mystified by my short, blunt teeth. Hope those are for chewing vegetables, I tell him brightly. He pulls off a fur cape 
And boy, am I glad to see that it's clothing and not part of him. I can handle the horns, I think, but I'm glad that the shaggy fur isn't his. Looking at him again, I see that a lot of his bulk might be clothing. That's good. There's no disguising that he's seven feet tall, though. I watch as he undresses. Wary. Um, hope you didn't mistake my stomach growling for nookie time. The fur cape goes to the floor of the cave, and my eyes open wide at the sight of his clothing underneath. I think it's leather, and it's all a similar soft bluish gray shade that makes me think of a cloudy day. It also doesn't look very warm. His arms are bare, and his chest is covered by a vest that seems to be made entirely of pockets and laces. It holds a few wicked-looking bone knives strapped to his chest. He's got a lot of flesh exposed despite the blizzard raging outside, and I wonder just how warm that stupid cape is, and if I can steal it. Probably a bad idea, Georgie. I tell myself, this guy's your only buddy at the moment. Even if he does just want to lick me in between, I clamp my thighs together tightly at the memory and try not to, cl to, not to blush. I go back to the ogling the alien. His arms are bare and show a crazy amount of corded muscle. They're enormous and intimidating, and I imagine the pectorals under the larger vest are equally as staggering. He pulls a strap from over one shoulder, and I see that in addition to the myriad buckles and pouches, he's got a bag slung across his chest. My stomach growls again. He might have food. Real food. Not seaweed bars. My mouth waters, and I clasp my hands together tightly to keep from, from reaching for him. I've never been so hungry in my life. He opens his satchel and produces a bladder of some kind that must be a water skin with a leather-wrapped package. He hands it to me, and I unwrap it. There in the wrappings are a few thick bars of what looks like meat mixed with an oatmeal of some kind. Travel rations. Has to be. I tremble and look up at him. Is this for me? Cool. Ska. He says in that weird language of his, and he mimes breaking off a piece and eating it. I could kiss him right now. Fangs and all. Thank you. I say, and break off a large piece. I don't care if I seem greedy or not, I'm starving. I cram the entire, entire piece into my mouth and begin to chew. Right away, I can tell it's a mistake. The taste is, well, for a word, awful? It's like I've bitten into a package of jalapeno peppers mixed with a vial, mealy texture. The spices are so strong that my nose and eyes immediately water. I cough, <laughs> trying hard to, trying to swallow the mouthful I've got, but it's burning my tongue. I end up choking and spitting out half the food into my hand, all the while, alien, looking at me, curiously. It's brutal. I gag and cough for a moment, more, until he pushes the skin into my hand and barks out a short word. I cautiously take a sip, afraid of what it'll taste like. To my relief, the water is cool and refreshing, and has a masked hint of citrus to the taste. I guzzle it with relief, and my choked coughing slowly abates. I push the dried food back to him and shake my head, even if I wanted to eat it. And oh, do I want to? I can't. Just the thought of putting even a small piece into my mouth makes my jaw clench up. My stomach issues a miserable protest. The alien's mystified by my rejection of the food. He examines my mouth again and tries to touch my tongue. I brush his questioning hand aside. The problem isn't my mouth. It's your food. The alien is mystified by my rejection of the food. He ex oh, he says something in his gibberish language and gestures at my bruises. Oh, he thinks I'm hurt, and that's why I can't eat. I shake my head. I'm fine, really. The alien, Vectal, gazes at me curiously. I don't suppose there's a nice city full of friendly aliens a short distance away, I ask. The small cave's getting colder, and the air whistles, so I hitch my jacket a bit closer to my body. Vectal picks up his fur cape and drapes it over my shoulders, talking to me in that weird, rumbly language. Thanks, I say, and hug it closer. He's not putting clothes on, so the cold must not be bothering him as much. I eye him as he bends over and feeds another log to the fire. He's got a tail? Okay, well, lots of things have tails. That's not so weird. I'm trying not to get weirded out by him, but he's just so... different. His horns, for one. The hand that places another piece of wood on the fire has only... The hand, the horn, his horns, for one. The hand that places another piece of wood on the fire has only four fingers. The boots on his feet look like a soft leather, but are shaped extremely wide at, his t at the toes, so I can only wonder what's going on in there. Oh, and he's a smoky gray-blue. Can't forget that part. And he purrs. So yeah, other than being bipedal, maybe he's not much like me after all. Shorzy, he says, mangling my name. He repeats it, and then gives me a frown, and a shake of his braided black hair. Shorzy. Bechtel. He says again. Then points at his eye, and then shakes his head. 
I don't know what you're trying to say to me, I tell him. That I'm not like you? I, I know I'm not. I point at his food. I wish to God I could eat this, but I can't. My eyes brim with exhausted tears. Everything feels as if it's crashing down on me. You have no idea how much my life has sucked in the last two weeks. He says something in a softer voice. And wipes away the tear that spills down my cheek. I notice his skin feels like suede or chamois. It's nice. Or maybe that's chamois. Never seen that word before. It feels friendly, even if everything else in the world is all kinds of fucked up. Vectal tugs the cloak down tighter on me. He pats the furs by the fire and says something else. My guess is that it's something akin to rest here. Because he pats the furs again and waits. I lie down. I'm warm and snuggled in furs. And for the first time in what feels like forever, I don't feel like I'm in imminent danger. All this alien wants is oral. Nice. The thought makes me giggle inwardly and I'm smiling as I fall asleep. Ooh. That Vectal voice is going to require a lot of hydration. <laughs> Excuse me. I wake up later, feeling better than I have in a long time. I'm warm and under a thick blanket, and I'm cuddled up against a big, hard form that's warmer than any heating pad. My fingers move over the surface. It feels like suede over bone. And I realize that after I hear the soft purring again that I'm pressed up against Vectal's chest. It's not the worst place in the world to be. I mean, if I have my choice between the old cargo bay, alone in the snow, or snuggled next to the, my, girlhood-loving alien, I'm going to go with option number three. I debated, I debate pretending to remain asleep, but there's something big and hard prodding into my stomach, and that tells me Vectal's conscience, conscious, accurately aware of my presence, and far more equipped than anybody I have ever met. Oh my, I'm gonna put my jug of thing there. Just easier to get to. Shh, don't say that. We don't want the stream to go down. Shh. I will speak no more about my lady parts. Thank you for the warning, Annie. I had almost forgotten. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes. I sit up, tugging the blankets around me. My breath fogs in the air. I glance around the cave. Weak sunlight is pouring in through the door flap, and the fire has gone out. It's bitterly cold unless I'm pressed next to Vectal and the urge to crawl back against him and hollow for warmth is real and strong. But he sits up and begins to adjust his clothing. By Droxt, he tells me. I don't know if that's good morning or damn it's cold or what. He gets up and as he does, my stomach rumbles again. Excuse me. Bechtel squints at me. I know, I say. Trust me, I know. It's embarrassing for me too. He begins to unwrap the food from last night, but I make a face and shake my head. I mime that it burns my tongue. He chuckles and then makes a gesture that looks like a rocking baby, which puzzles me. I'm not really following this conversation at all. Hungry, I say. I rub my stomach and mime eating something. Food. Food? Every inch of me feels like a mooch for finding a guy and then demanding he feed me, but food is easier to mime than... If you'd give me a nice weapon, I'd catch my own breakfast. For right now, we have to proceed in baby steps. Bechtel nods and begins to put on the gear he discarded overnight. His, he's bare-chested this morning, and his pectorals are just as grimly fascinating as I suspected they would be. They're like slabs of cold iron over his smoky blue chest. I remember the warm, suede feel of his skin. He was sure it was nice to rub up against. I watch him dress, intrigued by the differences in our bodies. Over certain spots on his body, he has knobby ridges. They trail along the back of each arm to his elbow. The ridges glide down the center of his chest and smooth out somewhere between his pectorals and his navel. And his thighs have the bumpy textured ridges too. I wonder what purpose those are for. They decorate his brow too and right down his nose. He's in a talking mood this morning too. He holds a one-sided conversation with me as he slings his vest back over his chest and begins to tie his knives and blades back to their proper spots. I want to ask for one, but I don't know his culture. Maybe it's taboo for him to give me one and I'd insult him by asking. Right now I'm wary of pissing him off because he's the only light flying I've got. I watch my breath fog in the air again as he continues talking, and I think of the girls at the ship, huddled together. I hope they're okay. God, I hope they're okay. I need to get back to them today so they don't worry. I can tell them what I found. Which really isn't much. I've found face-eating fish that have stalks that look like bamboo. I've found a warm stream full of the aforementioned face-eating fish. And I've found an alien that likes to eat me. Eat out. It's a thing. As a greeting. Nice. 
All three things won't help us get home. I found a city. I haven't found another ship. Oh, I haven't found a city? Did we find a city? No, I haven't found a city. I haven't found another ship. I sure haven't found anyone that speaks English. And to make matters worse, I've lost our only weapon. I'm not doing so hot at this whole saving the day thing. Vectel finishes tying his bags and pouches and then slips on boots. I sneak a peek at his toes just to satisfy my curiosity. Three large, splayed toes and a bony heel that was probably a fourth toe at some point in evolution. What, Georgie, what do you know about evolution? I probably wouldn't be able to wear his boots either, and the thought depresses me as I shove my feet back into my uncomfortable stolen boots. I stand and spots swim before my eyes. I weave only to be pulled against a hard chest. He murmurs something in my ear and offers the food again, but I push it away. I'm not being picky. I cannot physically eat the stuff. I accept the water he pushes into my hand, and I drink it. But it's going to, to last it but it's not going to last me. Maybe I can convince Vectel to go back to where he captured me so I can hunt for my seaweed bards. At this point, I'm so hungry I'll eat them even if they've turned to like a block of ice or something overnight. He leads me out of the cave, watching me as I follow him. A new powder has fallen overnight, and I look at the deeper snow with despair. So much for finding my old supplies. Vectel gestures at his shoulders, bare of any sort of cloak since I'm wearing it. He kneels and indicates that I should climb onto his back and put my arms around his neck, piggyback style. Well, this is kind of humiliating, but I'm so tired and weak that I can't protest. I put my arms around him and cling to his back. Wrapping my legs around his waist, he pats one of the arms around his neck, says something soothing, and then he starts racing down the side of the mountain. I'm stunned for a moment at how fast he is. He's unaffected by the snow, his boots driving through the powder as if it's nothing. His, he burns like a furnace inside, too. His skin is so warm to the touch that the parts touching him are toasty warm, and the parts exposed to the wind are like sticking a hand in a bucket of ice. It makes me burrow down even closer to his body once I realize he doesn't need the cape at all. He's just fine in this wintry landscape without it. So I push my head against his neck, press my cold face into his warm hair. Smells good, too. Great. Now I've got Stockholm Syndrome. Oh, goody. He pushes down the mountainside, moving down the steep slopes, uh, slopes as if they're nothing. We pass through another copse of trees, and I realize for the first time that we're heading the wrong way from the crash site. I haven't been paying attention, dazed from hunger and cold, but this is wrong. Everything uh, they, up there is waiting for me, shivering and starving. I, I, I can't leave them. Wait, I say, tapping on his shoulder. Vectel, wait! He pauses, and as he does, I slide off his back. I shiver immediately at the bitter cold, but I make him turn so I can point up the hill back to the direction that I came. We have to go that way! and rescue the others. He shakes his head, points down the hill in the direction he's pointing. I can see thick trees and more greenery. He wants to go down the mountain. But I can't leave everyone behind. I insistently point back up. Please, I need to go up there. There are more people, more women. They're hungry and cold and don't have anything. Bechtel shakes his shaggy head and mimes eating. Then he points at the forest below us, down the snowy slopes. I waver. Do I let him take me farther away to eat? Or do we immediately go to the others and still starve? I hesitate. He probably already thinks something happened to me. My stomach growls again. Vecto gives me an exasperated look. He says the food word again. Kusk. I bite my lip. Thinking. I glance back at the mountain. Everything in me says I need to insist. But I'm feeling so weak and starved. I can convince, to him, I can convince him to go back later, can't I? Once I've gotten something to eat... And it won't be better to show up not empty-handed. With a heavy sigh, I look back at him. His glowing blue eyes seem to be burning holes into me. Kusk. Then up the hill. Okay? Let's get enough kusk for everyone. Maybe a belly full of food will swallow my guilt. Vectal. When my mate climbs atop my back again and wraps her small, soft limbs around me, I have to fight my pleasure. She's cold and hungry, and upset over something. The need to please her eats at my insides. I'll bring down a meal for her so she can gorge and regain her strength. Right now, her pale skin is even paler, and I worry she'll sicken and be too weak to accept a cooey. <clears throat> Just for a moment, I need to change up the voice I'm doing for Vectal. I realize it is really, really tearing at my vocal cords, so I'm going to switch things up for my, my own self-sanctity. I appreciate everyone's understanding. <clears throat> Being that I know where this is going, I know exactly what voice to do. <clears throat> where was I, though? 
Uh, <laughs> whoops. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. She's cold and hungry and upset over something. The need to please her eats at my insides. I'll bring down a meal for her so she can engorge and regain her strength. Right now, her pale skin is even paler, and I worry she'll sicken and be too weak to accept a cooey. I have plans for my sweet mate. Whether she likes it or not, she's going to take a cooey. I'm not about to lose her now that I found her. The valley blossoms with teeming wildlife. I can tell from my mate's easy grip on my neck that she doesn't see the skulking snowcats in the distance or the form of the sickle beak hiding behind a nearby tree. My hunter's gaze picks them out, and I search for a safe spot in which I can leave my mate without worry for a short time. She's too weak to hunt for her own food or to defend herself if something should attack. There's a large boulder I can use for a lookout on the far side of the narrow valley, and I head there, pushing through the ever-deepening snow. Though the weather doesn't bother me, my mate's shivering increases the longer we're out. She won't be able to travel far unless I get her something warmer to wear. So, food first. Then skins so I can dress my soft, fragile shorzy. I'll protect her with my life, if I must. The need to claim her resonates in my chest, my cooey reminding me that I have found my mate and not yet claimed her. I pat my chest as if to tell it, I know, I know cooey, I know that she's mine. Communicating with her is difficult, and she's frightened and weak. Once she's strong and we can share more words, she will see what I have been trying to tell her. Then she'll spread those soft pink thighs for me again, and I'll have her on my tongue. I'll bury my parts inside her and feel the resonance reverberate between the two of us. My parts grow hard at the thought, so I force it away. Once I get to the boulder, I gently set Shorzy down. She climbs up on the rock when I gesture to it. Stay here, I tell her. Of course, she tries to follow me. I gesture that she should stay again, and she gives me a panicky look. Shorzy, Vectal? I'm not leaving you, sweet resonance, I tell her, brushing a finger over her pale cheek. It's dangerous. I point at the lurking creatures that are even now watching us. I point out the scythe beak, and then the snowcats. I even point out a lurking quill-bundled rodent that will be her meal. It takes a few moments for her to recognize the creatures hiding in plain view, blending amidst the snow. When she sees them, though, her eyes go wide, and she gives me another frightened look. You'll stay here, I tell her. I'll hunt something for you to eat. She babbles something in her weird language. Holy shit, those things are huge and don't leave me. It'll be fine, I soothe. I bundle the, the cape tighter around her small shoulder. She responds by reaching for one of my knives, a question in her eyes. I nod and hand her a bone-handled one that I created myself. Now she has protection. It's clear she feels better with it in her hand. She crouches down on the rock and nods at me, gripping the knife. I brush my fingers over her cold, hairless skin again, and then pull my sling from my pack. I keep a few smooth stones at hand and put one of them in my pouch. The wh then whirl the sling through the air, take a aim. My arms flex as I let the stone fly, and I'm pleased to see that the rodent flops to the ground, staggered. I approach it before it can recover, and since its throat, slice its throat with a motion of my knife. Then I cut a slit in the neck to drain the blood, and another in the belly to remove the offal. I relieve the heart and other tasty bits for my mate. Then bring the entire thing back to her. I'm leaving a trail for the snowcats to follow, but they won't attack as long as they sent me. Their memories are long, and they don't like the taste of, a, of sakui flesh. We are a bitter meal. I return with my prize and display it to my shivering mate. She wrinkles her nose and gives me a confused look. Not familiar with quilled beasts, are you? I say, because it feels good to talk to her. I lay the kill down the cold stone she's crouching upon, and notice she flinches backwards. It's dead, sweet resonance. Look, I have saved you the choicest parts. I pull open the belly and flip it and reveal the heart and liver. They're still warm, though they'll cool fast in this weather and won't taste nearly as good. And just avoid the quills and the fur. We'll get you something larger for a cloak. There are furred dvisti in this area that will make a fine meal. Shorzy stares at the kill blankly, then she points at it. You expect me to eat that? Is she not familiar with this food? She ate the meal bar easily enough. I peel the heart out and hold it for her lips. Hold it to her lips. Here, taste. She nearly falls off the rock in her haste to move backwards. Oh my god, fuck no. A moment later, she points at the dripping delicacy held between my fingers. Fucking cook that shit. I tilt my head at her. What is it? What are you saying? She mimes a gesture. 
holding her hands out like she did over the fire, and she points at the food. Fire! She tells me. Cook it! This time, my lip curls. You want me to burn the food? Do you not understand what this is? I toss the heart into my mouth and chew to show her. Flavorful blood bursts across my tongue, hot and sweet. Her face crumples. She gags. Her hand goes up, and she gestures for me to put it away. Oh my god. Gross. Eat, I tell her sternly. She's too weak to be picky around her food. I'll burn it for you later if you like, but you must eat now. I slice another thick portion of the creature's flank off and hand her the meat. I force her small fingers to close around it, ignoring the fact that she makes that gagging noise again. Eat, so that you have strength for the rest of the day. She shakes her head. I, t I take a bite and show her, then insist she eat as well. Her stomach growls, and she gets a pained look on her face. Hopes like su hopes like sushi. Shoji makes another face and then takes a bite, grimacing at the entire time. I'm pleased. She's not, but at least I'm getting food into her. She doesn't like the tasty organs. Then I eat them, ignoring her little sounds of distress, because a good hunter does not waste meat. I carve more tasty tidbits and feed them to her, and she protests the entire time. But at least her belly is filling. She drinks all my water and then motions that she's still thirsty. I nod. One thing at a time. Caring for Shorzy in such a dangerous territory is something that must be handled carefully. The last thing I want is for her to accidentally run into the, a snowcat near its den. Or worse, a pack of hunting metlicks. I must carefully guard her. And not let her out of my sight. It will mean slow hunting and an even slower return to the tribal caves. But I'm prepared to do whatever it takes. Come, I tell Shorzy, hanging my kill from my belt so the meats can freeze in the chill weather. I'll keep it until later. I offer her a hand so she can get down off the rock. She climbs back onto my back, and I realize again just how small and fragile she is. I can carry her as if she weighs nothing. She's not good. This is not good. Even the daintiest of my tribe mates could crush her like a twig. It rouses my protective instinct, and I fight the urge to snarl at the thought. Shorzy will be safe, no matter the cost. We trek through the snow for the some time, and I'm pleased to see that she's quiet, observing the world around her. She doesn't call attention to us. She doesn't complain or demand more things in her strange language. She doesn't ask questions when I break a tree limb from the nearby sapling and backtrack, sweeping it over our prints to hide our trail. She is a silent observer, but I still worry she does not even know the basis of how to fend for herself. Her request for more fire lingers in the back of my mind and worries me. I find an unfrozen stream, heated by the ground itself. It smells of rotten things. But the taste will be pleasant enough, and the heat will be nice on weary muscles. It's also a test to see how much my Shorzy knows. There are things even the smallest of kits know about the wilds that I worry she does not. Sure enough, she trots trustingly toward the stream, getting far too close. So much for my test. I grab her by my arm. I grab her by the arm before she can step near the bank, and she hisses in pain. I'm instantly abashed at my own strength. Shorzy. If I've hurt my mate, I'll be sick with self-loathing. My cooey seems to recoil in agreement. It's okay, she says, breathing heavily. She winces and flexes her wrist. Hurt from crash. I take her small hand in mine, and she trustingly lets me examine her. She's mottled with bruises on her arm, the flesh swollen. She's hurt, and I never even realized. I am fur furious with myself for missing something so obvious. I'm sorry, Shorzy. I will not be so careless again. I lead her away from the stream and look around for something to bind her wrist. I pat my clothing, looking to for a loose fabric, but she laughs and shakes her head. She jabbers something else at me and points at the water, indicating she'd rather drink than fuss with her wrist. All right, then. I can show her how to drink. I glance around and find a broken stick at the base of a tree. I pick it up and indicate she should observe me. Then I get as close as I dare and toss it into the water. For a long moment, there is nothing. Then the water boils with activity. I watch Shoresby gasp as the mud-dwelling fangfish attack. Her surprise is chilling to me. The land is not hospitable many months out of the year, but even the smallest kits know that the foul-smelling warm streams are crowded with dangerous creatures. A fangfish can strip the flesh from a full-grown divisti in a matter of moments. Shorzy would have been dead before I blinked. The thought makes me pull her closer to me. She trembles and pushes closer, terrified. Watch, I tell her. Watch, 
She agrees. Looking up with me with huge white-rimmed eyes that do not sing with cooey color, it reminds me of her vulnerability, her fragility. This must be corrected. And soon, I pull out my traveling pouch. No hunter leaves the tribal caves without one, and in it I have several of the red snowberries that are so plentiful. I grip two of them, smash them between my fingers, mix the juice with a handful of packed snow at my feet, excuse me, and then lob the entire thing into the current of the stream. Then I look at Shorzy again. Watch. She watches her face and her, her she watches her face intent. I see her surprise when the water begins to flick and the fangfish swim upstream, fleeing the waters in the berry taint they hate so much. They do not like the juice, I tell her. They will not return here until the moons go down once more. Now we can drink. She looks at me curiously, and so I show her by moving toward the water. I dip my water skin in and fill it, then indicate that she can drink the water directly from the stream. It's okay? She asks cautiously. No monsters? I nod. To whatever nonsense she's saying, and drink again, then wash my face in a cupped handful of water. That gets her attention. Wash? She asks. Plucking at my vest, I see she's now clutching my bone knife in her hand, no doubt frightened of the fangfish, but her gaze is on my face, and she mimes my gesture from a moment ago. Wash? Yes, you can clean yourself, I say. Taking the knife away from her before she can hurt herself, I hand her a few more of the berries instead. In addition to being a taste the stream-dwelling fish dislike, they make a fine soap. I indicate that she can lather with them, and she looks excited. Vectal wash? She asks, then speaks another nonsense stream of syllables before repeating the words and mim miming bathing. Vectal wash? Are you afraid to get into the stream alone, my residents? I tease. Shall I stand upstream so the fang... Fi Shall I stand upstream so the fang... Fish... Oh, fang... It's a hyphen, not a, not a quotation mark. Shall I stand upstream so the fangfish devour my carcass before yours? She gives her head a tiny shake, indicating she doesn't understand, but there's an excited smile on her face. Wash? She asks again. I nod and begin to remove my leathers. I'll wash my mate gladly. I watch her graceful form as she undresses, stripping out of her own strange leathers. For the first time, I realize they're covered in stains, and they reek of they reek of awful. I've been so enamored for Shorzy that I haven't paid the slightest bit of attention to the fact that she's dirty. No wonder she's excited at the thought of washing. My residence mate is chattering up a storm, shivering and rubbing her arms as she gets naked. Like her hand, her tiny feet have too many toes and are oddly shaped, but I don't point this out. I love every ounce of her strange body, even if she's furless and tailless. My cooey starts to resonate with pleasure at the sight of her, and I finish stripping off my leathers and then wade into the water. Oh boy, she breathes, still standing on the bank. She's staring at my groin. Pleased at her attention, I stretch and rub a hand over my stomach. My parts grow hard at the staring action, and my body surges with resonance. Is this Shorzy's way of encouraging mating? Come to me then, my mate. I gesture her forward. I will fill all of your needs. <laughs> oh my god. Vectal's so sweet and wholesome, this guy. Yo, is that Lycos Lore out there? Oh my god. Oh my goodness. Do we think Georgie is getting a crush on him yet? I mean, she already has expressed that she has Stockholm Syndrome. I am not surprised. In the least bit. <laughs> Please excuse me. I don't think I've ever done voices for this long before, and I'm starting to realize that apparently my voices are not very sustainable. This is this is this is why I don't do any of this professionally. Ooh. I'm also like slumping in this chair. Oh my goodness. Oof. All right. Back again. I think I'm like I'm like like slipping in this chair because like my robe is like slippery, I guess. 106. That's a good one. Voices are hard, man. Yeah, totally. I also think it doesn't help the fact that I'm like I'm sitting in like a like a crouched and slapped position. I'm actually gonna sit up here for a while. Oh my god, wait a minute, here's a good idea. Let me let me mark my page. I'm gonna go up here for a little while. I'm gonna see if I can adjust my microphone a little bit to make these voices easier on me. Let's see. That goes up there, and then we put it here, and then my angle is weird, so. Page count check, oh, how are we on pages? We are on page 
58 out of 170 something. Yeah, 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 I know my face is wolfling. I gotta fix that. I need my camera. Oh, actually, can I just actually hold up a second? Can I just like? There we go. Oh, that's much better. <laughs> I can just. I don't have to approach the camera. I can just sit like this. It's a little. It's a little awkward, but it feels so much more. It feels so much more personal. Turn that to this direction. I'll turn from this direction. Third of the way there. There we go. Perfect. We're making it. We're making it. We're making it. Oh. And I think at this angle, I can grab my tea a little better. Oh my god, y'all can see my desk. What's up there? I got a candle. I got my keyboard. The Weed Luigi hand puppet off the side. That's great. Earl Grey tea this evening. Good stuff. Alrighty, let me see. Actually, I'm gonna go get myself another pillow so I can like lean backwards a little bit. This is the first time I'm doing a stream like this. This format is new. I choose... Harry the Platypus. And this pillow that's actually just a plaid shirt in disguise. There we go. This will be perfect. I think this will do just fine for me. Also, I told you all I'm wearing pants. These are these are pants. I promise you that. I would never go naked on stream. That's just freaking weird, dude. Pantsless on stream? Incredible. All right, this is actually kind of far back. Let me see if I can move this. Perry, no. Perry's been covered, smothered even. Oh my god. Hello, microphone. <laughs> Hello there, pal. Hey there, buddy. <laughs> Perry's being smothered. All right, now if I if I hang here, there we go. Just hang back up here. Oh, my light's not very good there. That's okay. It's about the book this evening, not about the person. All right, let me reclothe myself, and then uh, I don't know, <laughs> spread my legs real wide. My goodness, it's the t-shirt pillow. It is, and it's a wonderful t-shirt pillow. Y'all remember this. All right. I think this feels much more comfy. Sorry, the lighting's a little weird. Actually, I think I can fix that. Where's my phone at? If I just make this one light over here a little bit better. Here we go. Here we go. This one becomes less... Nope, that's the wrong one. How about this one? That's turning purple. That's not what I wanted at all. Uh, what are you doing, Light? Oh my god, you are absolutely seizing up there. That's incredible. Alright, that's fine. We won't index too much on it. This sounds perfect. Everybody get comfy. I'll be here for a little while. If the microphone sounds weird now that I'm in this position, please let me know and I will try to adjust further. Back to it then, boys, girls, and those who fall in between or beyond. Georgie says, Hunt like a horse! Really never had much of a meeting until now. I try not to stare. And fail. I can handle fangs. The tail. The suede-like bluish-gray skin. Heck, I'm cool with the horns that curl around his head like a badass crown of some kind. And I tell myself that I should ne I should realize that a dude who's seven feet tall, with an enormous member, it's size appropriate. I'm almost prepared for that. Though the sight of it, growing in front of me, kind of kind of makes me clamp up a little bit. In trepidation. I'm not prepared for ridges. He's got ridges! He's got ridges! Just like the upraised texture along his chest, his brows, and his arms, he's got the bumpy, knotty ridges along the top of his thing the dude He's very big. Very, very thick, too. Quite girthy. In addition to those ridges, he has an additional one that almost looks like another horn, except it's blunted at the tip instead of sharp. Small miracle, that. So, okay, he's got a, tex a textured... Hughes Dingamabob with a bony protruding knob an inch or so above it. I feel like there's an alien bingo card somewhere that just got checked off. Horns? Check. Tail? Check. Crazy ass cock? Check, check, check. And since I'm staring, he's giving me heated looks with those glowing blue eyes of his. It's like he's daring me to touch him. And... Okay. I am a little curious about what all that equipment would feel like on a girl, but I'm more interested in bathing than playing hide the sausage. I eye the water he's now thigh deep in, and he crosses his big arms over his chest. Right. My turn. I'm still f scared of the fish from earlier, but if he's in the water, I assume it's safe? I move closer to where he's at, though, just in case, and I'm shivering with cold, so I need to e either get in the damn water with him or redress. 
I look at my filthy clothing and decide to get in the water. I can still smell blood and the mess from the hold on me, and I desperately want to get clean. So I take a leap of faith and get into the water. It smells like rotten eggs, which I've heard is what underground hot springs smell like. I don't really care. The water's warm like a bath, and considering that it's snowy and bitterly cold, I love it. I moan as it hits my limbs, and then I sink deeper, trying to submerge my entire body into the scalding water. Feels amazing right now. I could kiss Vectal for bringing me here. Scary fish and all, I splash water over my limbs, rubbing at them to get rid of the nasty smells of the last ten days of captivity. Vectal moves next to me in the water. He says something, then hands me more berries. He motions that I should squeeze them and then rub the juice on me. And maybe I don't move fast enough for him because he takes the berries from my hand and squeezes the juice onto my shoulders. Then his big hands start rubbing into my skin. I stiffen at first, but his touch is very matter-of-fact. It's like he realizes I just want to get clean and won't monkey around, Despite his enormous erection, he's sporting that says otherwise. Despite that that no enormous erection he's sporting says otherwise. And it's kind of sweet. I guess. He's not touching me or being a creep. He's touching me because he wants to show me how to use the soap. I began rubbing the strange, fruity-smelling lather over my arms and legs, and when he scoops a handful off my shoulder and begins to wash my hair from me, <laughs> I moan with pleasure. Nice! Being clean has never felt so amazing. I hear him inhale sharply, hear the vibrating purr start in his chest again. He murmurs something, voice thick, but all he does is wash my hair. No demanding touches, no insisting of anything, just pleasure in touching me, in pleasing me. Actually, other than the fact that he started, startled the hell out of me with the whole oral thing, he's been kind of sweet. Everything he's done has been designed to please me and give me pleasure. I digest that small bit of information. Maybe it's the Stockholm Syndrome talking. Maybe it's the fact that, with Vectal, I've felt safe. Safer than I have in the last two weeks, but I don't really mind his touch. In fact, I kind of like it. Probably a lot more than I should. I can't look at him while I'm... we're... bathing. My cheeks feel hot, because every so often he leans in closer and prods me with that <laughs> enormous doodad of his, and it makes me think of dirty things. Of his mouth. On me. The suede-like feel of his skin against mine is warmth. His intriguing scent. Suzy, he murmurs, his hands caressing my scalp. G or G. I correct him. There must not be any G sounds in his language, because he slurs them. Suzy, he tries. G, I prompt. She, he begins, then stops and tries again. Corgi? I giggled. Corgi? No, not quite. I turn around and point at my mouth to show him how to move his tongue. Georgie. His fingers brush over my lips in a tender caress. Zorzi. Then he tries again. Georgie. His G is practically purred. Georgie. 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 I'm trying to get that right. Very good. I say, my voice soft. I've just now realized that I'm practically pressed up against him, and I'm naked. <laughs> Georgie, he repeats, purring my name again. Then he takes my hand and places it over his chest, where he rumbles like a cat. Georgie, sa'akum, hektel. The way he says it, with my hand clasped against his heart, makes me think it has a bigger meaning than I'd like to imagine. His gaze is intense, as if he's waiting for me to respond. He's an alien. I remind myself of that. He's an even as it occurs to me that I can convince him to help me help us escape the other aliens. The captors that want to sell us. This has to be a multi-layer plan, I figure. Vectel's planet is cold as hell, and judging from his gear, probably isn't past the Stone Age. But I refuse to give up hope of a way back home. I just know it's not going to happen with the little green men or the ball-headed aliens. They think we're cattle. Vectel's my best bet. Maybe I'm using him a little... Maybe I'm using him a little when I rub my fingers on his chest. They're cold in the frigid, snowy air. My nipples are very hard. I rub up against him deliberately, letting him feel my body. I lick my lips. And then I look up into those alien, glowing blue eyes. And then I point at the mountainside in the distance, where I know that so many women, half in pods, are waiting for rescue while I play bubble bath with a native. Take me up to the side of the mountain. He caresses my face. I'm questioning his gaze. Mount? Yes, I say, and trace my fingers over his skin. 
up there. His brows draw together, and he gives me a shake of his head, indicating that, no, he's not taking me there. All right, then. Time to pull out the big guns. Bechtel, I murmur. Do you know how to kiss? The alien's blank expression tells me he has no clue what I'm saying. Of course he doesn't. So I put a hand to the back of his neck, and I pull him closer to me. He's warm. I rather like the feel of him blocking out the chilly wind. Kiss? I say again. And then I lean in and brush my lips against his. The look on his face is stunned. It's like it never occurred to him that people would put their mouths on each other. <laughs> I stifled the giggle threatened to, threatening to erupt and drag her finger down the front of his chest. I can show you more things if you take me up the mountain. I know I'm playing with fire. Offering him favors in exchange for rescue probably isn't the greatest plan, but I'm working with the weapons that I got. As long as he's fascinated by me, I can use that. It's mercenary, but people's lives are at stake. If I have to kiss an alien and flirt with him to get a rescue to my friends, I will. It's not exactly a hardship. I have to admit, I'm still thinking about his mouth on my skin from the other day. The way he did all up the way that I did, and the way he is staring at me right now, makes me think that intercourse with him wouldn't be something too terrible. It'd be slow, full of discovery. And wicked, dude! And I'm not hating the idea. Not by a long shot. Maybe I'm not in the right frame of mind to be entertaining sexy thoughts, but I just can't help it. I'd play with fire a little more when I draped my arms around his neck and pressed my boobies to his warm, so warm body. His thingamabob pushes against my stomach insistently and I ignore it, twining my fingers in his thick black hair. Vectal leans his face close to mine again, his gaze flicking to my mouth and then to my eyes. He's asking for another kiss, but I'm not really sure how to go about it. Do aliens kiss? I ask softly, leaning in to brush my lips over his again. I'll show you how to do all kinds of kissing if you go up the mountain with me. Mountain, he repeats, and his eyes narrow. He puts his fingers to my mouth, and then to his, and then repeats again. Georgie, mountain. That's right, I say, pleased he's getting it. Take me to the mountain, and Georgie will kiss you again. I press my fingers from my lips to his. That shrewd gaze watches me. He leans in, and I think he's going to kiss me, but he only nuzzles my nose. Georgie, mountain, he says in a low voice. And then I feel his hand slide down to my inner parts, where he drags his finger over top of me. Mountain. <laughs> I, I gasp. It's as much the startling, arousing touch as it is what he's asking. He wants me to do the do with him to take him up the mountain. I consider for a moment, gazing upon at him. Then I reach down, and I grip him. Georgie Mountain. I agree, and I give him a quick st stroke under the water. You take me up the mountain. And this is what you get. He, ugh, he groans and tries to push against my hand, but I release him just as quickly. Mountain, I insist. Mountain, he growls and pulls me against him. His bigger body pressed against mine. For a moment, I panic. I wonder if he's just gonna, like, do it whatever without my bartering. But he only rubs his nose against mine again and then releases me, pointing at my clothing on the bank. Hot damn, we're going up the mountain. Rescue party of two, coming right up. We dress quickly, and I make a face at having to put on my filthy jumpsuit again. The chill in the dry winter air is even worse now that I'm wet and cold, and Vectal insists on me covering my wet hair with the cloak. It's a good idea, but it's still icing up the, bru icing up the brutal cold. Maybe a quick dunk in the river wasn't the smartest of ideas, but I'm clean now. Give me some water a little bit. Actually, I should just move my drinks over here where it's a little more easily accessible for me. At the, the phone. You go back there. Ugh. I don't go back here. Nothing quite like a goblet of water to make sure that your voice doesn't like totally crap out on you, you know? It's just how it is. Yes. He hauls me back into onto the, his shoulders, and then we set off to the mountain again. He's carrying on a grumbling narrative that I can't make out and occasionally pats my cold hands. He puts out, he points out landscape, but if I'm supposed to see something over that snow, I can't quite make it out. We head up the hill steadily for what feels like forever, and I'm getting colder by the minute. My teeth chatter, and my head feels like a block of ice. I'm cold and hungry, and the raw meat I ate has only made me hungrier. I didn't realize how far down the mountain we'd come. 
until I look up and and it, what and it seems that the rocky crag that holds the ship is hours away, which only makes my teeth chatter harder. The steep ground slopes toward a steep cliff I don't recognize, and I'm surprised when Bechtel heads right for it. He sets me down and says something that probably means stay here, and then moves to the base of the cliff and begins to dig. I watch him for a few confused moments before I realize he's uncovering the mouth of a new cave. He's not taking me up the mountain at all! He's taking me to another cave! You've got to be kidding me, I explode. No, Vectil, we're going up the mountain. The alien turns and gives me an irritated look. He lets forth his own stream of narrative, pointing at my ice-covered hair, the fact that my teeth are clicking madly, and then I'm shivering. He continues talking, gesturing at the cave. I don't have to speak alien to know what he's saying. You're cold. We'll stay here tonight. Fuck going up the mountain. And I can't leave the others for another day. I just can't. I'm freezing even with his borrowed cape. And they have nothing. Nothing to eat. Nothing to drink. And no shelter. I'm so frustrated I could scream. Instead, I turn and begin to stop off. Heading to what looks like the path up the mountain, it win winds up the valley wall, laden with snow that's trickled down from above. It feels like I'm wading through water, but I'm not going to give up. If I have to march every step back up the mountain to get Vectal to go with me to see the others, I will. Georgie! He calls from behind me. Then he bellows out the sharp syllable I, n I now know is no. I ignore him and march even faster. Georgie, no! Too late. I don't see the shadowed snow anymore before I realize that when I step too close to the cliff wall, my foot doesn't connect with anything. The ground beneath my feet disappears, and I scream as I slide down an icy crevice for forever. Only it's not forever. It's ten, maybe fifteen seconds, and then I drop and ploof into a pile of snow at the bottom and lie there stunned. Bechtel's not so far away that I can't hear him shouting my name from up above. Yeah, yeah, I mutter. I can't wait for the alien. I was right. You were wrong, and he's going to deliver to me. I sit up and wince at the throb of my bad wrist. It's getting worse all the time. Nothing shuffles nearby, and I freeze. I look at sur my surroundings for the first time. I'm in an ice cave of some kind. Icicles hang from the ceiling. Snowdrifts line the walls, and up above, a trickle of sunlight bleeds in. It's enough light to let me know, let me see the two dozen eyes staring back at me. I'm not alone. I'm in deep, deep shit. And that is the end of part two of that chilly planet that holds barbarians. Time to check in again. Very important to do so when you read content like this. How's everybody doing? How's everything? Th Are things awkward? I guess it kind of looks weird that I look like I'm not wearing pants here. I am. I'm, de I'm definitely wearing pants under this. This is not underwear. It's just, it's just shorts, dude. I just got very hairy legs. As I'm coming to terms with, it seems. Nice boat you got there, Georgie. Why doesn't Vectal think she's an alien? She's so different from me. It's interesting to think that, like, Vectal so far, like, doesn't, like, have a thought of, like, oh, yeah, alien. It's just, like, different species, I guess? I don't really know. Like, like, he didn't quite distinguish the fact that, like, I mean, like... Because he said, oh, we're the only intelligent life over here. So, like, maybe he just, like, I don't know, maybe the term, like, alien is new to I wonder if he realizes that, that there's, like, other planets and stuff out there. I wonder if that's something that, like, Vectal is aware of. You think this is Vectal's greatest fear, getting a mate and then immediately losing them? Oh, dude, amazing. Getting character ideas. Oh, perfect. For D&D? That's what it's all about. I dig that. So long as we're helping each other out here, that's good. I'm actually getting a little hot, all things considered. I mean, need a little bit more water. Oh, actually, I'm gonna go after my tea, which is currently, um, it is continuing to cool. I have to move my chat thing over here a little bit further. My laptop, my lappity top. Oh, I look cute on there. Nice. I'm kind of like, kind of like got this little like a uh, sitting little yoga position. It's all about relaxation. I'm actually trying to determine again. I don't read very often. So what I'm inclined to, what I'm trying to do here as well is to try to figure out like the best like seating position for me in particular, because I don't know the best, I don't really know what the best position for me in reading is. Previously when I'd read like cyberpunk books and stuff, like I'd grab myself a nice cup of tea, I'd just sit on the couch and I'd like, I don't know, I don't really speak out loud with the books. So usually laying down with like my, ow, my head cocked usually is just fine. But in this case, with the, with the consistent vocalizing, it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a different type of problem that I've never actually solved before. I'm actually kind of happy that I'm explaining. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to do this on stream was because I wanted to see, like, whether I'd be able to, like, kind of think of things that I wouldn't normally think of, you know, as you get more experience. This is very cozy looking. I am, I am pretty cozy. I am very warm, I would say. And, uh, and apparently my heart rate would imply that I'm still maybe a little stressed out, but alas, you know, the camera's rolling. 
I'm having a good time. I think, uh, and, and, you know, there's always that looming thought of, oh god, this book. Oh god. So with that, we'll continue on to part three of Chili Planet Barbarossa. Or something like that. I'm actually going to take a break from the music for now, but y'all please keep enjoying. Page check, 67. Teehee, almost. I stare around me uneasily. Somehow, I've fallen through a hole covered by the falling snow. It's a stupid misstep, and it seems that this planet is absolutely riddled with caverns because I've landed in one. And this one's occupied. Really, really occupied. A dozen pairs of eyes stare at me out of weird, fish-like faces. They're kind of human, kind of not. They're bipedal and have two arms and legs and are tall, taller than me. Their eyes are enormous in their pointed faces. Their, mountains, their mouths small and round. They look almost cartoony, except for the matted pale hair that covers almost every inch of their bodies. And they smell like a wet, dirty dog. Oh my goodness. One hoots at me. The sound, quer the sound quer querul querulous. What a word. Hi, I speak softly. I don't move a muscle as they gaze at me. It's clear they're trying to decide if I'm friend or foe. They remind me a bit of Wookiees from a Star Wars movie. Jesus, I've really got my got to get my mind off of Star Wars. Except for the fact that they're white and have enormous eyes. And tails. I realize as one creature moves forward, his tail flicking back and forth like an irritated cat. It cocks its head and studies me. Then it hoots again. Georgie! Vectel snars from above. Georgie! I hear his hands scraping against the ice above, and snow rains down on my head. Think I'm okay? I call up to him. The tail flicking creature lifts its head and hoots at the air again, sounding a bit like an owl. Hoot. Hoot. Moot. More snow flicks onto my face and I peer up. The rocky cavern has a hole up above and Vectel's desperately scraping at it, trying to clear enough space for his much larger body to follow me down. He looks frantic and bellows another command at me that I don't understand. Is it stay put or move or what? I don't really know. I look at the bug-eyed yeti things. One tilts its head at me and wags its tail flash faster. It's almost like an ugly puppy. Almost. I smile and get to my feet slowly, noticing that the puppies are all a foot taller than me. Hey there, I say, keeping my voice sweet and soft. Maybe if I treat it like a puppy, we'll get along just fine. When its nostrils flare and the tail thumping increases, I extend my good hand out so he can sniff it. Immediately, the creature snarls. He slaps my hand away and gives me a vicious shove. I give a startled looking little scream as I fall to the ground. Another creature pounces on me right away, pulling on my hair and my clothing. Another hoots and throws snow at me. I realize they aren't like puppies at all, but more like vicious, angry monkeys. And I'm in an entire den of them. The hand twisting in my hair pulls hard and I scream again, trying to slap it free. Another smacks my injured ribs and the breath gets knocked out of me. I cough and roll around on the ground, trying to protect myself from their wild swings and hooting calls. From above, there's a wild, ferocious roar, then the entire ceiling seems to cave in. Bechtel, thank god. Something heavy slams into the ground, and the creatures screech and retreat. I squeeze an eye open just in time to see Vectal roar with fury, the sound vibrating with intensity. The entire cavern shakes, and I watch as he draws his blades. The creatures back up even more. I don't blame them, Echo. looks. Le Vectal looks utterly terrifying. The light in his cage is blazing, and his fangs are bared with fury. I'm even a little frightened when he turns his gaze toward me. But then he scoops me off the ground and flings me over his shoulder, caveman style, before storming his way down an entirely different passageway. The creatures hoot and scream at him, and when one pounces, I feel Vectal's big arms sweep us it aside as if it's nothing. They cluster about, shrieking, and one grabs at my hair again, fisting a handful before I can bat it away. I cry out, and Vectal turns, this time with a knife. The creature's dead before it hits the ground. I gasp at the sight, but when Vectal's slamming through the cavern, pushing his way through the grabby creatures, I'm so relieved at the sight of sunlight a few minutes later that I want to weep. We're out of the cavern, and the creatures aren't following us. It doesn't mean my alien stops, though. He continues on, trudging through the deep snow with a sense of purpose that makes me a little intimidated. I'm still waiting for the... Yeah, I told you so. That was the end of Page Nice. But I'm cold and freaked out, and I say nothing to protest my stupid move. If he wants to play caveman as long as he keeps me safe, I'm fine with that. He's angry. It's pretty obvious to me that he's rather furious, actually. He muddles under his breath in, his, in an angry tone, and his body is tense against mine. And the thing that sucks the most is that I can't even apologize for stamping off. We don't have the words. I'm so frustrated and unhappy that I want to kick something. 
except my entire body hurts from my fall, and my ribs feel like they're on fire, so instead of kicking something, maybe I'll just cry instead. If I do, though, the tears will probably just stick to my face, because it's too damn cold. This whole damn planet's against me. Damn it! I'm feeling pretty miserable when Vectal sets me down in the snow and glares fiercely at me. Santess! He points at the ground. Tess! Stay here. Got it. I mumble, feeling guilty. I cross my arms over my chest and my weight. He gives me an exasperated look and then heads a few feet away. I notice we're right back at that stupid cliff wall with the buried cave. We're right back where we started a short time ago. Except in the meantime, I've had half my hair pulled out by a rabid yeti, acquired a few more bruises, and now he's pissed at me. I hate this place. I hate that it's cold, and I hate it snowing all the damn time, and everything wants to feed my freaking face, and I, I hate that I'm wearing a smelly gross jumpsuit, and that I ate raw meat, and that there are just a dozen girls up on the hill who would probably kill me to be in my place at the moment, and I can't even feel grateful. I just feel miserable. I do my best to fight back, exhausted, frustrated tears, but they're coming on anyhow. I'm shaking and trembling from cold and misery, and by the time Vectal digs out the mouth of the cave and enters it to make sure it's safe, silent tears are leaking from the corners of my eyes and freezing on my lashes, because of course they are. Not even his cloak is keeping me warm now, and I stifle a stab of resentment that he's practically in a tank top and leggings and seems to be just fine with the weather. After a moment, he emerges from the cave and indicates it's safe to come in. I join him, and it's not much to see the interior of small... The interior, a small grotto hacked out of the rocks that opens up near the cliff wall and then snakes further back into the earth. There are supplies near the front, another leather door hanging, a few furs for warmth, and a small stack of what looks like cakes and mud, and some wood. It's cozier than anything I've seen recently, and it's out of the wind. As Vectal pushes the leather covering over the entrance to block out the rest of the snow and wind, it's dark inside. But I'm safe. Safe. I shiver. And I'm shaken as a sob escapes my throat. Vectal. Not for the first time, I despair at how helpless my mate is. I'm utterly confused by her. If she knows nothing about the land, how did she get here? Even the Metlicks didn't know what to make of her. I'm furious at myself for letting her wander away. I'm furious that the Metlicks could have hurt her more grievously than they did. I know of kits that have been torn apart by accidentally encountering a group of Metlicks on the prowl. Georgie, my precious mate, my resonance fell right into an entire den of them. She could have been killed before I made it down to her. The thought has my hands shaking and my cooey thrumming against my chest with an angry beat. I, how can I possibly take care of someone who's more helpless than a kit? Someone who demands to go into the dangerous mountains instead, instead of letting me take her home from my people? Who is my Georgie? How did she get here? Other than the Metlex and the Skui, there are no other people on this land. She's precious, and I nearly lost her. Twisted in my own anger, stalking about the cage as I prepare a fire for my shivering mate. I stack wood and dung chips, rub the fire-making implements between my palms until I catch a spark, and then create a fire by feeding it tinder. When the flames begin to lick at the wood, I gesture that Georgie, shaking with cold, should move closer. Thank you, she says in a soft voice. I, I don't understand you. I growl at her. It's another obstacle in the way of my mating. I want to tell Georgie that she's mine, that she's my resonance, that she's safe with me, and I won't let any harm come to her if she'll just trust me, and that she is my light and my reason for being now, and that we shall create a hearth, a family together. But I can tell her none of these things. She sniffs loudly. <sighs> I just move a little and moves a little closer to the fire, sticking her tiny five-figured hands out to the warm to warm them. Her bad wrist is an angry color. Malek. The tribe healer could cure this with a touch. But she's not here, and my Georgie must suffer. Give me that, I say gruffly, indicating that she should give me her injured hand. She probably heard it worse during her fall, and I'm chagrined that my mate is so poorly cared for. Now you're mad da date me. Now you're mad at me, she says, and sniffs louder again. Then she bursts into tears. Ah, Georgie. I murmur. I pull her against me. Her face presses against my vest, and she sobs. I stroke her hair, now crunchy, hard with ice. She's gonna get sick. I've forgotten she has no cooey to warm her, and dragged her up to one side of the mountain, and down the next. She's fragile. My small five fingers. I chide myself for not taking better care of her. It will not happen again, my resonance, I tell her. Stroking her rounded cheek, I shall take better care of you, for now. And even though it's callous of me to use all the supplies here, I build the fire even higher. I don't care if I'm sweating as long as my Georgie is warm and comfortable. 
I hold her against me for what feels like forever. Her hands burrow under my clothing, seeking my warmer skin, and my thingamabob that I'm referring to is now, from my point of view, grows hard at her small touches, but she's still crying. And so I hold her and comfort her as best as I can until the tears die away and she was only sniffling her unhappiness. Her hands are still under my clothing, though. My thing hasn't forgotten this, and I ache with need. My cooey thrumming at my chest. I want to make her happy. I want to make her strange, sweet face smile instead of cry. So, while she warms herself by the fire, I dote on my mate like I should. I examine her wrist and then cut a strip from one of the furs, binding it tightly and splinting it against one of my bone knives. It will hold until I take her to the healer. She gives me a grateful smile and points at another one of the bone knives on my chest. Can I have one? I shake my head to indicate I don't understand. And with gestures, she sews me that she wants to hold it. Ah, she wants to defend herself. I give her one of my blades. I wear six, and now I'm down to four. Tomorrow I will show her how to use it and how to stab with it, so if she's attacked by Metlix again, she'll be able to fight back. They are cowardly creatures at heart, and will run if endangered. At the gifting of the knife, her smile widens and she beams unhappily at me, as if I have given her the greatest of treasures. I feel better with it. I nod, though I don't know what she's rambling about. Just that she's smiling. It's enough for me. I will do more, though. There are furs in this cave. Furs left for comfort for hunting warriors who venture out this far. They're stale and stiff with age, but they're warm. When we leave in the morning, I will break the rules of hunting politeness, and she will wear them as we travel. I won't have her shivering anymore. Cook? She asks and points at the kill slung at my belt. Cook now? Cook? I repeat, holding the quilled beast up for her to see. Is this what you call it? Cook? Eat, she says, and smiles up at me, her small teeth gleaning, gleaming. She points at the beast, then at the fire. Cook, then eat, please. Ah, instructions. I point at the fire. Cook. Well, that's fire if you want to get to... Well, that's fire if you want to get technical, but yes. She nods. Cook. Even though it goes against every instinct I have, I do as she asks. I skin the animal and skewer tasty bits on one of my bone knives, and she holds them up to the fire and then eats one with happy smacking noises. She exclaims over each bite, and by the time the food is gone, her eyes are getting drowsy and content. Drowsy and content. <gasps> lost my page. I'm content too. We've stopped early, but Georgie is warm and safe and fed. I explain to her with hand signals that I must stay in the cave and keep the fire going and rest. She looks uneasy, but nods, and I leave her with my bone knife and water skin. I hurry through the gathering, finding the visti dung instead of wood. I have no axe with me, and this far up the mountain, the trees are stunted. I set snares for more quilled beasts and the scythe beak birds. The beasts are the best eating, but Georgie seems determined to go up to the mountain, and we cannot carry so much meat. If she, excuse me, if she were another Sakui, it would be easy. But my Georgie is delicate and not nearly as strong as our weakest warrior. I return to the cave near dark to find Georgie sound asleep, curled up in the blankets, knife in hand. The fire is banked to coals, and her hair has dried into shiny golden brown curls that are lovely to see. They're almost as lovely as the soft smiles she gives when she wakes up. She sits up in the nest of blankets and gives me a sleepy look. Mountain? I shake my head and set down the fire supplies off to one side in the cave. There's a fierce snowstorm outside, and the drifts we may must wade through to go up the mountain are getting deeper by the moment. I pull back the hide door and show her the snow. She looks crestfallen. Tomorrow we will go to the mountain, I tell her. I'm not sure why she is so desperate to go, but it must mean something to her. I gesture with my hands, trying to explain that we'll go when the sun rises again and the storm stops. Eventually, I just settle for soon. Soon, she echoes and gives me a smile. She seems satisfied with my answer. The day is going to be a long one. The suns would still be high. Sty, high uh, the day is going to be a long one. The suns would still be high in the sky if it were out, and we are snowed in, tucked away against the bitter cold. Georgie cannot withstand it like I can, and having her with me slows me down. I would not trade her presence for my finest hunting. I would not trade. I would not trade her presence for the finest hunting. But I must acknowledge that having my mate with me means I must make different tr different choices than I would if I was alone. Caring for her has now taken priority. The thought of being with her all day feels like a gift. She gestures at the fire and says my word for fire. Yes, fire. Fire, 
She repeats, then grabs a handful of the furs she's sitting on and gives me a questioning look. Furs. Furs, she echoes. The words sound funny in her mouth, as if she has had a hard time making the rumbling throat noises that I do. But I'm pleased she wants to learn how to communicate with me. For the next while, we name off things that are easily pointed at, and Georgie tries to pronounce them. Then, she goes back and repeats them in different orders each time, trying to learn the words. Progress. Eventually, we run out of things to name in the cave and proceed to bodies. She pats her curly, disheveled locks. Hair, I say automatically, amused that she immediately starts finger combing her tresses. I will make her a bone comb when we return to my home cave. Hair, she grumbles, giving up on the tangles. Then she leans towards me and pats my mane. Hair? Hair. I agree. Her fingers move to my horns and she lightly skims one. What's this? Horns, I tell her. I scarcely dare to breathe as she traces along it. Though my horns do not have much feeling, her breasts are close to my face, and the scent of her is arousing. I long to grab her, pull her against me, but instead I clench my fists and force myself to remain unmoving. What's this? She asks again, and her fingers brush over my forehead, the bony ridges there, and then my nose. Face? I don't understand what she's asking. I touch her cheek. Face like yours. But she gives a small head shake and rubs one of the ridges with a small fingertip. It makes my lelula leap to attention. And now I'm erect. Aching. I feel my pulse. Her fingers touch the ridges along my nose and then over my brows and then brush over my heart. Slick him are? Slick harm? Slick? Slick harm? Slick harm. It's just skin, I tell her. Hers is smooth all over. While mine has texture in certain places, her funny, flat brow and tiny nose look odd at me, and her comment makes me think that perhaps I look strange to her. Her fingers trail down my chest a bit more, and she keeps touching me with soft, ticklish bruises, brushes of her fingertips. My cooey vibrates with need, and I have to close my eyes to embrace myself. I'm gonna burst across her hand if she reaches any lower, so I grab her hand before she can keep exploring. Georgie is in control. But I can't take much more of this gentle exploration if she touches me again. I'm gonna throw her down on the furs. And I'm gonna do her until she screams. Georgie. Bechtel takes my hand in his. I run my fingers down one shoulder. Oh boy. Oh boy. It has that ridged, gnarled, armor-like plate over one bicep and the back of a hand. No, he tells me in his language. I'm confused. I thought he liked me and wanted me to touch him. His soft leather leggings can't hide the erection straining currently against them. I'm a little frightened by the sheer size, but I know Vector would never hurt me. He's been fussing over me all afternoon, making sure my wrist was alright, checking my bruises, and shoving small bits of cooked food into my mouth. All while he was touching me with possessive little touches that let me know that he was right there with me. That he was aware of me. So to be pushed away now? When we're learning about each other? Kind of hurts my feelings. No? He sees the hurt on my face, and I hear his chest thrumming even harder. Georgie, he says in that soft, unique way of his. He gestures at himself, then glances heavenward and mutters something that I can't quite make out. Are we done playing our game then? I ask. I was just getting to the interesting parts, and okay, might be flirting a bit, because touching him and feeling that suede-like skin against mine and watching him react? It's like catnip to a cat. He's warm and soft, and those rock-hard muscles? He looks at me. It's intoxicating. I wonder if he's attracted for his attracted for his people. He's attractive to me. Now that I've got past my initial shock of the horns and blue skin and glowing eyes thing, his features are strong, well-defined. His nose straight and regal, even if it is rigid. His cheekbones are high, and he's got a beautifully sculpted mouth. And he has the most amazing shoulders and biceps. I want to fan myself just thinking about them. Fact is, he's just pure pleasure to touch. I've been enjoying running my hands over him quite a bit, and I can't get our little interlude in this. I can't get our little interlude in this stream a few hours ago out of my mind about his hand dragging down me and claiming me with a touch, letting me know that he wants me if he's going to take me up the mountain. I touched him back, grip that large, delicious piece in my hand, and give it a squeeze, let him know that I'm willing to play the game. Georgie, he says again. He gives me another shock of his, shake of his proud head and then rubs a hand down his face in a very human-looking gesture of frustration that makes me smile. 
Yes. Rrr, I purr, sidling up against him. Now that the cave is warm, I've stripped off most of the furs I was cocooned in, and am down to my jumpsuit. I'm so close I can practically rub myself on his arm, and he won't look at me. Instead, he shakes his head and says something that sounds like Sa Nisaki Yemev. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I say, brushing a finger through his mane. His hair is straight, black, and coarse, and really thick. It doesn't grow anywhere else on his body either, which I find interesting. He pushes my hand away, but I hear the strange purring going wild in his chest. I know he's enjoying my touch, I just don't understand why he won't look at me, or why he pushes me away. Vectal, I ask, I don't understand. His eyes flare with light anew, and he takes my wrist and guides my hand to the special spot, straining his soft breeches. Then he gives me a look, as if to say, You see? Ah! I get it now! A small smile curves my mouth, and I feel rather powerful at the moment. He won't touch me, won't look at me, because it's arousing him, and he doesn't want to push me into anything. Aw, really, for a big barbarian, he's being the perfect gentleman. It's ironic, because now, I'm the one who wants to do more. Maybe it's the need for comfort, or the fact that I find him weirdly attractive, or maybe it's that my belly's full and I feel safe for the first time in what feels like forever, but I'm in the mood. The more he tries to be noble about things, the friskier I become. Well, I guess I don't need to ask about birth control, do I? I say to him, and put a hand on his shoulder. God, I'm loving this. It feels purely decadent. I'm not on the pill. Not that that matters now, and I'm pretty sure that since we're different species, you can't possibly get me pregnant. He watches me, with narrowed eyes, as if waiting to see what I'm going to do. Well, allow me to make the first move, I tell him softly, reaching out to undo top laces on his unusual vest. Vectel's strange eyes flicker with light, and then he purrs harder than ever, his chest practically vibrating from the strength of it. I appreciate the rescue from earlier. I say, tugging at the laces, the fabric, a soft hide of unnatural coloration, falls away at my touch. I brush aside knives and pouches tied to it, revealing Vectal's coarse, broad chest, the ridges that cascade down his breastbone between two massive, large pectorals. Allow me to show you how much. I lean forward to kiss him, and he automatically leans away, looking at me with surprise. Kiss, I say, stifling a giggle. I'd almost be offended at his expression of surprise, but I know Vectal's not familiar with kissing. Maybe he doesn't do the love like the humans do. The thought intrigues me. Kiss, he agrees. And when I lean forward again, he doesn't pull away this time. I brush my lips over his firm mouth. His lips don't have any part under mine. If anything, he's kind of stiff and unresponsive when I kiss him. I decide to coax him a little bit more pressing the lips over and over, and then give him a little nibble. He doesn't open up no matter how much I try to, so I gently brush the seam of his mouth with my tongue. He jerks back in surprise, eyes narrow, as he gazes at me. Still a kiss, I tell him. I wrap my arms around his neck. It's called a Le French kiss. It's where the tongues, they touch each other. I think you'll kind of like it if you give me a chance. Fechtel's gaze remains focused on my mouth as I speak. He leans in and presses his mouth to me, quickly and then gives me a suspicious look, as if waiting to see if I'll correct him. Kiss, I agree, and press my mouth softly to his again. When I feel his tongue brush my lips, I capture the tip of it, and suck on it ever so slightly. He groans, and so do I, the ridges creasing his brow, his chest, his everything. They're also on his tongue. I'd forgotten about this. Ah, I remember now. Vectal thrusts his hands into my tangled hair and holds me against him. Kiss, he demands again. It's clear he wants some more. So I give him more. I lock my mouth to his and slide my tongue against that textured one of his, and we moan. He's still against me, as if judging my, mom my movements, learning them. Learning with me. So, I brush my tongue against his fangs, pleased to, the pleased to feel the purr in his chest escalate. When I'm breathless from kissing, I pull away from him and give him a pleased look. So how was that? Kiss, he says again, and then he takes charge. He pulls me towards himself and begins an all-out kissing assault that leaves me completely dazed. He nibbles and sucks at my tongue and then starts like a slow, languid, like, like, rhythming motion 
that reminds me of coitus and leaves me aching with need. By the time I pull up for air, we're in the furs together, metaphorically speaking, and I'm pressed against him, obviously naked. My pulse is throbbing a beat between between my body parts, and I'm aching with need. You're kind of good at that. Boy, really good. He's going to kill me if he gets any better. Georgie, he mut murmurs against me. Kiss! And his hands go to the collar of my grimy jumpsuit. He presses his mouth along my upper lip, and then my cheek, and then my jaw. Kiss, he says softly again. Yes, I say, and pull at the fastenings of my jumper. I tug it open, and I am free. He looks at my bare skin with something akin to wonder. His large, three-fingered hand lifts. I thought he had four fingers. And he presses his palm, not to my breast as I expected, but to the smooth valley in between. My solar plexus and sternum, that is. He strokes my skin, and then runs his knuckles up and down my breastbone. He's fascinated. Interesting. Then Vectel's attention turns... Uh, turns... Whoa. Then Vectel's attention turned towards the other side, and he brushes, my, brushes his knuckles over my nipply bits. I gasp, feeling arousal bolt through my body, and he seems equally surprised at the texture of my skin. He lightly touches one with a fingertip, and it hardens, and it puckers. Sim! He says in a low, reverent voice. Then he touches my skin between and says again, Sim! Soft? I ask. I touch his chest, the ridge is there, and then shake my head. Sim? Georgie Sim, he says, voice ragged. Georgie Sim! The thought looks like it tortures him. Yeah, I guess I'm pretty soft. I agree, smiling. But, but I'm fun to touch, right? And I grab his hand, and I pull it towards me. He responds by kissing me again, and I lean into his caresses. There's something about it that's just so, there's something about him that's just kind of delicious. His kisses turn hungrier, and naturally, I let out a cry. As his hands cup around me, I press against him, wanting a little bit more of his touch. Vectel's big hand moves all over my body, exploring. He pushes at my open jacket, and I remove it because I... I kind of want him to touch me naturally. Pressing my skin against his is warmer than any piece of clothing. I want to be against him, naked, and the thought of his big body covering mine sends shivers of anticipation through me. I shimmy out of my jacket, tight sleeves resisting a little thanks to my bad wrist and the wrappings around it. But hey, now I'm topless. I push at his vest because turnabout is fair play, and he removes it. Then we're both half naked and gazing at each other, exploring the differences in our bodies. Nice. He has the textured, armor-like patches on his arms and chest, and I'm just soft all over. He's got suede light skin that feels like heaven against mine, but we both have belly buttons, and we both have nipples. I run my hands over his, and they feel kind of hard, textured, like the armor plates. Maybe that's why he's so fascinated at the softness of mine. I press my breasts against his and tuck my chin against one hard shoulder. This allows me to run my hands down his back and sigh with pleasure as I continue. He's purring really, really hard now. His entire chest is like practically vibrating, and it feels kind of cool. His shoulders are enormous. The strength in them kind of turns me on. His back has more of the textured ripples down his spine, and they lead to his tail. I have to admit, that tail kind of makes me smile. It's a long cord tufted with black hair like on his head, and it's currently lashing back and forth against the blankets. <laughs> Georgie, Bechtel murmurs into my ear, and then I feel him nuzzle at my neck. Ooh. He starts to lick the tender skin of my neck, and then goes to my ears, and then to my earlobes. By the time he returns to my neck a few moments later, I'm into it, and then I press up against him further. His hands go down to my butt, and he pulls me against him, and he's brushing his lip over top of my body, and I cry out when he takes a little bite, and I cling to his horns, holding on to him as he coaxes and teases me with his lips. Oh, Jesus! The tongue ridges are pretty good. They drag over my sensitivity until I'm practically climbing all over. I'm panting and feeding, and over and over he nuzzles with his mouth until I just, I just gotta vocalize naturally. Bechtel's hands tug at my pants, and that seems like a fantastic idea. I shuck them with quick movements, eager to be naked against him as well. You too, I tell him, pressing my mouth against his. I want you naked too. I get to my feet to pry the tight pants off, and you know... I'm feeling pretty ready now. I can feel my juices. I've got nothing underneath this uniform. I really didn't have any when I got here. I'm pretty much naked. Pasty, bruised skin, and all. My big alien pushes my hands aside, and when I try to go back into his arms, instead he insists on checking over all of my bruises. I assume looking for new ones. 
I roll my eyes and endure his ministrations, more interested in getting into his pants than having him peek at my bruises. When he insists, I turn around so he can look at my back. I give him an exasperated sigh and put my hands to his breeches, sliding them in to cup, of course. That gets his attention, fast. My hands curl around him, and with touch only, I can feel the difference between him and like a human man. For one, it's pretty girthy. He's very, very hot to the touch, and in addition to the size that we observed earlier, he's kind of got that hard, like, knobby, knuckle-shaped ridge thing that we also talked about that protrudes over top. I really don't know what it's for, and no questions to ask about it. He's also ridged there, though the skin feels less abrasive, more textured, kind of like the tongue. God, I bet that would feel amazing. I shiver at the thought. Lucky females, I guess. I'm interested in more of this, I say to him. I slide my fingers underneath and feel the base that I see below. I wonder if he's sensitive. He hands, his hands go to my hair, and he begins to kiss me yet again, flicking his tongue against mine like the sandpaper. I moan, and I grip him a little bit tighter. I want him naked, but he's still wearing his pants. So, naturally, I try to fix that. Unfortunately, I can't really figure out how to lace them. He's got a breech cloth of some kind over leggings that are rigged with some sort of complex laces that are just too much for this needy girl to figure out, so I settle for just shoving them down his hips. Vecto clutches and murmurs something against his mouth. He pulls at the laces and his pants sag, and then they just fall down. Well, damn it. Maybe I just don't know how alien clothes works. I no longer care I, either because my beautiful big alien is now naked and I get to bask in his glory. When he stands at his full height, he's gorgeous. What a beautiful alien. He looks down at me, blue eyes glowing brightly, and his chest rumbles with the continuous purr, his hands checking for a purr of my own. Humans don't do that, I tell him. Instead, we start to moisten up a little bit. And I take his hand and guide it down below so he can see for himself. My big alien falls to his knees and he groans. He presses kisses against me and then reaches below, holds my hips, and goes and did what he did earlier, which you guys can just visualize on your own. I gasp and my knees get weak, so I have to cling to one of his horns again. In response, he lifts me off my feet and places me down on the furs, looping my legs over his shoulders and just absolutely going at it. His tongue sweeps over and I moan, naturally. Oh God, he's doing that licking thing again with that crazy tongue of his, sweeping those ridges over all of my sensitivities. And I quote, lapping up my juices. I whimper and cling to his horns, spreading a little bit wider. Feels kind of good. I've had stuff like this before. Oral many, many times. But between this whole, like, purring thing and the texture, I, I don't think I've had anything quite like this. Two licks, and, I, and, and I'm at level two. Three more, and I'm at level three. Two more after that, and naturally I'm at level five. And I am crying because of this. And my big, brutal alien just ignores my pleading and just keeps on going. Slow and steady, wins the race. And his motions tell me that he's enjoying this just as much as I am, and he murmurs soft, unintelligible words with every stroke. And when it swirls around, I practically scream, please, oh God, please. But of course, he doesn't understand what I'm saying. So I wail and I beg, and he just kind of keeps on going. And I clutch on the horns and I'm like, man, this is pretty good. A very pleasurable torture indeed. Stop, I moan. I am very ready and I'm aching, and I kind of want to take things further. The, the All this, like, uh, foreplay stuff is just making me crazy with need. Oh, God, stop, Vectal. I want you in me now. In response, his tongue goes deeper. Deep, and it rubs. I reach a peak, a bigger peak than ever before. I'm kind of thrashing against the furs now, and I'm not really sure because I'm seeing stars at the moment, and between that and everything else that's going on, there's just no room for any conscious thought. How can you think of literally anything else? He growls, clearly enjoying what I, what's happening here, and just laps up harder, which makes it even more potent, potent, and seems to go on mile after mile after mile, which is a very interesting way to describe licking motions. I'm utterly spent, exhausted when he finally lifts his head, and his eyes are practically glowing like headlights, and his licks have, sin have sinfully made his mouth glimmer a little bit. I feel wrung out at the sight of that. I- <laughs> excuse me. I feel completely wrung out at the sight of that. This is how I've been experiencing wonderfulness so frequently that I'm pretty sure that it wasn't just one peak, but many dozen on top of each other, cascading with every flick of that 
talented, talented stamina of his. Whew. Your women must be, uh, have high stamina. And I tell him weakly as he crawls over top, like a big blue-gray panther begins to nuzzle at my throat. I need a rest break, but he's raring to go, pressing his mouth along my skin and licking all the parts that he finds soft, which, from my human body, is pretty much everywhere. He touches my cheek and murmurs something soft and sweet, and then my name. His hips settle somewhere between mine, and I realize just what he was packing now. Suddenly, all of his enthusiastic licking motions takes on a whole new meaning because, well, I'm ready. Georgie, he murmurs, and I realize he's saying something I've heard before. Georgie, Saak, Vectal. He nuzzles my throat again, and I feel him pressing against me. Damn, I'm ready for this. Beyond ready. Seriously, I am. He presses his lips against mine again, and then begins to push. My body's stretching to accommodate everything, and I drag my hands over his skin, stroking and petting as he presses. When he's seated entirely, I learn something a little bit new. That, that like, knob thing that I had no idea what it was for, I still don't know what it does. But I do notice that as everything presses a little bit further, it kind of pushes into my ridges and bruises around me. And I'm trying to analyze this tech, this unique sensation as everything continues to move around and every nerve ending lights up in response to the push of everything. Ooh. Kind of reminds me of this time that I was using a rabbit vibrator and it kind of worked me all the best ways. This kind of sa-sa-ak stuff, it's kind of like that but it's even better, and it's more intense. This might just kill me out of sheer pre pleasure. And my legs are, oh my God, my legs are cramping up. Oh my goodness, oh, excuse me for a moment. This might just kill me out of sheer pleasure. I cling to him as he begins to go at it again, and then do, sucking in a breath when his ridge pushes right up against me specifically. Did I think that this woman-eating monster was too much to handle because of his sheer enthusiasm? It's nothing compared to the mind-blowing sensation of him just absolutely going at it and enjoying himself. That ridge, the teasing, every single stroke, I'm... <laughs> I peek again. And then again. And then again. I claw his back, and I scream as he continues to do this whole motion over and over and over again, whispering soft words. I'm literally ripping apart with every single stroke until I am boneless, weak, mewing mewing and yet still peeking over and over again my exhausted legs are quivering and everything just begins to take on a wider a wilder edge to it vectal bears his fangs his own features tightening as he must peek as well i rake my nails down the tough ridge spots on his chest and arms and he growls low in his throat and shudders i can tell he's a fan of that and so i do it again why don't you lap up the juices i say to myself Baby, I think as he wrings yet another peek out of out of me, I choke on the overwhelming pleasure. Then I feel a pulse. The rest of my body feels several degrees hotter on the inside now. And he continues to growl louder and louder. The purr, thunder, a thunderous rumble. He continues to push and fingers dig into my hips and I can continue to feel the warmness continuing. This is a very new sensation for me. It's very warm. Hell, all this is kind of warm. But when he finally collapse, collapses like a big, delicious blanket and then presses the ridges of his forehead against mine and he murmurs my name, maybe? I actually feel content. Boneless, of course, but utterly, completely content. And I want to ask him if he wants to take me up to the mountain tomorrow, but it seems like the wrong time to ask. I don't want him to think I only slept with him because I want him to do something for me. If I'm being totally honest with myself, I slept with him because I'm completely attracted to him. The horns, the blue-gray skin, the tail, <laughs> the, the weird doodad, all of it. His gruff, protective demeanor kind of does it for me. He shifts over me, clearly trying to pull his weight off of me. I cling to him because I love the feel of his big, warm body, and in mine, I sigh with contentment. Vectal, on the other hand, begins to kiss me again, and I feel him continue to move his hips in a shallow thrust. A small moan rises up from my throat again. Man, jam. It's a good thing I can't. you can't put a baby in me, I say, even as I lock my feet and things continue. <clears throat> Vectal. All night long, my cooey thrums with contentment in my chest. 
I've claimed on my mate over and over. She's welcomed me into, into her until we're both exhausted from pleasure. Being with a residence mate is like no other feeling. I'm pleased to my very marrow with my sweet Georgie. I cannot wait to return to the tribal caverns with her. My hand caresses her soft skin, even as she snores in my ear, the sunlight streaming in through the gaps in the cave mouth covering. I cannot wait for her to swell with my child, our child. My cooey is wise to pick her, even though she is small. She is strong in heart and spirit and creative and enthusiastic in the furs. She doesn't resonate for me, not yet, but when she carries a cooey, she will thrum with pleasure at my touch, like I do at hers. From now until my spirit departs this plane, there shall be none for me but her. This is actually really sweet. From now, oh, uh, I touch her, whoa, I touch her sleeping features reverently, memorizing them. She's a strange, tiny thing and soft all over, but <laughs> the way she grips me so tightly, it's like ecstasy, and I cannot quite describe it. Her taste is sweet, but the expression she makes as I completely fill her, even sweeter. I look forward to tonight, when I will drag my Georgie back to bed until she's mewing yet again, with exhaustion, but still eager for more. I press my mouth to hers to wake her. Georgie? Her eyes still so dull and lifeless without the shine of a cooey flutter open. It will need to be remedied, and soon I decide. She looks tired, the circles under her eyes deep against her pale skin. Vectal, she murmurs happily and slides a hand down my chest, which starts my cooey to a thrumming again. M mountain I ask her, raising a brow with an amusement as she tries to burrow back under the blankets and return to sleep. Nat wakes her up. Mountain? She asks, eyes wide. I nod. Dress yourself. I will check the traps, and then we'll go. Dunno what you said, but let's go. She looks excited, flinging her pale arms around the cave and searching for her discarded clothing. It takes some convincing to get her to stay in the cave while I go out to check the traps. But with, hand, with hand gestures and our, our words, I manage to relay that I go much faster if I'm alone. She kisses me frantically before I leave, as if ensuring that I'll return for her. As if anything would ever keep me from her side. Again. Rubbing my pulsing chest, I smile to myself and trudge through the snow. Yet another night of steadily falling powder, and the trails are almost entirely covered. I have walked these grounds many times in the past, though, and I know exactly where to set my traps for them, to yield prey. Since it is just Georgie and me, my traps are small and their catches even smaller. Were I hunting for my people, I would seek the visti, bring them down, and then bury them in the snow with a marker until a party could be sent back later to retrieve the bounty. This morning, though, I have two quilled beasts and a small hopper to feed my Georgie. There's no nearby stream, so I gather pure sweet snow in my skin and then hold it against my chest so it can melt. I check all my traps, and it's not until I'm returning back from the last one that I notice an oddly shaped lump in the newly fallen snow. Curiosity gets the better of me, and I approach it, then nudge it with a boot to uncover what lies beneath. It's a foot. Small bear. Five-toed. Like my Georgie, it's frozen solid. As I stare down at it, I realize my Georgie's not here alone. This is why she's so frantic to get up the mountain. There are others like her, or at least there were. And this ends part three of Barbarians Who Live on Sub-Zero Temperature Planets, naturally. Whew, how's it going? Children, you say, says little Abe. He's invested, and he fell asleep. Oh, that's so cute. Well, at least we're all comfortable here, it seems. This is very nice. I am admitting that my legs are cramping up so badly right now. So, like, I gotta, like, I think I gotta, like, adjust my seating position. Oh, my gosh. Another person. But they're dead. <laughs> they're dead. They're freaking dead. I cannot believe it. We are what seems to be almost halfway through the book. We are at page 91 right now. Yeah, we're more than halfway through the book. All right. And we were at the three and a half hour mark. My goodness. I can't believe somebody else has died out there. It's incredible. Oof. Grab my... Make sure that my music properly repeats itself. Otherwise, things make it quiet around here. <laughs> Everyone there needs a barbarian. Everybody needs their own barbarian. Who also has a fluttering cooey. Which I still don't know what that means. I'm gonna guess it's an organ, I guess. Uh, but the fact that this, this, you know, Vectal is implying that, like, Georgie's gonna get her own cooey has me a little confused, all things considered kind of wild as we're at the halfway point and i have been drinking a lot of water mostly because this is actually taking a lot more of a toll on my voice than i thought it would i guess the i guess i've never really done voices this long before but uh it's fun i'm having a good time but i have drank a lot of water my water jug over here is getting a little bit low so i am going to take a small little break i have a break screen um i don't really feel like using it so instead 
I'm just gonna let y'all chill with the music, and I guess just kind of I'll leave this here, to so that y'all can know exactly what's going on. Kui equals living being inside. Oh, that is such an interesting thought. Maybe it's like a symbiotic relationship thing. In any case, more so. Does anybody want anything while I'm downstairs? If so, let me know. So I shall return momentarily. Please enjoy the music. Oops, I dropped something. That's okay. Alright, everybody. The shall continue. Oh, as I carefully wedge myself in between the bar and my microphone, I have returned. Perry, did you hold down the fort? Little Abe, did you hold down Perry while Perry held down the fort? I hope everything's okay. I hope y'all are doing good. I'll admit, I grabbed a little snack downstairs, too. Oh, he's a little hungry. So, uh, completely refueled. On for... Part four. I was going to say part two because we're halfway through. But part four. More water. Stay hydrated, my friends. Stay very hydrated. 
How much space is there between the mic and the bar? Let's see. Like this much space. That's between the mic and the bar. You could probably get it, uh, I could get it closer. I actually have it attached to a chair over here, the microphone. Pretty awesome. Usually it sits on the desk, but I had to dislodge it today. It seems like there's so much more space. Oh no, everything looks like that. I try to angle things so things look like there's more space. Also, I just noticed, I'm pretty sure they described Vectel's hair as being like a dark black. And according to the cover of this book, it's like a sapphire ultramarine blue. So somebody's lying. And apparently it's Ruby Dixon, which really feels like a pen name, all things considered. Alrighty. This stream is amazing. Highly supportive. I'm very glad that we're enjoying this. I am hot under the collar. And that's not just because it feels hot in the apartment, but also because I went downstairs and my heart rate probably went up because it actually feels hotter downstairs. So, that's my excuse. And such we continue with Chili Planet Barbaros, Ice Planet Barbarians, Part 4, Georgie. <laughs> Vectel's out checking traps and getting some me some not hoth breakfast. Since I'm stuck at the cave, I decide that today I'm going to leave with the blankets instead of abandoning them here at the cave like we did last time. Vectel has already indicated that he wants me to be ultra bundled when we leave, and since we're heading up the mountain, I want blankets for the other girls. The only way that's going to work is if I can wear them. So I'm busy slicing makeshift ties out of lining of my jacket and poking holes to the edge of one of the furs with my knife to make it a cloak. I'm not much for sewing, especially with these terrible supplies, but it's something to do while I wait on Vectel to return. I'm testing my second cloak when Vectel rushes back to the cave, his glowy eyes frantic. I get up, alarmed. What is it? He grabs me and pulls me against his chest, stroking my hair. He's breathing hard, and this might be the first time I've heard him winded. Normally nothing phases him, but right now, he's rattled, and he makes me scared. Vectel? He cups my cheek and gazes into my face. Then he peers into my eyes, puts a hand to my forehead, then to my breast. Excuse me. Ask a question I can't. Asks a question I can't make out. I frown and shake my head. I'm fine. What's going on? Georgie, he says, and then utters something else that I'm pretty sure is, "Come with me." I put on the heavy furs, and he nods, helping me bundle, helping me bundle up. When every inch of me is covered in shaggy hides and I'm practically sweating, he tucks me onto his back and out into the snow we go. It's a lot warmer this way, and I'm rather enjoying the snowy weather as Vectel does the hard work, tromping through the deep snow. The two sickly pale suns are out, and the world looks rather beautiful right now, like a snowy paradise. I'm so busy admiring my surroundings that I don't notice Vectel has stopped until he nudges my arm and then gestures at the snow. There's something in the drifts. Somehow, I, I don't think this is a hunting kill. My stomach churns sickly. I slide off his back. Holding my furs against my body, I move forward and brush a bit of the snow aside. It's a face. Human. Red hair. Her eyes are open and frozen. I gasp. Dominique! Her clothing is ragged and dirty, and it's clear from the tinge of her skin that she's been out for here for a while. She's frozen through and through. A sob escapes me, and I look at Vectel. He points at the girl, his eyes pale as if with shock. Georgie? No, I'm Georgie. I say, then point at her. That's Dominique. And then I try to teach him the word human by spreading my five fingers. I can't stop sniffling, though. What's she doing here? Did they send her after me? Another sob catches my throat. Bechtel, we have to go up the mountain, please. Mountain? Human? He asks, voice low. Yes, I say, feeling frantic. Well, I've been fucking around with an alien and eating and wearing worm furs, the others are, st are starving and cold. I point up the mountain. Please, please let's go to the mountain. He nods and lets a stream of syllables fly. I don't understand them, but when I gesture that I want on his back again, he hauls me against him and begins a quick pace up the snowy hills and past the cliff we spent the night at. This time, we're going up the mountain. I want to sob with relief. Instead, I keep thinking of Tominique's frozen face. Poor Tominique, what happened? Why did they send her out with no clothing? It's a death sentence! Are they so desperate they had no choice? Hurry, please, I tell him. He doesn't understand the word, but maybe he hears the urgency in my voice. His pace picks up. 
It takes at least two hours of Vectal's steady measured pacing before I get a glimpse of the black hull of the ship. It's almost entirely covered by snow at this point, and I suck in a breath at the sight of it. I can't be warm, no matter the insulation. N no matter the insulation. Up this high, there aren't many trees and no wildlife. The air feels thinner, and I wonder if the aliens deliberately stranded us at the most inhospitable site so that we wouldn't run away. Well, fuck that! We're getting out of here today, and I'm gonna take my girls with me. I just pray that they're still alive. Bechtel points at the black oblong vessel that had broken off from the ship. Sa? Yes, I tell him. Sa. It takes a bit longer for us to get up to the discarded portion of the ship. The slope is rocky and steep, and going up proves to be a bit of a challenge that I hadn't had while going down. We get to the edge, and I see a snowy drift is high enough on one side that it can act as a ramp. I must have, it must have snowed a lot here. Ugh. I drop off Vectel's back and nudge ahead, taking the lead. The breeze is picking up, so I swaddle the furs closer to my face and climb up the ramp. The hole is covered by the tarp, so I tug it up. A snowball immediately hits me in the face. I sputter, wincing and staggering backwards. It's nailed me right in the nose, and my face throbs, my eyes stinging. Back the fuck off! A, face, a voice yells. Another snowball lobs in my direction, and I duck at it. Vectel gives a furious cry, pulling me behind him, rage lighting in his eyes. As I watch, he pulls two bladed carved short swords from his vest. Wait, wait, I yell. Guys, guys, it's me, Georgie. Silence. Georgie? A voice cries. It sounds like Liz. You're alive? I am. I yell back. Fuck off with the snowballs. What's with the lion, Georgie? Someone else calls. Call it off. It's not a lion. It's a native. And it's my friend. His name is Vectal. I pat Vectal's arm, trying to soothe him since he looks as if he wants to crawl inside and murder everyone. It's okay, big guy. Really. I'm so relieved at finding the others alive that I can blubber big, ugly tears of joy. I try to move forward only to have Vectal block me again. I give him an exasperated look. Really, it's fine. These are my people. Humans. Humans! He points, repeats and points at his fingers. That's right. Grudgingly, he moves aside, and I push the tarp away and duck just in case another snowball comes flying my way. When nothing does, I peek right in. Five ragged girls stare up at me, faces dirty. Liz, Kira, Megan, Tiffany, and Josie are all still alive, though they look like hell. Their eyes are hollow, their hair is lank, and they quiver as they stare up at me. I think they're all beautiful. I'm so happy to see them that I burst into tears. Hi! I sob out. Georgie? Vectel asks. His hands go to my back, his touch possessive. I turn and pat him, trying not to blubber and failing miserably. Help me down? My wrist is still crap, but Vectel's strong. He helps lower me into the hole just enough that I can grab onto some of the wreckage. I climb down awkwardly, falling forward when I get close to the floor. Then the five girls are grabbing me, hauling me against them in big smelly hugs. You guys smell awful, I say between sobs and hug each one. Liz is grinning wide. But Josie seems listless, her delicate figure practically skeletal. Tiffany's blubbering as much as I am, and both Megan and Kira are quiet. Here, I say, stripping the furs off my body. Please take these. You guys have to be freezing. They grab the furs with greedy hands, and I don't even mind. I strip them off, happy to hear their moans of pleasure as they get their first warm clothing in days. I thought you were dead, Tiffany says. You never came back. I got up. I got held up. Are you guys okay? I ask as they snuggle in the blankets. Kira's wearing Vectel's traveling cloak, and Liz and Megan are huddling together under one fur, Josie and S Tiffany under the other. They're standing and alert, so that's good. Megan sniffs and then sneezes. The others grimace. Liz, rub Liz rubs her forehead, and she's clearly exhausted. We're hanging in there, Liz says. Food's almost gone. Water, too. But something big and heavy thumps behind me, shaking the entire cargo hold. Everyone's eyes go wide as they scatter, retreating. I turn and see Vectel shaking a bit of snow off his leather boots. His nostrils flare with the stench of unwashed bodies and human waste, and then his gaze fixes on me. He frowns at the realization that I've given away all of my furs. It's okay, I tell him, moving to one, his one side. I pat his big chest, trying to soothe him with small touches. Vectel, these are my people. He understands you? Liz asks in a small voice. Well, only little bits and pieces, I say, watching him. I don't think he's going to greet the others with oral sex, but eh, you never know. He gazes at the others and then puts a hand on the back of my neck and pulls me against him, possessive. 
Yeah, I guess I'm the only one special enough for that greeting. Oddly enough, I'm pleased by the thought. I like being special to him. Ladies, I say, gesturing at my big blue-gray friend, this is Vectal. He comes from around these parts. They look at him. Warily. He looks like a demon, Liz says. Ever blunt. He's nice, I promise, I say, and give him another pat on the chest. He's been keeping me alive for at least a few days. I don't care if he looks like a demon, Josie says, her small voice trembling. I is that a dead animal hanging from his belt? Can we eat it? I look down. Sure enough, Vectel's got his kills strapped to his waist. They look like gigantic naked rats or rabbits with no hair or ears. That's right. He was checking traps this morning. I'm sure he'll share, I say, and gesture at his belt. Can I have that, Vectel? When I reach to his belt, he grips my hand and gives me an incredulous look, then rattles off a string of syllables. He just asked if you want to mate he he just asked if you want to mate here, Kira says, voice full of disbelief. Oh shit, Liz says. That's what held her up. Alien nookie. My face feels flaming hot, and I jerk my hands back. They're all staring at me. Megan looks amused, while Tiffany looks a little terrified. Um I can explain, I begin. I wouldn't, Liz says. Just let us imagine for a bit, and feed us. I don't care if you fucked an entire stadium of aliens if you give me something hot to eat. He's not keen on the hot part, I say, then turn to Vectal and point at the rabbit things hanging from his belt. Food? For the humans. Humans, he agrees, unhooking the meat from his belt. As I take it, he offers me his knife. We need fire, I tell him, and mime the hand-warming gesture. Fire. Oh, shit. I'll even blow him if he can give us fire. <laughs> right, says Liz in agreement. I feel a flare of annoyance at the girls. They're cold. There's no reason I should be jealous of them. I've been frolicking in the snow with my big sexy alien for the last two days while they've been freezing their butts off and starving. But the thought of them touching him makes me unhappy. Jealous. Crap. I can't be falling for the big blue alien, no matter how good he is in bed. Fire? Bechtel asks. He looks around the cargo bay and frowns, then points at the ceiling and spits another stream of syllables. He said that there's no wood this high up in the mountain. We'll have to go get some from the cave and come back. I nod at Kira. Then at Vectel. Please do that. His rigid brows draw down, and then he points at Kira and says something else. He wants to know if I understand him, Kira whispers. She edges closer to the others. What should I say? I reach up and brush a hand on Vectel's hard jaw, turning his frowning face toward me. It's impossible to tell what he's thinking right now. Vectel? When his attention turns, word, turns toward me, I gesture at my ear, then move to Kira and pull her forward. You speak, and she hears it, understands it. I added a lot of pantomiming in words and lips moving in the word, hopes that he'll grasp it. His face lights up, blue eyes glowing, another string of words, and he gestures at Kira's ear. Kira's face wrinkles. He says I have a shell that is allowing me to understand him. I wonder if the translation isn't all that clear. It's, it's, it's something like that, I say, nodding at Vectal. He turns to Kira and says something else. He wants to know if my parasite teaches me his language. But she shakes her head. Just translates. She taps her ear, and then her mouth. Here. No speak. Bechtel scrutinizes Kira for a long moment and then says something else. Then he turns and grabs me by the waist and tugs me against him, pressing a hard kiss to my mouth in front of everybody. He said he's going hunting and to get firewood and for us to keep an eye on his mate, Kira relays. Amusement in her voice. Mate? Huh? This time it's my turn to be shocked. Mate? What? He thinks we're mated? But Bechtel's already climbing up the side of the hole and back up into the snow. Vectal. There are five other humans in addition to the dead one in the snow. All female. My mind cannot comprehend this. All female. I think of my own tribe. With over 20 unmated males, there are only five adult females in our tribe. There have never been that many. Malik was only age mate, was the, my only age mate that was not mated, and we were lovers for a time until she resonated for Kashram. Now they have tiny Kit Eksha Isha, bringing the count of females in our tribe up to six. Most of our warriors only dream of the resonance of a mate. And I have found one. And there are five more who could only resonate for one of my tribe. Five more who could bring our small, dying people back to life. We are long-lived, thanks to our Kui, but it is a long, lonely life. And I have spent much of mine envious of others with their mates. Now, there's Georgie. 
and Georgie brings hope with her. I don't know how she and her tribe have come here, or why they are so poorly equipped to survive. We cannot communicate well enough. In time, I will have answers. For now, I must hunt and feed my small, fragile humans. I worry they are too weak to make it back to the tribal caves. None of them have cooey. Before long, they will sicken and die. It's too early to see weakness in my Georgie, but I've been feeding her and keeping her warm. The others lack the spark in her eyes. They look tired. They look frail. One has a rattle in her lungs that speaks of sickness. I think of the dead one in the snow frozen. That will not become my Georgie. I travel as quickly as possible through the ever-deepening snow. I clean out first the cave we slept in early this morning. Then I will travel further down the mountain and remove the contents of yet another. With luck, I might find something to hunt. I only have one water skin and many human mouths, though. The human needs everything. They are not equipped to survive. Not in the slightest. <clears throat> Thinking about this makes me run through the snow even faster. Ra Rahosh is out on his hunting treks, and his territory is near mine. I could head south, enlist its help, and together we could feed the sick humans. Humans. I forgot my water was that filled. But it might take days to find him, and I will not leave my Georgie for that long. Not when she can, cannot fend for herself. Not when she could already be carrying our kit. Not when there are metlicks in the area, and Georgie's tribe has no weapon but snow. I have no idea why or how how they are here, but my protective instinct surges the thought of my Georgie facing off with more of the rapid, unpredictable metlicks. I must teach her how to defend herself. One small step before the next, I remind myself. First, food and shelter for the humans. By the time I finish gathering the supplies, both suns are disappearing into the horizon. The larger of the two moons is out, covering the sky. Snow has begun to fall again, and I return to the strange black cave that Georgie's women are huddled in. The cave's contents are strapped to my back. Their weight heavy, in addition to the firewood and furs. I've also hunted also hunted a small devisti that will feed all the hungry mouths, mouths for at least a few days if they freeze the meat properly. I'm exhausted from spending the day running, and I'm tired as I drop into the cave from above. Frightened screams ring out as I do. Calm down, I hear Georgie tell the others. Svechtel! I drop my burdens to the hard, cold floor and stretch. My back pops, muscles aching. Fuck, how tall is he? Thank you, seven feet, Georgie says, and I hear a hint of pride in her voice. She approaches me, and I see concern on her face as she looks at me. You were gone a long time. I am well, sweet residence, I tell her. I caress her cheek. Did you eat something? You are as small and weak as your fellow humans. I look at the other five fingers. They have taken all her furs and huddle against the walls together. They smell terrible, but they are also trapped inside this cave, so I don't blame them. He's asking if you wait. The, uh, the one with the shell. Ah. He's asking if you wait. The one with the shell in her ears says. Says you're weak. Says you're weak. Georgie makes a funny face, wrinkling her tiny smooth nose. It's frozen. She looks at me, fr hopefully, and asks my language. Fire? I nod and pull her close to my body. I'll make fire for her in a moment. For now, I feel the aching need to be next to her. My cooey rumbles and begins to resonate in my chest at her presence. The anxiety I felt at leaving her disappears at the sweet press of her cheek to my chest. One of the others makes smacking noises with their mouth <coughs> at the sight, and Georgie's pale cheeks turn pink. Fuck you, she says, but laugh. I like him. I breathe in my mate's scent for a moment longer, then release my Georgie and move to the supplies I've brought. I create a small pyramid of wood and dung chips, and I add a bit of the fluff that keeps my boots warm to use as tender. The women all watch quietly as I begin to make a fire. When a spark lights on the tinder, though, I blow on it to increase the flames. I sit up and see I have six weird, smooth faces peering at me with happiness. <laughs> Fuck, I like him too says one. They huddled near it for warmth as I put one of my kills on a spit roast. I don't understand their need to burn the flavor out of their meat, but Georgie has taught me she won't eat it any other way, so burn it I must. At my other side, one with a long mane of pale yellow hair begins to cough again. Deep, racking coughs that shake her small body. Georgie grimaces and looks at me. Medicine? I don't know what she's asking, but I shake my head. Nothing I have can help her. It is the cooey sickness. Georgie. What's that word mean? Oh, what's that word mean? I ask Kira. Quee. I don't know. 
She says with a shrug of her fur-covered shoulders. The others are bundled up to their necks and furs, only their heads peeping out from the wo woolly coverings. I'm a little chilly now that I'm not with a bundle bundled, but I don't really complain. How can I? This is the first time they've been warm in days. I'm thrilled I can do at least this much for them. Or rather, that Vectal can. I am mostly just standing around and look proud that I brought him. The girls have been giving me shit for hours. I don't mind because I do deserve it. After being taken captive by aliens, I show up with the new one who's calling him me his mate, who kisses me and drags me against his chest every once in a while and every chance he gets? Yeah, well, who the f- uh, Who fucked the hell out of me for hours last night until I nearly passed out from orgasms? Yeah, I totally deserve all the shit that I'm getting here. I'm just so freaking happy at the moment. Vectel's getting us fire and food, and all the girls are alive. I fussed over them for the last few hours, making sure they're warm and retrieving snow to melt in one of the makeshift basins so they can wash it a little bit. They're weak with starvation, and Tiffany's toes and fingers look like they've got frostbite. J Josie's listless and weak, and Megan has a deep, racking cough that shakes her entire body. But they're alive. We can fix everything else. Food will go a long way toward making them feel better, in addition to the hairless rat things, which have a thick layer of blubber that Vectal insists we eat, and no one is brave enough to try yet. We have something that looks like a cross between a boar and a pony that he calls a Davisti. The meat's roasting on the fire, and even my mouth is watering, so I can't imagine how hungry they are. What's cooey sickness? Megan asks, a worried look on her face as she crouches nearer to the fire. I don't know, Megan asks, a worried look on her face, as she crouches nearer to the fire. Well, I don't know, I say with a small shake of my head. When I ask Vectal, all he does is press a hand to his chest, and then to mine. The Kui lives here, Kira translates with a shrug. No clue. You just need some food and a warm place to stay, I tell Megan, trying to soothe the worry from her face. We'll deal with one thing at a time. She nods. I'm afraid she's going to question more, but Vectal pulls one of the legs off of the hairless rat, and it looks just like a drumstick. He automatically hands it to me. Oh gosh, I say, embarrassed. Don't feed me, Vectal. I'll eat last. I immediately hand it to Megan. She scarfs it down before someone can take it from her, and Liv give Liz gives me a gleeful look and makes more kissy faces. He's feeding his mate, Georgie. Give the guy- He's feeding his mate, Georgie. Give the guy a break. His, his, my cheeks my cheeks heat up again. I feel like I've spent all afternoon blushing. He pulls another leg off and raises a brow at me. I shake my head, and he offers it to Kira instead, who takes it gratefully. One by one, he offers it. Uh, one by one, the women are fed. I only take small bites of the Devisti as, as it cooks, leaving the majority for the others. This displeases Vectal, who insists on feeding me more. I give the others an unhappy look every time he shoves another cooked piece into my hands. Well, don't piss him off, Tiffany says, licking her dirty fingers to get the last of the grease. If it makes him happy to feed you, eat! So I eat. Once everyone is filled, Vectal crouches next to me and pulls me against his chest again, and the others talk quietly. We discuss our kidnappers who haven't returned, the planet, which seems to be getting snowier every day, and our situation, which is grim. That casts a pall over the conversation, and everyone gets quiet. Liz switches places with Megan, who's helping herself to more food. She sits next to me, cross-legged, her furs draped over her in thin form, and she studies me as Vectal runs his fingers through my tangled hair. So, you and the big guy, huh? Can't leave you two alone for two seconds without you getting hitched to the nearest alien. I shrug uncomfortably. Seemed like it would help the survival odds. Even as I say it, it feels wrong to make my relationship with Vectal sound like it's just survival. There is attraction, too. But I feel like I'm betraying my fellow captives if I admit it. Liz nods and stares at Vectal's horns for a bit. Then she looks at me again. It's kind of possessive of you. Liz, uh, yeah, he is. And I don't hate it. Kind of like it, actually. How's he going to act when he finds out we don't want to stay on not Hoth? I don't respond. It's not really something that I've thought about yet. I'm still just kind of adjusting to the fact that Vectal thinks I'm his mate. I don't want to think about how he's going to act if I get on the first bus ride home, or the depressing idea that there might not be a ride home. Liz is still looking at me, waiting for a response. I shrug and say, Being with him makes me happier than the other guys. I'll take my chances with him. <laughs> Fair enough. She gazes at the fire. You haven't asked about Dominique? I swallow the hard knot in my throat. I've been desperately avoiding the topic. Not sure how the others would ask if pressed. Like Vectal said earlier, they seem fragile. I 
I saw her dead body out in the snow. Liz nods. She moves in a bit closer. So the first night we were here, we heard some creatures. They hooted like owls and stuff, but they looked like skinny teddy bears or something. I've seen her, I tell her. They're pretty nasty. Vectel's not a fan. Yeah, I'm not either, she says with a grimace. They weren't smart enough to figure out how to get in, but they still scared the shit out of us. Kept us up all night. Dom cried the entire time. I'm sorry. She bats my arm. I'm not telling you to make you sorry. Just telling you what happened. Anyhow, we decided we need a defense of some kind, so me and Tiff and Dominique went up top and made snowballs the next day. Tiff and I turned our backs for one minute, and Dom just ran off into the snow like a crazy girl. We tried to follow her, but we're all kind of broken. It's too cold to be out there for long. She shrugs. Tiffany went looking for her and had to come back. I think her feet had frostbite. I nod. So we never saw her again. We kind of hoped she'd found you. I guess not, huh? I shake my head. She was dead when I found her. Long dead. I can't even be sad, Liz says, Liz says with a sigh. She hugs her good leg closer to her body. She didn't want to be alive. Not after what they did to her. She looks at me, eyes big in her too thin face. Have to get out of here, Georgie. Can't be here when they come back to pick us up. I know, I tell her quietly. I haven't figured it out yet. But I'm gonna get us out of here. Just need a plan. Vectal. The others watch Georgie and me closely all night. Every time I touch her hair or caress her cheek, their eyes regard us uneasily. Is it because I'm showing her affection in front of them? My people are not shy about such things. Georgie doesn't seem to mind my touches, and her nearness keeps my cooey humming pleasantly. When the human women began to yawn, they file off the bed with Georgie's blankets, a fact that makes me angry. They're cold, but she's my mate, as small and fragile as the rest of them. When I suggest she take one for herself, she shakes her head. I make sure my complaints are heard by my by the solemn-faced one with the shell in her ear who can understand my words. A moment later, she hands her furs to Georgie, and when my sweet mate protests, the girl insists and goes to curl up with another girl. They will be warm enough. The strange cave is closed off from the bitter winds, and despite the smell, it's warm enough inside that they will not freeze. Between the fire and body heat, the, te the temperature inside is pleasant. There is no watch, though. Either the women are too trusting that they will be safe or so sick and exhausted that they cannot stay awake. I suspect it is the latter. I will be their watch then. But first I will spend time with my mate. My cooey demands it. Georgie yawns and wraps the blanket around her. Moving to curl up next to the other woman, I bank the fire with a large log so it will provide warmth for many hours. And then I move to her side and pick her up, carrying her to the far end of the cave with me, where we will have some privacy. One of the girls laughs and calls something out. Get some girlfriend! Get some, girlfriend, says one. Another calls, keep down over there. We're, keep down over there. We're trying to sleep. Georgie just buries, buries her face against my chest. I take her as far from the others as I can get. Here, they will not be able to see much beyond the firelight. I put Georgie on the side closest to the wall, and my body blocks her in. I cover us both with the fur and pull my mate against me. My cooey sings and hums. It wants more of our bodies joining, and I'm eager to do so. She tucks her smaller body against me, her cold hands moving under my clothing to press against my bare skin. So warm, she murmurs. So nice. My cooey rumbles in my chest and she rubs against me. Her eyes are closed and I'm not sure if she realizes just how much she's tempting me. I rise in response to her sleepy touches, but she's not giving me much more and I need to make her aware of what I require then. So I caress her neck and tilt her head back and then I press my mouth to hers and claim her tongue with mine. Georgie gives a soft moan sigh and licks me back. I enjoy the human custom of mouth joining and caressing my mate with my tongue. It's not something I've considered before, but now that I've done it with Georgie, it seems so obvious. I like the taste. Why not? My hand pushes between her, but she but she is wearing her strange leathers. I find the waistband of the leggings and I push my hand in, seeking the warmth below. She moans against me, and her hand presses to my arm. Vectal! I love it when she says my name. I growl my pleasure. Rar, and my cooey hums in response. I push my fingers within her, seeking that strange third nipply thing that I encountered before. I find it, and she gasps, and presses her face. <laughs> I think you do <laughs> Oh. I think they're doing it. Whispers a voice on the other side of the room. Don't look, says another. Go back to sleep. I bet he's gonna monster dick. This time, Georgie buries her face against my chest, and I feel her push my hand away. No, 
She murmurs against my chest. No. When my cooey is throbbing, almost painfully in my breast, with its need to have us mate, I'm shocked. Is it because the others are awake and possibly listening? Why does that matter? I have seen and heard other Saku we mate many times. We're not shy people. It seems the humans are not the same, though. Georgie doesn't want me to touch her while the others are paying attention. I growl again, but I move my hand. I remove my hand. She makes a downcast little sound and presses her body close to mine. And that little disappointed sigh is the only reason I don't get up and toss the other humans out of the cave. The next morning... I stoke the pyre fire for the humans, and we begin to make plans. The humans don't want to stay here. It's clear they're nervous and want to leave. I can't have them stay here either, but I'm not equipped to take them back safely. They walk to my home cave. The walk to my home gives is at least a day of hard travel, and these fragile humans won't be able to handle that. After they eat, they look at me with hopeful eyes, as if I will somehow produce clothing and boots for all of the women. I know what they're asking with their sad faces. It grieves me to disappoint my Georgie, but a hunter, a hunter alone must be practical. I cannot take you with me, I tell the one with the magic shell in her ear. Says he can't take us. One begins to sniffle loudly. The loud one, Lees, shares, glares at me as if I am the problem. I point at my shoes. You have no foot coverings, no clothing. With six of you, I cannot possibly hunt enough game and keep you moving. My home caverns are many hours walk away. With Georgie, it will take me two days to get there. I will get my people, and we will come and bring you warm clothes and travel rations. Then, we will take you home with us. You will be safe there. Her eyes draw down, and then she translates. He's got- he's got people? Georgie- Georgie asks, then smacks her forehead. Of course he does! She looks at me. You have people! She points at the others, then at herself. Human people! Vectal people? Ah, do I have a tribe? Yes! There are four eights of us, plus two kits. I am the chief. I, the one translates, and Georgie nods again. Tch, shoulda known. He's boss. Liz snickers. We've got twelve, Georgie says, and counts on her fingers before pointing at the wall behind her. Six in there. She does counting words at each woman, then points at the wall and does more counting words. I shake my hand. I, I don't understand. Georgie throws her hands up. Never mind. Fun surprise for later. Ha! says Liz. They all start to chatter, and one gestures at the wall. I, f I frown at them. I don't understand their fascination with the back wall with its flashing lights, and our one-sided conversation is not really getting us anywhere. I will return to my people with Georgie, and we will get her a cooey. Then I will bring back my hunters, and we will return for all of you. This, I promise. Don't forget these. Don't, <laughs> don't forget these. Liz says and taps a bump on her arm. He won't. Georgie tells her. A determined look comes across my mate's face, and I wonder what they refer to that brings such a grim look to her delicate features. At Georgie's insistence, we leave all the winter furs and two of my blades with the women. We also leave all the food. This makes me happy because my mate will be the one that suffers. This makes me unhappy because my mate will be the one that suffers, but she promises with soft pats and smiling eyes that she is fine. I think it pleases her to be able to provide for her humans, so I don't complain. There are other hunter caves along the path, and I will raid all of them to clothe my Georgie, if I must. They can be replenished in the spring, when the thickest snow melts and the hunters have easier days. We wave goodbye to the woman, and Georgia E. wipes her tear eyes frequently. I know she worries about them. Despite the food, they all seem a little more tired this morning, a little more pale. It is the lack of the cooey, which is why it's so important that I bring Georgie back to my own people. And soon, I cannot bring down a succots by myself. It is a task that requires many hunters with strong spears. I carry Georgie's smaller form on my back, and I take different I take different route down the mountain. This time, I do the land. I do not go to the winding game trails, but head straight across the land as the winged birds fly. This way, instead of many hunter caves along the path home, there was only one, the Elder's Cave, with its strange smooth walls not unlike Georgie's cave. My mate seems to understand my sense of urgency. We stop only for brief rests to refill a water skin or so we can relieve ourselves. When the two suns are high in the sky, I find a quilled beast, and Georgie does not protest when I offer her raw tidbits. It will take too much time to collect wood for fire. We eat, and then we are on our way for more. The day is an endless cycle of running and hiking, and even Georgie's slight weight grows heavier over the hours. I do not put her down, though. My, my, my strength is far too more suited for travel than her hers. She's exhausted too. 
Her grip on the clothing becomes less strong over the hours, and I worry we're not making good time when a familiar, snow-covered rectangular hill appears over in the distance. I give a sigh of relief and point it out to Georgie. Looks weird, she says with a yawn. We going over there? That is our one stop today, I tell her. We will rest and sleep, and tomorrow we will return to my people. Mentally, I make a note of the hunters who can help me shepherd the sick humans back. Malik will, will want to come as tribal healer, but she has a small child. Her mate, Kashram, then. Rahosh, if he has returned from his own hunts. Rokan, Saluk, Zenik, Hayden, Dagesh. All of them are unmated hunters, except for Kashram. It might be smarter to take the mated ones, so there are no fights over the small females, but I do not want to build resentment among amongst my tribe. I know the men will be eager to see the female humans, especially after I return with my lovely Georgie. I rub her arm thoughtfully. I would not deny my men the chance to see if their cooey resonates with the humans, not when I felt the pleasure of my own spring to life. We make it inside the cave, and Georgie exclaims at the oddness of the walls. I don't blame her for being surprised. They're covered with a thin sheet of ice, but there's no denying there's a uniformity to the walls that is unnerving. It looks as if a gigantic hand has scooped the side of the hill out and smoothed the sides down, but there are furs and wood and a stressed hide to block the door. I set Georgie down and prepare the cave. To my surprise, she immediately begins to make a firewood pyramid with supplies while I, while I hang the door over covering. She gives me a shy smile. Want to learn? My heart swells with pride. I move to her side and ignore the fire, cupping her small face instead. She's lovely, flat nose and all, and I'm obsessed with touching her. She smiles up to me, and my cooey begins a steady thrumming in my chest. The fire can wait. My cooey and my body have been aching with need for her since this morning, any longer, and I feel as if I will be in physical pain. I tug at the collar of her leathers. <laughs> Georgie chuckles. The sound's sweet. She presses a small, cold hand against my chest, right where my cooey vibrates under my skin. Love it when you purr, she says softly. Then she looks up at me with those strange white eyes and tilts her head back for my kiss. I grab her and pull her against mine, mindful of her wounded wrist. I want to touch her everywhere, taste her everywhere. The cooey inside me demands a mating, and it's a call I want to answer. I kiss her like she's been asking, and my lips move over hers before I slide my tongue in for that same French taste as before. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. This kiss, I would like to do it, over and over again with Georgie. I like her smooth tongue. She is just as hungry for my touch. Her fingers tear at her clothing until she exposes her torsed of me. I groan at the sight and drop to my knees to tug one soft piece of it into my mouth. I kind of like it, how similar and yet different they are to those of the women of my people. Her their nipple hardens when I touch it, and it's still like brushing my fingers over a soft leather instead of the armored hard tips of our own women. I wonder how human children are, if their mothers are also soft. I picture my child there and crush her against me. Our child, part Sakui, part human. Hmm. She sighs softly, and I don't know if she's humming or saying another one of her strange human words. I lick her to distract her, and then she moans. I, and she, then she reaches down and grips at me with her hand and strokes between the leather of my leggings. I nearly come undone with the touch. With a hiss, I pull apart the knots to keep my clothing at my waist to free myself. This mating will be quick and not elegant, but... I don't really care. From the sounds Georgie's making and the way that she's squeezing, I doubt she cares either. You are my heart. I tell her as I caress her. I tease one half and then the other, loving the soft noises that she makes. Her skin puckers and then the scent of her own arousal perfumes to the air. My mouth waters at the thought and I kiss her flat belly that will be rounded with our child come next season. But children will come later, and I want Georgie now, and I tug at her leather leggings until the dark curls that lie between reveal themselves. She pulls down her pants the rest of the way, and then kicks them aside, and then she drags her fingers against my own leathers, doing the same for me. In this way, we are now undressing. Georgie gives a small shiver and moves to stand closer to me to share in my warmth. I pull my mate against me, pick her up, and seek out the furs in the cave. As I do, she presses kisses against my face and runs her fingers along my horns, murmuring soft words. Then I lay her down amongst the furs, and she looks utterly beautiful, tempting my strange human. I cover her small body with my larger one, and the legs go up to my waist, feet brushing against my tail, which is now flicking. Her hands caress my horn as if they are a piece of my the, the specific piece of my body that I was talking about before, striking the length of each one of them, and I groan at the sensation. I seek the folds, 
and she is beginning to moisten, her body hungry. I want to taste again, and I want to push myself within. She makes a soft sound and spreads legs wide, welcoming me in, welcoming me in. I drag myself over top, enjoying the cries that she makes in response. Her flavor is heady, aroma intoxicating, and I lose myself. I really like how Vectal is describing the human body as if it is like a fine wine or a beer. Incredible. <laughs> Telltale shivers move through her, and she grips me, my head, and my horns tighter with each stroke. She is close, my Georgie, and I want to be within when it happens. I shift my body, fitting myself well, and then she is grasping me, clinging to me. Her body is tight, and I, it clasps me like, and she's clasping me like a glove. The sensation is absolutely wonderful, and I close my eyes, savoring it. My cooey responds, thrumming inside me. Soon, I will feel her cooey answer mine. It must be soon, or else Georgie will not survive. The thought sends a stab of fear through me, and I press my form to hers, holding her close. No, she's mine, and I must keep her. With a groan, I stroke into her and feel her body give to mine. Georgie gasps. Vectal! Oh yeah! I pull her back and slide within again, and her legs twitch a bit, and I stroke her over and over again, make, making my motions quicken a little bit more. Her cries increase as I continue to speed, and eventually I feel her as she cries out. My own cooey responds, and I continue to finish up the job, spilling within. I hold her close and stroke her hair as my body locks in the process of pleasure. Her hands touch mine, fluttering over my skin, and she pants, small, sweet, unintelligible words. When the last is wrung from the last bit of my excrement is wrung from my body, I press my mouth to hers and then roll to my side, pulling her against me, our bodies still joined. I would like to stay like this for hours, all night even. My exhaustion is gone with the maiden in my arms. Already I'm thinking of how to make her cry out with pleasure yet again. I stroke a hand over her skin and feel her, feel her quiver around me again. Just a few touches, and she'd be crying out for more. I'm intrigued by the thought, and tug her closer, and until her small back is pressed against my chest. As I do, she props up on an elbow. What was that? I touch her arm. Hmm? I wish again that I could speak the language of humans. Georgie pats my hand to get my attention, and then points. So I light blink. Uh, what's that? She indicates the far wall, and sure enough, a star blinks under the ice, and then fades. Ah... This is the Cave of the Elders, the Cave of Stars. It is full of magic. That is what you're seeing. But she pulls free of my grip and crawls out of the blankets. I feel a sense of loss as I slide out. More, I slide out of her warm body. But she's preoccupied, so I sit back up and watch as she climbs to her feet and runs to the far wall. She presses her face against the thick ice, watching the light as it slowly blinks again. Then she looks back at me again. Vectal, she breathes, and there's excitement in her voice. New excitement. Is that a spaceship? And so, we have ended part four of Chili Chili Planet People. How are we all doing? It is always nice to check in in situations like this, and I care for the health of the people who are currently experiencing this with me. This is my first book like this. Very much so. And I'm actually kind of enjoying it. Honestly, I was under the impression that this was a lot worse than it actually is. And although the exposure that y'all are getting is me taking some creative liberties and stuff for my own comfort, this really isn't a bad book, to be honest. Bro, they've got a spaceship. Evidently, the Church of the Elders is- Dude. The Cave of the Elders is a spaceship. That means that this is not the first time that some alien race has crashed out of this planet randomly. That's great. That's so funny. I can't believe that that is just like a canon thing here. So apparently, uh, what we know now is, I guess there's a group of basketball-headed aliens and a, gr a group of green little men that are apparently trafficking human women specifically, or maybe that's just like the planet that they settled upon this time. I'm not really sure. But also, there have also been cases of a, uh, of a spaceship on this planet as well, so this is not the first time that they've seen something like this. I wonder if Vectal ever makes the connection, honestly. It's not bad, to be honest. The creative liberties are nice. Could the Barians not be natives either? Yeah, like, I wonder. I wonder, actually. Maybe they aren't natives. Because, because, like, I, I, I don't know. It's wonder. Oh, yeah, you know what? Because if it's the Cave of the Elders, right? Then it probably means, or maybe, that the Elders 
were the ones who came in this spaceship, maybe. That's kind of cool, actually. I guess we'll kind of see, I guess. I'm going to take a couple more sips of my water over here. I'm actually going to grab myself a quick snack. I got snacks on my desk. Let's see. Today's snack brought to you by, if I can get a grip on things, which I, oh my god, I'm struggling. Oh, oh my god. Nature's Bakery. Blueberry Fig Bars. I'm gonna eat one of these. Ooh. Good stuff, good stuff. Anybody else snacking out there? Oh, oh did I lose my place? Oh, I totally did, but I, I know I was on part five. Or, or part six. Yeah, part five now. Excuse me while I take a break. It was good stuff so far. Absolutely good stuff. Big fan. Honestly, because I remember, when I, as I read through this book, like, the, the scenes that describe the passion, more passionate moments are quite descriptive. But even though they don't last very long. It's only, like, a few pages at max. I wonder if it gets even worse in the end. Ooh, little Abe and Annie had tacos, so I'm still going strong off that. Oh, that's wonderful. And it made, like, um... It was like a pasta and rice and corn and something else dish. I don't exactly remember what it was, but it tastes great. It was very, very well spiced. A lot of Star Wars references. Yeah, dude. Apparently, George is a, a nerd, just like we are. I, for one, not so much of a, um, of a, um, um, what do you call? Not as much as a Star Wars nerd, but still nerds nonetheless. Nerds indeed. Hmm. Excuse me. I kind of like... I really like Nature's Bakery. Their fig bars are really good. I'm not a huge fan of the blueberry ones, but I like the flavor of blueberry. Big fan of that. I'm a big fan. I'm trying to slow down in my life, yeah? I'm trying to not feel so bad about taking little breaks here. This is just what it is. We're just chatting. That's all we're doing. We're just chatting and experiencing a book together. We're ready to go in a moment. As we mentioned before, it's a refractory period, naturally. <laughs> hmm. Little Abe asks whether it's Fig Newtons or the ones I have. So these things are Fig Bars. They're blueberry fig bars. And they're not Fig Newton brands. I love Fig Newtons. But Nature's Bakery also does like a regular fig bar. They're pretty good. I freaking love Fig Newtons. I also like the general brand stuff. I don't know. We didn't... We had that here one time. I should really get more. I'm a sucker for a good Fig Newton. I really am. All right, onwards to the next section of the book. I believe we were on part five. I just need to find it again. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely part five. And then in the midst, in the midst, I am left, I'm leaving little Abe with the desire for Fig Newtons. I really want Fig Newtons now. Now I really want Fig Newtons. This stuff's great. Part five, Georgie. Holy crap. It's a spaceship. I don't know how I didn't see it before. Well, actually, I do. I was so tired after our journey that my brain was a fog. The need to help save the others constantly burning in the back of my mind. Excuse me. Vectel seemed to have a sense of urgency, too. He crossed over valleys and climbed up sheer walls with me clinging to him, more agile than a mountain goat. I held on for dear life. Hmm, excuse me. But it was still exhausting. The cold hadn't let up, and the wind felt as if it had chapped my face into one big cold burn, but I still had it better than the other humans, so I really didn't complain. By the time we finally stopped for the night, I barely glanced at my surroundings. Yes, the cave was perfectly made inside. Yes, it was on the side of a hill that almost so seemed perfectly oval-shaped outside. I'd noted it and stumbled inside, heading for the warm furs that I now knew waited within. It wasn't until after our sex, as I realized and cuddled against my alien, that I saw a light flash. I thought my eyes had deceived me until it did it again. Then I stared at the ice really hard and realized that the cave was perfect because it was the interior of a ship. It's a ship, I tell Vectel. Behind the thick layer of ice, I can barely make out a control panel of some kind. His eyes narrow, and he shakes his head. He doesn't understand. It's Sakui Tok. 
That doesn't sound like spaceship to me. Right. My big blue barbarian probably wouldn't know a spaceship if it bit him on his big ridge covered nose. He wears leather, eats raw meat, and hunts with slings and bone knives. Big guy's probably never even heard of a space heater, much less a spaceship. I pat his chest. You know what? I got this. Don't worry. I take the blade of the knife I carry with me and use it to hack at the thick ice coating the walls. Bechtel stops me with a gentle hand. He points at the firewood pile in the fire pit, still unlit. Oh, the firewood made things much faster. He's right. I reach up and give him a quick, smacking kiss. You clever man. He doesn't know what I'm saying, but he's pleased by the kiss anyway. As I wait for the fire to start, I stare at the walls around us. I'm trying not to freak out. The ice covering the walls is thick. Vectel's familiar with this place, and it's set up like a camp as the other caves, which tells me that this has been here for a very long time. It looks nothing like the cargo hold the other girls are currently camping out in. The odds of it belonging to the same aliens are slim, I tell myself. I still worry, though. That's why I have to see the, the control panel myself. I want to know what it is we found. It's either a frying pan about to go to on going to the fire, or a ticket home. Or neither. I need answers. No matter how tired I am, I won't be able to sleep without answering some of these questions. When the fire is stoked and burning brightly, Bechtel takes up a lit, a lit stick of wood and hands me the safe end. It's like a crappy makeshift torch, and I carry it carefully to the wall and then hold it near the panels, watching the ice glimmer and then melt. It takes a long time to thaw away the layers, layers of ice, but as I do, more and more instrument panels become uncovered. I look over at Vectal, and he seems unnerved by this discovery as well. It looks different than the sleek, bare walls of the alien ship I crashed in. Granted, I didn't see much outside of what I assumed was the cargo hold, but this has an entirely different feel to it. The panel I've noticed is unpraised, uh, upraised with hundreds of buttons, and the blips of light flick regularly. It reminds me of when I've set electronic devices on standby in the past, and I wonder if that just means everything's still functional. Coolio. I wonder if this means we can go home. I steal a look at Vectal. His brutishly handsome features are pulled down into a frown, as if he's not entirely sure what to make of this. He's been wonderful to me. And the sex? Well, it's been mind-blowing. But this planet, place sucks. It's cold and horrible, and I don't know if I want to stay here when there's a ride home. If there's a ride home. I remind myself. If. I return my sputtering torch to the fire and examine the panels again. I see a lot of buttons and one blinking light, but no screens. Am I wrong in hoping this works? I lean forward and examine the now uncovered panel. The blinking light is actually a button with a strange squiggly character on it. So I move forward to press it, then pause. Is it dumb to press a strange button on an even stranger spaceship? Yes. Yes, it is. Do I have many options? I contemplate all the different things this button could be. It could be a distress signal, it could arm a security system, it could be nothing at all. Do I want to chance it? I look at Vectal again. Actually, I don't want to chance it, I realize. I'd be just as happy turning around and going out here without with him. I know I'm safe with him, I might even be able to be happy with him. But the other women don't have the same option as I do. They don't have a big, wonderful alien treating them like gold and catering to their every need. So I suck in a deep breath and punch the flashing button. It clicks. Nothing happens. Well, that's disappointing. Then a slow whine starts, like the hum of something coming online. A smooth, androgynous voice says something in a fluid language that's unlike mine. Lights appear and begin to flash. There's a noise and then a hiss like central air was just turned on. Vectel grabs me and hauls my body behind him, pulling out one of his blades to protect me. I'm chicken enough to hide behind his back for a long moment. Then I pat his arm again and push forward. It's okay, I say. I think stuff is just, uh, booting up. I approach the panel. As I do, the voice speaks again. This time, it raises its voice at the end, almost like a question. It's asking us something. I don't understand you, I say aloud. There's another whirl whirling, churring sound. A picture of Earth appears in midair, three-dimensional. Query. Or query, the voice says. Language. Earth. English. Actually, I don't like that voice for that one. Let's see. A picture of Earth appears in midair, three-dimensional. Query, the voice says. Language. Earth. English. Is this correct? I gasp. Yes! Yes, that's correct! You know English? The ship's artificial intelligence is programmed with over 20,000 common languages. Do you wish to change language selections? If so, say, nope! I say quickly, stay on English. I point at the picture of Earth, spinning in midair. That's my planet! Settings accepted. Please wait for system to come fully online before requesting a query. I... Uh, Alright. 
I look at Vector with wide eyes. He seems equally as astonished as me. He puts an arm around my shoulder and pulls me close, prepared for a just-in-case sort of scenario. It's strangely comforting. Uh, the computer hums for a moment longer, and then I feel a gust of warm air brush my face. Environmental controls online. Ideal habitat temperature for humans is 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Ideal habitat temperature for modified suck is 3 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Which shall I program? Modified suck? I ask. The male at your side is a suck life form, modified for habitation on this planet. Oh! Is he not from this planet? Is Vectal a stranger here too? Sok originate from a planet that they call Kes, or home in their language. It is approximately 3.2 million parsecs from your planet Earth. This planet is 5.8 million parsecs from your planet Earth. That sounds... far. I feel faint. I have so many questions. I don't know what to ask first. I... uh... what is this place? This planet has many names depending on the language. Your species has not discovered this solar system yet. Our current location is the second planet in the binary sun system. This particular world completes an orbit around the suns every 372.5 days and rotates on its axis every 27.2 hours. The current temperature is cold. Yeah, I know. I wave a hand because none of this information is helping me out any. So if he's not from here, I say pointing at Vectal, then how did he get here? This vessel was originally a sock pleasure cruiser. The ship continues in a melodious voice. Due to a solar storm, the crew was forced to shelter at the nearest habitable planet, which you are currently on. They experienced technical difficulties. Technical difficulties? That sounds absurd. Really? The ship is keyed to a specific pilot. The pilot experienced congestive heart failure, and a secondary was unable to pilot the ship. Unavailable to pilot the ship. A distress signal was launched, but malfunctioned. No further signals were sent. So, Vectal's people are stranded here too. When was this? I ask, feeling a little faint at this new tidbit of information. This event occurred 287 years ago. Please note that when this system references years, it is calculated based upon the orbit of this planet versus the planet Earth. And the years are longer here. Jesus! I look at Vectal with wide eyes. He's looking at me curiously. Impatience stamped on his features. I know he has questions, and my conversation with the computer is probably just giving him more of them, but I still have more questions, so I'm selfish for a little longer. How many people crashed here? Logbooks record, log books record 62 passengers and one pilot. Many also died at, before accepting the symbiont. That catches my attention. Symbiont? The definition for symbiont is an organism that lives in symbiosis with another organism. I'm starting to get creeped out. Wait, Vectal has an organism in him? This planet has an element in its atmosphere that is toxic to humankind and also to Sak. It is a gas element similar to nitrogen that has not yet been discovered by humans as it doesn't exist in any form on your Earth. Your body is not equipped to filter it out in air. Once you reach toxic levels of the element, your body will slowly shut down. The Sak at your side exists in mutualistic symbiosis with a creature they refer to as Kui. Kui, Vectel says. Suddenly speaking up, he asks the computer a question and it immediately answers him. Then he nods and looks at me. I told him I am explaining to you how the Kui functions in the atmosphere. The computer tells me. I rub my forehead. I'm not understanding this. So, you have to have this Kui thing inside you or you die? The Kui enhances the body of its host and makes subtle changes in order to allow for it to thrive in an otherwise hostile environment. Those who originally found themselves stranded on this planet lasted eight days without the symbiotic relationship. Eight days? All I have is eight freaking days? M modifies it? I ask weakly. I feel sick. I either get a parasite or, or I die? The Kui modifies its host. Genetically modified Kui symbionts are altered to perform at lower temperatures and to filter the chemicals from the air that the body cannot process. It improves the host's recovery from wounds and sickness, and it ensures procreation of viable offspring. Oh god! So I get a cold-resistant tapeworm... Or I get to die? What if I get this cooey thing for now, and when I leave, have it removed? Like, can I, can I do that? 
Once implanted, the Kui and host are dependent upon each other. The Kui cannot exist outside of its host for longer than a few minutes, and the host will need a replacement Kui in order to survive. And here I thought a staying on not hot with my sexy barbarian was the better option than wanting for, waiting for the little green men to come back. If I choose to stay here, I can't ever leave again. It'll just be me and my parasite. Forever. No silly. Not parasite. Symbiosis. Ugh. But if I don't get the parasite, I only have days left to live. Not even a week now. The green men must know that we humans can't survive on this planet for long. That means that either they aren't intending to pick us up again, or they're going to be returning very, very shortly. <sighs> I suck in a breath at that. The odds are not looking good. I have to get the others out of here. And fast. I want to ask the computer more questions, but the welfare of the others takes priority. One step at a time. We have to rescue the other women, and then we'll figure out the Kui thing. I return to Vectal. Oh, we need to talk. He touches my face, glowing blue eyes tender. Sock, Mavolo. Shit, you're not understanding me. I turn to the computer. Can you translate for me? That is one of the functions of this unit. It says in an amicable tone. Amicable tone. Would you like to learn the Sock dialect he is speaking? You can teach me? I can perform a one-time linguistic upload. Would you like to do this? God, yes! I want to be able to hold a real, honest-to-goodness conversation with Bechtel. Please? A small red circle appears in midair. Please step closer to the marked location. When I do, it gives me additional instructions. I will perform a retinal scan. When I do, please do not blink or attempt to move. This can interfere with the transfer of information. It will be connected in three, two, one. An aloham starts. I freeze in place, trying not to blink as a red laser shines into my eyes. You may experience some discomfort as your brain processes the information. The computer tells me, just before a rush of symbols crashes through my brain, and my head feels like it'll literally explode. Vectal. My mate collapses, and my cooey slams hard against my chest in protest. I grab her before she can sink to the ground. Georgie! Please allow, please allow several minutes for discovery. A strange voice coming from the wall intones. I snarl at it, at the air. I don't know where this faceless voice is coming from, but if it's heart in my Georgie, I will tear this place down with its strange-looking rocks and scatter the pieces to the icy seas. I cradle my mate against my chest, unable to breathe out of fear. I place a hand over her heart, where she has no protective plating. She's too soft and vulnerable. My poor human. But it thumps steadily in her breast, and I exhale in relief. I press my lips to her strange, smooth forehead and hold her against me as the room becomes uncomfortably warm. The disembodied voice speaks again. Stand by. Please indicate if you have questions for this unit. Otherwise, I will return to hibernation mode. I hold Georgie against me, stroking her hair, her face, her cool skin that cannot retain enough warmth for her to be comfortable. I ignore the strange voice, even though it's now speaking my language. When Georgie jabbered at it in her tongue, it sent a red beam through her head and knocked her unconscious. I do not want it to do the same to me, so I narrow my eyes at the flashing lights and wait. Georgie's sleeping face turns to my chest, and she nuzzles me. Hmm. Georgie? I ask, touching her cheek. Are, are you well? Her eyes blink open. And the pale, ugly white with a and the, and the pale, ugly white with a white blue circle in the middle is the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. Oh, I hear you," she says in my language. "Your words, there." She thinks for a moment, and then a smile breaks across her face. Wondrous! How did you learn my language? I ask her, shocked. She tilts her head, her nose scrunching adorably for a moment. It's as if she's considering something. Then she smiles again. The words, are, the words are a bit different than the ones in my head. Maybe it's the dialect. The dialect. Oh no! Wait, words are a bit different than. As if she's considering something. The words are a bit different than the ones in my head. Maybe it's the dialect that the computer has. Oh, oh, that's that's her speaking. The words are a bit different than the ones in my head. Maybe it's the dialect that the computer has. Some of her words aren't mine. They make no sense. Computer? I ask. Georgie gestures at the air. The voice. The ship. It taught me. Magic? I ask dubiously. The only magic I know of is cooey magic, and it does not teach languages. She giggles. The sound's bright and glorious. Then her eyes grow a bit dull again, and she rubs her forehead. Not magic, she says. Learning. I probably do not explain it right. Her eyes close again, and she curls against my chest. My head hurts. Will you hold me for a little bit longer? 
always. I tell her and cradle her close. My cooey throbs in my chest, and for the moment I am content, full of questions and wonder, but content. Eat, I urge my mate, offering her my rations. Georgie makes a gagging noise and shakes her head. That stuff burns my tongue. Even now, it's making my eyes water. I peer at her small face, and she's right. Her pale eyes are weeping and glossy. Curious, I sniff the travel rations. They have a slightly spicy taste to them, but it's meant to be pleasant, not choking. Humans have weak tongues. Gah! She gives me an exasperated look. We do not! Weak tongues, weak eyes, weak bodies. I murmur, enjoying the look of irritation on Georgie's face. It's such a pleasure to be able to speak to her. Really, speak to her, and to tease her. Weak in many, many places, but a very delicious set of ridges between. Her face goes red, bright red, and she bats my arm with her good hand. A hint of a smile curves her mouth. You are always thinking about sex, aren't you? It is difficult not when my mate is so soft and beautiful. I brush a finger down the curve of her cheek. She looks sober at my words. Vectal, I'm not your mate. Yes, you are. My cooey has chosen you. When you receive a cooey, it will thrum for mine. Wait and see. She shakes her head. Humans choose their mates. I haven't chosen anyone. Not that you aren't nice, she tells me, giving me another soothing pat of the arm. And not that I don't care about you. It's just that mating should be a mutual decision. A mutual decision? Is she mad? Are humans mad? It's not a decision. The cooey chooses. It's always knows. But I don't have a cooey. We will remedy this soon enough. I tell her. Once we return to my tribe, we will organize a hunt to take down one of the great Sakots. They carry many Kui in them. We shall provide enough for you and your tribeswomen. Vectal, she says, her face unhappy. You're not listening to me. I... I don't even know what I want. That, that I want a Kui. My heart turns to ice at her words. You must! It is a death sentence! Only if I stay, she says softly. I'm not sure if there's a chance I can go home. Georgie drops her gaze and looks away. Just haven't decided yet. All right? And where is your home, if it's not here? My heart starts to pound a slow, unhappy beat. Georgie talks of leaving me as if she does not feel as I do, as if her heart is not torn apart at the very thought of being separated. My cooey brought us together, but I am proud to have her as my mate. I want no other. Not now. Not ever. It is unthinkable. She lifts a hand, points at the cave ceiling. In the sky... A really, really long way from here. My eyes narrow at her. I do not understand. Uh, like in this ship. She continues. Your ancestors came here in this thing from another place. It's the cave my ancestors came from. I agree slowly. But it does not fly. I imagine a, a flying cave moving through the skies like a bird. The thought is ludicrous. Georgie makes a frustrated sound. It's a ship. Do you know what a ship is? When I remain blank, she drums her fingers on her lip, thinking, It's a uh, craft that floats through the stars, Vectal. You know, I'm not from here, right? I don't have a cooey, so I can't be. I nod because I know this to be true. But the thought of her coming from the stars is strange and bizarre, unfathomable. But there are things I cannot answer. Her strange language, her clothing, her lack of cooey. You wish to go... Back to the stars? Her expression softens into something sad. Her pale eyes gleam for a moment, wet with unshed tears. I don't know. I think I hate not having a choice more than anything. So it's not me that she hates. My cooey begins to thrum in my breast again. I press a hand to it. Then I will go with you. Her tears vanish, and she gives a soft chuckle. Then she moves close and squeezes my arm with her good one. She lays her cheek on it and sighs. I wish that you could. I wish that you could. I trace my fingers down her soft cheek. Does she not realize? Anywhere she goes, I will gladly follow. She has my heart, my resonance, my soul, my mate. It grieves me. She is so miserable here with me. If I wanted, even if I wanted to stay, she says softly, I can't make that decision for the others. If there's a chance we can go home, I have to let them decide that for themselves. My mate is noble. I grunt my understanding, though the animal side of me wants to drag her back to the hunting cave and keep her there, naked and pink, until it is out of the question. But then my Georgie might die, because she has no cooey, and the other girls will certainly die with no rescue, and all of my tribesmen will have no mates. 
Dugesh and Rahosh and Sahidin, and so many others will never know this pleasure. Like Georgie, I cannot be cruel. We must go and rescue your friends, I tell her. If we travel swiftly, we will make it to my tribal caves tonight. We can collect the best hunters and return after them in the morning. Well, let's do it then, she says, determination stealing her voice. Every moment that passes is another moment I feel guilty. Guilty? I ask her, cupping her small face up so that she can, she can look me in the eyes. Why guilty? Why does my mate carry such burdens? Her cheeks pink again. Because I'm here with you, and I'm warm and happy and fed, and they're not. Ah. My thumb strokes over her full mouth. <laughs> and because my cock makes you cry out with such pleasure? The pink deepens, and she tucks, ducks her head. Oh, jeez, she says in her language. Then in mine. Uh, let us keep such talk between us. I am amused. Is my mate shy? Is this what the pink of her cheeks means? A Sakui woman gets a flush at the base of her horns when she's embarrassed, but Georgie has no horns. It is, but talk between mates, my resonance. She tilts her head. Resonance? What is that? I take her small hand, her good one, and press it over my chest. My Kui responds, thrumming a content beat inside my chest. It is this. Only you call to it. Only you make my cooey hum in my breast with happiness. It is a sign that one's mate has been found. Her lips part, and she looks up at me, startled. I thought you were purring. P purring? I'm not familiar with this word. Like a cat. Cat? A snow cat. I think of the ugly creatures with whiskers and tufts of fur all over. I don't recall them ever purring. They are tasty eating, though. Georgie giggles. You know what? Never mind. Er, you know what? Never mind. We should get going. She gets to her feet and straightens her clothing. We have eaten and all is ready to go, except I find myself strangely reluctant to continue on. If I do, I'm acknowledging that I might not get to keep my Georgie. The thought staggers me with misery. I press my face to her stomach and hold her against me, seeking a measure of peace. To think that I might lose my sweet residence so soon after finding her, I just cannot bear it. Oh, Vector, she says softly. Her hands stroke over my horns, a tender caress. I wish it was just me that I had to think for. Then this would be easier. It is easy, I tell her, pressing my face to her leather-covered body. Even through her coverings, I can smell her wonderful scent. I long to taste her again. Except the cooey. Except me! She's silent. But her hands continue to touch me and smooth over my skin and horns stroke over my horns. In what feels like a loving embrace. She must care something for me. She must! But she only says, something has to be done. She says softly, Something has to be my choice. So many things have been taken from me. I need to claim something for myself. For now, grant me that. I look up at her, at her face sad. You know I can refuse you nothing. Her smile is sweet, sad. I know. Yo, what's up, Mr. Paul Tracy? I got my U-Haul stuck in the driveway. <sighs> Hopefully, is it icy up there? I certainly hope not. Did you get it unstuck? One time I got mud stuck out of the, I got my car stuck out of the mud, specifically by using uh, roof shingles that uh, almost took my father's kneecap off. Hilarious. Georgie. I ponder my choices all day as Vod uh, Vectel plods relentlessly through snowdrift after snowdrift, carrying me on his back. Even though I'm doing my best to deny it, it's entirely possible that we're never going to be able to get home. If Vectel's ancestors were stranded here, then we probably can't get home, no matter how hard that we try. Duh. Our other option is to wait for the little green men to come back and try to hijack their ship and force them to take us home. Or we can leave the ice planet when they return, taking our chances as cattle. Or we can get the parasite, <clears throat> excuse me, symbiont, and make the best of things here with Vectel and his people. I feel like if I were making an individual choice, I would probably, it would probably be an easy one. Though the thought of leaving Earth and friends and family behind hurts me, a life with Vectel could be sweet and full of pleasure. I'm already starting to look forward to the sight of his smiles, the feel of his skin against my own. I love that rumble of a laugh. I love knowing what he's, I love knowing what he's saying now. If it were just me, I'd definitely be Team Vectel, but I feel like the humans have to make a decision together. I don't want to influence the others. I lucked out and got Vectel, but if we stay here... I, we might be condemning ourselves to a life of hardship and snow, and who's to say that the others in Vectel's tribes, the, the Sakui, as he calls them, will treat everyone as wonderfully as he treats he is me. 
And who's to say that the little green men who wouldn't sell us to somebody on a nice Tahiti-like planet full of sexy men who want nothing more than company while drinking Mai Tai cocktails, no one can say for sure. The odds are likely against that, but it's another reason not to influence the others. Whatever we decide, we'll decide as a group. We'll be making decisions not just for the six of us remaining, but the six still tucked away in the wall, slumbering. Before anyone decides anything, we need to talk it out. If they want to stay, we'll figure out stuff together. If they want to fight the aliens for control of the returning ship, we'll need weapons and a plan. My bad wrist aches and throbs, reminding me that, reminding me that we're all battered and wounded from the crash. Taking over anything seems like a horrible idea. Maybe that's just me being negative. I shake the thought away. I'm with my girls. If Liz, Megan, Tiffany, Kira, and Josie want to fight for our freedom, then the least I can do is join the cause. Staying back and rolling in the furs with my big sexy alien boy seems disloyal after everything we've been through together. There, Bechtel says, rousing me out of my dark thoughts. Home is just ahead. My arms tighten around his neck, and I peer through the drifting snowfall. There's nothing ahead but another rocky cliff, this one barely peeking out of a deep thicket of the eyelash-like pink trees. In there? The entrance is hidden and guarded to protect Metlex and other predators from ending, entering. Do not worry, we will be safe and warm there. He pats my arm. No one would dare harm you. Am I tense? I, I must be tense for him to throw out a comment like that. It's just that for so long, it's only been Vector to have to worry about. Now I'm worried to, about having to be dropped in to meet 30-odd others. My arms tighten around his neck. What if they all hate me? What if they all think I'm gross-looking? What if... Oh! A deep, sonorous voice calls out. Bechtel raises a hand high into the air in response. I cling to his back, worry thudding my body as another big body appears in the distance. That is Rahosh, Bechtel tells me in a low voice. He must be back from his hunting treks. The other male jogs through the snow towards us, churning a path through the drifts. The pink, flimsy trees wave overhead, and the entire scene looks ludicrous. I try not to stare at Rahosh as he approaches, but, well... I'm staring. Where Vectel's horns are big and thick but sleek, Rahosh's horn crown is a busted mess. He has one that juts out and then arches back, jutting high above his head. The second is broken off, a mere jagged stump. As he gets closer, I see scars covering one of Rahosh's broad face. His skin, er, pelt, or er, whatever, is a deeper gray than Vectel's, like dark smoke. And if I thought Vectel was fearsome looking, Rahosh takes things to a whole new level. He grins and raises a hand as he jogs out to meet us, and then his steps low, then his steps lo slow as he sees me. I thought you were burdened with the hunt, brother. I was about to come and relieve you. I have much to tell, Bechtel says, and I can hear the pride in his voice as he gently lowers me to the ground. His chest starts to vibrate with a loud, incessant purr. Rahosh's eyes go wide, and he looks at Bechtel, then at me. Purr? He gazes at me, up and down. What? What is she? She is Georgie, a human and my mate. Vectel's arm goes around my shoulders and he tugs me against him. I can feel the purr moving through his body, so strong that he's practically vibrating, resonating, as he calls it. Rahosh stares at me for so long that I feel uncomfortable. He considers my face, my hair, no doubt, looking for horns, and then the rest of my smaller shivering form. I'm wearing someone else's jumper, and I haven't had a comb in weeks, and I probably look like hell. This is the first time I've felt it, though. Vectel always makes me feel... pretty. Like I'm the sexiest thing to ever grace his presence, and he can barely keep his hands off me. I've been taking for granted how wonderful it feels to be special to someone. My hand goes to Vectel's waist, and I slide it down his back until I encounter the bumpus of his tail base. I circle it, and caress it, absently. At my side, Vectel stiffens, and the thrumming takes on an even more urgent beat. He rushes, ru reaches back and gently removes my hand, then nuzzles my ear. Wait until we are in private, my sweet residence. I know you are not comfortable with public displays. <laughs> Oops! Did I just give him the Saku equiv equivalent of a public handy? Oh my gosh. A hot flush covers my cheeks, and I nod. I don't look at Rahosh, though, because then I will be completely and utterly embarrassed. Human, Rahosh says after a moment, the words swallowed and thick in his throat. Her eyes. She has no cooey. Bechtel says. His hand goes to my hair, and he combs through it with his big, thick fingers. I feel pretty once more. He still can't stand to take his hands off me. And, okay, I kind of adore it. We will fix that pro- We will fix that problem soon. I nudge Bechtel with my elbow. We'll talk about it. 
We'll talk about it, he amends. I sneak a glance at Rahosh, and he's still staring at me, but it's not a look of disinterest or revulsion, rather. I see a yearning as he looks at me, not in a sexual way. Instead, it's as if his best buddy just showed up with the Christmas present he'd been wishing on for years. You are lucky, he says finally, his voice thick, to have found your resonance. The luckiest, Bechtel agrees, and his fingers stroke my neck, but my mate needs the healer. I want to protest about the mate thing since I haven't tried, haven't said yes yet, but my wrist gives a pathetic throb, and I realize how much it still hurts. Um, healer sounds good, I sigh faintly. Uh, food too? Food, yes. And nuzzles my brow. And warm clothing, and you shall sleep in my furs tonight. I blush because I feel like this is an obvious way of saying we're totally doing it to his buddy, but Rahosh doesn't blink an eye. Hum, the new alien says, and gestures for us to follow. There will be many questions. I'm ready for them, Vectal says. I'm not sure that I am, I chime in. The thought of being quizzed by dozens of staring aliens makes me feel a little exhausted, and we haven't even entered the cave yet. We're still going after the others in the morning, right? Others? Rahosh says, and there is a more than casual interest in his gaze. Georgie has, um, Georgie has arrived with five other humans, Vectal says. They are in need of rescue. Five other humans, Rahosh asks, his glowing blue eyes going wide. Do you speak truthly? truly? All female, Vectal says in a low, almost reverent voice. As I watch, Rahosh staggers. Truly? Truly. I'm starting to get worried, and I haven't even told them about the other six women in the hibernation pods. Uh, is this a problem? I ask. Vectal, you said your people would help mine. It is not a problem, my alien says in a grave tone. He caresses my cheek. It is a blessing. There are only four adult females in our tribe, and all of them are mated. Do they resonate? Rahosh asks in a harsh voice. They have no cooey. Vectal says, but I resonated for Georgie. Others might resonate to a human female. I stop in my tracks. Wait, what? This this isn't open season on human ladies. I thought we were going to get rescued, not playing matchmaker. Rahosh simply stares at me like I'm insane. My words probably don't make sense in their language. I don't really care. I'm trying to get help from my friends, not hook, hook them up with alien boyfriends. I think back to Vectal's greeting of me, in which he just grabbed me and initiated oral sex. Yeah, sure, I orgasmed quite a few times, but that didn't give him the right to make the decision to mate me, nor did I give him the right to decide the others got mates without their say-so. Um, no one is being mated without their agreements, I say, crossing my arms. Then I wince because I keep forgetting my one wrist is total shit. It is agreed, my Georgie, Vectal says. He caresses my cheek again. I am chief. They will listen to me. Any male who wishes to mate a human woman must have their agreement. I relax a bit. Agreement? Rahosh sputters. But, but resonance! Doesn't happen for humans, I say sweetly. It's, it's something to be argued about later, when my mate is not cold and hungry, Vectal says. Breaking in before Rahosh protests at me again, he puts a protective arm over my shoulders. We have traveled far, and we will be traveling far again in the morning. Of course. Rahosh says stiffly. He turns and heads back to the trees, and Vectal and I follow him in. The trees thicken, and as we approach the cliff, I see the entrance to an extremely large cave. The mouth of it is enormous and wide, bigger than any human or sakui, even if I stood on Vectal's shoulders and tried to touch the ceiling. It narrows down further in, and this is where Rahosh and Vectal lead me. I cringe at the thought of spending endless hours in a deep cavern. It doesn't strike me as very safe. But as we make our way through the winding tunnel, the air gets warmer, noticeably so. It feels like we're going down, so shouldn't it be getting colder? I'm puzzled by this until the cave opens up into a larger chamber and the faint smell of rotten eggs touches my nose. And then, I'm just stunned. The hill the Sakui live in is hollow. The cave opens up into an enormous cavern that reminds me of a gigantic hollow donut. It's circular, and the center is composed entirely of a large, incredibly blue pool. Another heated spring. I realize with wonder, that is why it smells so strongly of eggs. I pinch my nose, and I look around in surprise. There are people bathing in the pool, a tiny child with nubs for horns splashing in the water as a man holds it and a female laughs nearby. The cavern walls round upward, and the roof has a hole in it, almost like a sunroof. From here, I can see snow drifting in, but it melts in the presence of the warmer air and drips down harmlessly. 
The edges of the cavern donut are riddled with caves, most with ledges and walkways built from additional rock or woven reeds of some kind. A reed-like bridge spans one side of the donut ceiling over to the other. There are aliens everywhere, too. Some sit in the entrances of their cave homes, other, another pair weaves baskets in the distance. Off to one side, an alien with an enormous arching horns and pale skin scrapes a hide stretched over a frame. Vecul is back! A voice calls out happily. Exclamations of joy and chatter erupt in the cave. And all heads turn towards us. And then, everyone is staring at me. It feels weird to be the center of so much attention. As more heads turn and people stand, others approach. And there are a lot of men. A lot of them. Some are dressed only in loincloths due to the warmth of the cave. All of them are muscular, tall, and good-looking for Sakui kind, I'm guessing. And they're all staring super intently at me with a mixture of curiosity and longing. My mate, Vectel says proudly. A human. Mama, why is its face so ugly? A tiny voice asks. Voices rush, raise the hush it. Rahosh looks chagrined or choked. I can't decide which one. Vectel growls low in his throat. And takes a step forward, clearly insulted on my behalf. I kind of giggle. To think that these weird people think I'm ugly, they're the ones with horns, tails, glowing eyes, and a downy suede over their bodies. They're the ones with ridges all over their foreheads and noses and, um, other interesting body parts. Night, Glenny boy. Vectel drags me against his chest in a possessive grip, and I suddenly find myself pressed against one rock-hard, vest-covered pectoral. This is my- this is my mate. I resonate for her. As if on cue, his chest starts to vibrate, the thick, steady purr jiggling my cheek. She is beautiful to me. Different, but beautiful nonetheless. He brushes his fingers through my hair. I have seen her bravery, her spirit, and her will. She has trusted me when she has no reason to. She has given me her body when she has no cooey to compel her. And it does not matter what any eyes think of her but mine. And to me, she is the most beautiful, most attractive, and most compelling of creatures. My eyes prick with emotion. Okay, for a barbarian, he's pretty good at making a romantic speech. I'm totally giving him a handy for real when, you get, when we get alone again. What is a human? Somebody else asks. Are there others? Says another voice. He says there are five. Rahosh says in that low, rumbly voice of his. All female. I wince at the awe and wonder that fills the voices in the cavern. Fuck a duck. These guys are going to think it's a straight up mating season if this continues, especially if there are only four adult women in their tribe. That is a lot of unfulfilled sexual need. And what's going to happen when they find out there are six women in stasis in addition to the six who are awake? Um, Vectal? I murmur uncomfortably. As the other aliens get more excited, I get more nervous. All eyes turn on me at the sound of my voice. Vectal tugs me tighter against him. There will be time to answer questions later. My mate has survived an ordeal. She's hungry and tired and needs the healer. Where is Melak? Here, says a sweet voice. A woman with curling horns and long, flowing, dark hair steps forward. She holds a child to her breast, and her belly is rounded with another. Her glowing eyes watch me with fascination. Good, Vector says. Come with Georgie and me to the cave. She nods and hands her child off to another man. Let me get my healing blanket. My alien takes my hand and pulls me along after him. The others follow, and I don't blame them for snaring. More whisper as I turn my back to them, and I hear comments about my missing tail. I glance around just in time to see Rahosh sink into the shadows, a spear gripped in his arms. He watches me, intently, but not in a creepy way. If I had to place bets, I'd say that Rahosh is going to lobby hard for a human mate. The thought makes me uncomfortable, and it's gotta be hard in a tribe full of single lonely men. No pun intended. Vectel takes me through the labyrinth of cage caves to the one in the back, one of the back ones along the edge of the donut. There are a few feathers and what looks like de decorations on the outside of the door, but nothing to mark it as a chief's lodge. It looks like just like any other cave to my eyes. Inside, though, it's warm and it's cozy. Furs spill over a plush nest in the corner, and there is a shelf made out of rock that holds a few household implements. There's a fire pit in the corner, not in use, and what looks like reed net hanging on one wall. I give Vectel a curious look. Fishing? He grins. The look boyish. I wanted to see if we could catch one of the great fish in the salt lake. Salt lake? Are we near a sea? I have so many questions. This is my cave. And you're home now, too, Georgie. After a moment, he adds, If you accept me as your mate. He sounds uncertain, unhappy, and I feel a twinge of sadness that my indecision is hurting him. 
The pile of furs looks inviting, though, and I can't help but move towards it. I sit on the edge and moan with a pleasure as I sink backwards. This is by far the nicest, snuggliest bed I've had since I got here. I'm looking forward to curling up in this, I tell him. His eyes light up, and I hear the thrum in his chest start. Oh, he's taking that as a come on? I should correct him. Instead, I luxuriate in the, I luxuriate in the furs a bit longer, thinking of his sweet words earlier about how beautiful and strong I am. I arch my back so my breasts jut right out. His attention goes there, and I see the look in his strange glowing eyes grow heated. Shall I enter? Bechdel rubs a hand over his face. Yes, come, Malik. He moves to my side and presses a kiss to my hair. I shall go and talk with my hunters. Malik will take care of you. I want to pout, but my wrist hurts. And if Mal Malik's got food, she's my new favorite person. All right, don't be too long. Never, he says fervently, and his fingers trace my jaw. If you're asleep, I shall wake you by mating your mouth. <laughs> oh my god. A, scor a scorching blush colors my face. Um, it's called a kiss vectal. Saying like that makes it utterly filthy, and I'm perverted enough to be completely aroused at the thought. He simply gives me a roguish look, presses his mouth to mine, and then bounds out of his cave. I'm admiring my last glimpse of his tight ass and his leggings. When Malik steps through the entrance a moment later, parting the door hangings, she carries a large basket in her hands and smiles at me, flashing dainty fangs. May I join you? I nod. I watch her as she glides into the room, all fluid, all fluid steps and note the difference between her and the male of Vectal's tribe. Her horns are smaller and more delicate, though it seems horns are like noses for these people in that some are huge and some are just smaller and less twisty. It probably has more to do with heredity than testosterone. Her features are as strong and heavy as Vectal's, but her eyes seem to be bigger and longer, lashed, and her mouth is full and pouty. Her breasts are small and her entire body seems more wiry than soft, but she moves in an utterly sensuous way that makes me jealous. Her hair is long and gorgeous, rippling in a dark waterfall to her waist and tail. She dressed curiously, too. Her leathers seem more intricate than Vectal's, with interesting little designs worked into the soft hide that remind me of embroidery. The designs edge the artfully jagged hem of her neckline that crisscrosses over her broad shoulders and drapes loosely over her belly. It's knotted high on one hip, revealing leggings covering with more of the woven embroidery dotted through the leather. Her feet are bare when she sits next to me, though, and I'm surprised. It's warmer in the caves, granted, but it's still chilly to me. But Vectel's people seem to be wearing clothing as if it's a total summer's day. I'm rather envious of that. I'd like to be warm for a change. Same, dude. Same, Georgie. In one fluid motion, Malik sits in front of me, cross-legged. She sets her basket down on the cave floor next to the bed and places both of her hands, palms up, on her knees. May I heal you? Um, yeah. Yeah. There's no word in their language for okay. She takes my bad hand gently in hers, pulls back the leathers, and then unwraps the bindings that Vectel put on it. My wrist is still bruised and swollen, and as the bandages are removed, it throbs with renewed pain. To my surprise, Malik closes her eyes and cradles my wrist, as if waiting for something. Um, okay. I wait. Since it seems impolite to ask what the hell she's doing, after a long moment, she opens her eyes and frowns at me. You have no cooey. I thought perhaps Vectal was mistaken. No, I say with a faint smile. He's right. I don't have a cooey. The, world's feels, the word feels strange in my mouth. She sets my wrist down gently. Strange. I cannot do much for you, then. My cooey is a special one, she says, touching her breast and then extending her hand outward. It can call upon your cooey and encourage it to work stronger. Ah. Well, at least she isn't offering to rub crystals or pack mud on me or something barbarian-like. It's all right, really. I can rewrap it for now, she says, reaching into her basket. Once you have taken on a cooey, then I can heal it for you. I say nothing. I haven't exactly decided what a, that they want a planetary parasite, though the odds certainly aren't looking in my favor at the moment. Can I ask something? Of course. Her big glowing eyes look up at me. Do you remember getting your cooey? Is that why all these people are so blasé about having a tapeworm? Her eyes widen, and she shakes her head. Our children are born helpless with no cooey. They are vulnerable until they have passed four days of age. Then we hunt the great Sakokts and transfer a cooey to the child. Why wait four days? The child must be strong enough to accept the cooey, she says. Otherwise, it is death for both child and cooey. Her hands are gentle as she takes bone splints from her basket and works them into my leather wrappings, supporting my wrist. Does it hurt? She sh 
shrugs her graceful shoulders. I do not know. Oh, does it hurt? Referring to the cooey. I do not know. I was very young when I accepted mine. It's a very rare that a cooey dies and a new one must be found for us, cooey. It has not happened in my lifetime. This isn't doing very much to help my worry at the thought of taking in a freaking symbiote in my body. Do you feel it moving? Like, do you know it's there? Does it, like, like, talk to you? Talk. Her eyes widen, and she laughs until she sees how serious my face is. Then her laughter dies. No, of course not. It does not speak. It is like having a heart or a lung or a stomach. You have a cooey. Again, she shrugs her shoulders. Some call their entire lives without feeling resonance. That is only the, that is the only time the cooey awakens. Then it makes its presence known fiercely. With the purring. Her? Uh, the sound. I correct, then try, then try to imitate it in my throat. It makes you purr near your mate, right? It is more than just that, she says, tying down the last of the bindings around my wrist. Her hand goes to her breast. One feels an intense surge of urgency when the cooey comes to life. It is like a rush of spirit. It's clear. She's struggling to describe it. It's clear she's struggling to describe it. Like uh, adrenaline, I guess, then add, L like running down a hill really fast or dur during a hunt. She nods slowly. More than that, it is possessiveness too. Your mate is yours, and those who wait to claim their mate find the feeling intensifies over time. It is difficult to describe. It is more than a feeling. It is knowing. This worries me a little. Excuse me. I imagine Vectal and what he must be going through when he resonates with me. He hasn't seemed all jacked up, though. Possessive, yes, but content. Maybe it's different for different people? It is a part of our lives, she says gently. The Kui chooses the mate, and the Kui is never wrong. It brings greater pleasure than any can imagine when one resonates against one's mate. And were you happy with the mate it chose for you? Her smile curves sweetly. My Kashram? No. At first I was quite angry. The Kui does not always pick who we think we want in our furs. Kashram is a tanner, not a hunter. I was young and drawn to one hunter in particular who shared furs with, who I shared furs with. Her long lashes flutter, and she turns to her basket and pulls out clothing. I brought you these. Vector says you are frequently cold, so I hope these shall keep you warm. I'm sensing a conversation change. Who did you share furs with before you were... resonated? I ask, wonder if, wondering if it's taboo to bring up. But her expression is guileless as she looks up at me. Why? Vectal, of course. I'm stunned at the stab of jealousy that shoots through me. This is my alien's lover? M my alien who lived a life of bachelorhood before resonating for me? I picture th the scenario. Malik and Vectal rolling around in bed, him licking her like he does me, then her getting up and running to another man just because she resonated for him. Ugh. Then my jealousy dies away, and I'm filled with sympathy for my Vectal. How that must have disappointed him. To have a lover when there were so few women to have must see seem like a gift. Then to have her taken away. Must have been a very dark time for him. Maybe that's why he's so stinking happy to have me. I feel a surge of affection for the big guy. Totally getting a handy tonight. Vectal. The men have endless questions, as I knew they would. Will the women resonate for them? How many are there? What do they look like? Do they have mates of their own? Are the humans shaped like Sakui women? The differences are minor, I tell them. They have no tails, and their mouths are small, and they do not have fangs. They cannot eat fresh meat. They must cook it until it has no flavor. Someone makes a gagging noise. But, but you resonated for her. She is small. Can she take you? Saluk, Saluk asks this, the biggest of our hunters. No doubt he's picturing himself next to Tiny Georgie and trying to fit himself into her. The thought makes me curiously angry. I knew it is an innocent question. Saluk has never had a mate to share his furs. He keenly wants one. I should share the information I have. I tell him that sliding into Georgie is tight, but it's like a dream. She convulses and clenches uh, when she feels pleasure, just like our women. That her, that the nipples that she have on her breast are tipped with soft texture shin, skin that are pink like her tongue, but it seems too in it seems too intimate. As I look at Saluk's avid gaze, though, I know he is hoping that one of the human females will make his cooey resonate. Then he will be able to claim a mate and have a family, his greatest desire. So I give them a few grudging facts. She has fur in one other spot on her body, and it's in between. At the exclamations, I add, and a third nipple! 
another nipple? Raoush asks, his voice curt, disbelieving. For young? Where? Between her legs. He starts clearly finding this ridiculous. She is deformed, and yet she will not accept the mating? She should be lucky to have you. His words infuriate me. I rise to my feet. You speak out of bitterness, Rahosh, I tell him. You are jealous that I have resonated and your own cooey remains silent after all this time. My mate is perfect in every way. It is not her fault that she comes from a place with different customs. In her land, they choose their mates. Someone sput mutters at this strangeness. Georgie will take a cooey soon, I tell them. She must. I cannot bear the thought of her declining it and leaving me to go back to her strange planet. The thought stabs me like a knife, and I fight back the agony it brings. When she feels the cooey within her resonate, she will know what it means to be mated. Until then, I court her with caresses and affection. Just because she does not resonate for me does not mean I shall treat her any differently. Probably a good thing, and she had she resonated for you then, Vector, and not Rahosh. He'd have found her lacking. Ahako teases. Rahosh's nostrils flare. He shoots me a cold look and then storms away from the gathering of men. I rub my face warily. I'm glad to be home against my tri amongst my tribe, but my body aches for Georgie. I am eager to join her in bed. I need hunters and supplies in the morning, I tell them. We go to rescue the other humans. Who will join me? Soon, I have a good group of hunters that have volunteered. It does not surprise me that they are all unmated males and young. The elder ones might be used to their solitude, but the others, like me, hunger for a mate. Young, brawny Saluk will go. Laughing Ahiko, quiet Pashab, and his sibling Venik. Hot-headed Rokan, who has a quick tongue but even quicker senses. Skilled Zalaya, and grim, unsmiling Hayden, whose sad history serves as a lesson to others. I suspect that come morning, Rahosh will show up and join us. He is an excellent hunter for all his bitterness. It is a good party. Malik will want to go, but Kashim, Kashrim worries that the trek is too far for her while carrying her kit. She will stay behind. Once the hunters have been finalized, I give orders to find rations, blandly cooked and not spiced, water skins for the human women, warm foot coverings, extra leathers, blankets as many as the men can carry. We will head straight from the human strange cave ship to a Kush... K excuse me. We will head straight from the human strange cave ship to a Sakox hut. There will be there we will get the women their cooey. Then my my Georgie will resonate for me. She will be safe, her life unthreatened by cooey sickness. Both she and her child will be protected from harm. Sleep, I tell the hunters. We will leave at dawn of the second sun. The men scatter, though I doubt any of them will be able to sleep. They will be dreaming of flat-faced human women with third nipples and welcoming bodies. My own body hardens at the thought of a Georgie, waiting in bed for me. I sprint to my cave, eager to see my mate again. Ahiko calls out in jest, but I ignore it. I don't care if I seem eager. Any unmated man would gladly trade his place for mine, and they know it. Inside of my cave is dark and silent. No hearthstones uncovered for soft light. I don't need them. I know my small abode by heart. I move to the bed and hear Georgie's soft breathing, and my cooey thrums again. My heart swells with love and desire for this soft yet strong-willed woman. She is already everything to me. I brush my fingers over her soft mane and she stirs. Hmm. Vector? Go back to sleep, I tell her, pulling off my leathers. I will join you in bed. She sits up, and in the pale bit of light, I see her hair tussled on her head. I thought you were going to make wake me with a mouth mating, she, she says, and her voice is husky and full of promise. I groan, and I get harder at her suggestion. You are tired and must sleep, my residence. We leave early in the morning. <laughs> then we'll have to be quick, she says, and her hands go to my breeches. I dare not move as her hands undo the last laces of my loincloth, and she tugs the leather free. I am, my bottom parts are met with open air, and then a moment later is clasped in her small warm hands. Impossibly, I'm even harder now. Hmm, I've been daydreaming about this all day. No, oh. hmm, I've been daydreaming about this all day, she says in a delicious voice. It seems too incredible to think about. Have you? My hands steal to her soft hair, unable to resist touching her. I stroke it off her brow as she wraps her hands around me and grips me tight. It doesn't feel as good as burying myself within, but I'm fascinated and still yet aroused. Yes, she says, and when she speaks, her lips move over the aching crown of my begibogo. I suck in a breath, and my cooey begins to vibrate, a hard, insisting pulse of my need. 
Then I can scarcely believe it when she takes my thing into her mouth. I feel the head enclosed by a warm moistness, and I nearly spill, spill myself right then and there. I groan. My entire body feels tense in response. It's like nothing I've ever had before in my life. I've had women pleasure me with their mouths, but this, it's different. Soft, smooth, slick. Only my strength of will does not keeps me from pushing myself deeper really don't want to hurt her. She flicks her tongue over my head, and I clench my fists against the need. I'm too fascinated by what she's doing. With a little bit of nibbling and whatnot, she goes the motion up and down and licks her way all up and back again, like a lollipop. That was my own insertion. Then she takes takes things back into her mouth and rolls her tongue all over the place. Yeah, I, I don't think I can take all this, she murmurs, her voice sounding odd. Huh, I can't even fit my fingers around you. Is that good? She, chuck she, she chuckles, the, so the sound throaty and sexual. For me it is. She swipes her tongue over the head of myself again. Georgie, I rasp. My, the blood in my body seems to be pooling below me in my bottom parts. My cooey pounds against my chest. If, if I'm not inside of you, within the next moments... Wait, she murmurs softly and I hear her shift on the bedding. Then the scent of her arousal perfumes the air, and I hear the sound of wet flesh slicking. She moans. Oh yeah, I'm wet now. It's too much. I groan again and push her back, and I fumble at her clothing, and it's all so different. Why is it different? Until I find her slick and inviting, I drag my fingers across her, and she's right. She is moist and ready. I grip her and press against her. She squeals, and I feel her grip me hard. Oh, she moans. Oh, Vectal, one more time. My mate is loud and others will hear her. I don't care. I pull back and I continue to go. And I am feeling deeper and deeper within my Georgie. The spur above sliding wonderfully. She cries out one more time. And I feel her saying and screaming, I'm coming already. She breathes in her own language. God damn it. I pause, worry. And I, and I hear... And her good hand slams down on my arm. One more time, she demands in my language. Just like that. With a chuckle, I give my sweet, demanding mate what she wants. And I continue, over and over, feeling very, very strong. Georgie must feel it too, because she is squirming rather, rather interestingly beneath me. Making aroused noises and panting and whatnot, clawing at my shoulders and chanting again, over and over and over. And naturally, I do as she pleases until she cries out with the tip of her pleasure. She clenches me, and then I begin to come to my own conclusion. I weave for a moment, and when Georgie tugs me down back to the bed next to her, I greatly follow. Me, still within her, turns and cups her body against mine, her back pressed against my chest. She squirms a little bit, and I respond. I feel you pressing into my... Oh, I feel you pressing into my backside, she says, struggling with the right word. My spur? I ask, chuckling. I'm aroused by the thought of taking her from this way. <laughs> it's not done with my people. Uh, not when we have tails that get in the way. Is it uncomfortable? She, she squirms again. It's just, uh, it's just weird. I run a pleased hand over her still flat belly. We will have much time to discover our likes and dislikes together, my Georgie. Do not worry. My heart seems to still in my chest. If she stays with me. If. Hmm, she says, her voice sleepy. Then she makes a, hmm, noise in the dark. Your, your, your cooey stopped. It silences for a time after a mating, I tell her. It will not go away even when the kit arrives. Kit? She asks, and I can hear the frown on her face. What is this word? The mental picture I'm getting with the word is a child. That is correct, I tell her, and stroke my hand down her stomach again. A kit is a child. What? Why? Wait, how can I have your baby? She asks, her body utterly still against me. I'm an alien. Actually, you are. But for the argument, let us say it's me. Have I not explained this to her? This is how the Kui chooses, I tell her. It determines offspring. A resident's mate is the only one who can bear children. Offspring will only come through a Kui mating. Wait, 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 wait. 
Georgie moans and then she's climbing out of bed. I feel a sense of loss as my body slides away from hers. I long to return, but she's making anguished sounds. Wait, 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 Vekel, 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 hold on, hold on, be, be straight with me. Straight, I repeat, confused by her of the use of the word. You wish me to form a line? No, 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 tell me the truth. I am telling you the truth, I say, baffled. You, you vibrated, resonated, because your cooey decided you could make me pregnant, she asks, her voice raising in volume. Yes, I say, not sure where this is heading. A cooey always responds to a fertile female. She moans again. No, 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 you can't make me pregnant. I'm not due for my period. Oh, fuck. She says in her own language, fuck, 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 I'm never late, fuck. Fuck? I echo. I don't know that word. Georgie descends back to the bed, only to smack a fist against my arm. It means I'm late. It means you could have gotten me pregnant, you asshole. Asshole? I don't know this word either. Fuck is all she says. And so ends part five of Chili Chili Planet Time with the Barbarians. We're on page 151, and there is only 179. So we are very much approaching the end of the totally not reading smut on stream stream. She gonna have a baby. Oh no, this, no, my, our girl Georgie is most definitely having a kit. Oh, for sure. I've learned a little bit of the, the, the Sakui language as it, as it seems, because I now know what a kit is naturally. How are we doing so far? Everybody okay? Honestly, I, I, I will admit, when I, when this was hyped up to me, I was under the impression that it was going to be a lot worse than it actually is. So, I'm, I'm chilling right now. And apparently, it seems like my heart rate has gone down a little bit. I, I honestly, the reason that I wanted to have the heart rate thing up was because I didn't know exactly how flustered that I was going to get with the book, and apparently I'm taking things quite well. Now that I know that this is a thing now with this little band on me, I might get to bring this back a little bit forward. That'd be great. We're very close to the end. Indeed, Lilib! I figured Kit was a kid. I was expecting 50 shades, but this is much better. Oh my god. I guess, well, I wonder. <laughs> Maybe that lies in our future there, little Abe. I have literally no idea. That would be... I don't know if that's asking for trouble or not. Evidently, there are more books in this series, too. And honestly... I'm, I'm, kind, of I'm kind of inclined to see what happens next. I don't think... I, I don't feel like... Like, okay, so what they're saying so far is... They're gonna put a Cooey in Georgie. And they're gonna save their friends. I, did, I just, like... We've only got like 20 pages left and I don't, like, there was a lot that happened in 20 pages and stuff, but I have a doubt that like we're actually going to accomplish both of those things. They're certainly not escaping the planet and if it takes all this time to get a Kui in one of the girls, it's definitely going to take a while to get the Kui in the other girls. So I feel like there's more. There's more? There must be. There has to be. There's no way that this is all of it. <laughs> there is there's too much to happen in 20 pages. Exactly. I'm sure I'm curious to see how this ends. If I had to guess, they either maybe they forego the Kui completely because they're running out of time with the humans and they go and they they take them back to the the tribe or something. But they said they were going out hunting for the Kui in the morning, so I guess like I guess we'll experience the Ku the Kuiism, so to speak. That'll be uh that'll be interesting. In any case, here's the home stretch, everyone. Part six of Barbarian's Planet Ice. Naturally. Georgie. It's hard to stay mad at a guy who doesn't know why you're upset. No, scratch that. It's easy to stay mad at a guy like that. It's really, really hard to stay mad at a guy who acts like you're the best thing since sliced bread, pampers you at every turn, and acts like the baby you're carrying in your belly is the only thing he's ever wanted in his life. Especially hard to stay, stay mad as he and nine of his strongest hunters trek through thick snowdrifts in the bitter cold, carrying supplies for what they think are five more human women and are actually eleven. I haven't told them that part yet. One bombshell at a time. And if we decided to take our chances with the little green men, there would be no reason to wake them up and subject them to new and scary things. Like big blue horned guys who want to potentially mate them and give them a bun in the oven. <sighs> I feel the urge to touch my stomach, even though I'm currently piggyback on Vectal through the snow, heading ever up the icy mountain to where I left the others. I might not have had a choice about the baby thing, but I'm not upset. Like, which is weird to me. 
It's hard to be angry when you see so much joy in another person's face, and bringing Vectal that joy gives me some sort of sweet satisfaction, too. Maybe I'm more crazy about the guy than I like to admit. There, Vectal says, voice nearly lost in the wind. There's a blizzard blowing, and it's making trekking uphill a nightmare. No matter how many furs I wear, I can't stay warm. Even Vectal is bundled against the cold. I'm covered from head to toe, gloves cover my hands, and my teeth are still chittering. It's worrying, Vectal. But when he suggests he leave me behind at the Elder's Cave, I refused. I won't leave the others behind. I can't. I need to see them to make sure that they're safe. While we paused at the Elder's Cave overnight, a few of the Sakui learned English through the brain zapping. Their version isn't entirely right, but it's close enough that they'll be able to talk to the other women at least. I didn't miss the fact that Rahosh was the first one to step forward for the zap. He was definitely planning on scoring himself some human booty. I told Vectal too, and warned him to watch that hunter. He nodded. And we've been trekking close to Rahosh at the front, ever since. The black pit bit of ship in the distance is nearly invisible, covered entirely with snow. Worry strikes me anew that I've left them all behind for so long. That was never part of the plan. I'm a shitty, shitty leader. Oh, I say softly. Hurry, Vectal, please. If anything's happened to them... I let the world words trail off into the bitter wind. I don't even want to throw it out in the universe. Vectal pats my arm with a gloved one. All will, be, all will be well, sweet resonance. Do not worry. We're here. Strangely enough, his words are comforting. This isn't a rescue party of one, any, of one anymore. It's a rescue party of eleven. I don't have to do this all on my own. These crazy aliens have my back, which is actually pretty darn nice. Ahead, Vectal crawl, calls out, and he picks up the pace, surging to the front. I cling to his neck for dear life and don't issue a peep of protest. Even though his rough jog is killing my wrist, I have to know if everyone's okay. Have to. Time seems to slow as we make it to the discarded cargo bay. The snow is almost to the gap in the hole, and I slide off of Vectal's back as the others surge to our sides. Let us go in first. Me first, I declare stubbornly, stepping forward. Vectal steps ahead of me again with a shake of his head. Let me, in case there is something dangerous. I want to protest, but his hand goes to my stomach and he caresses it. Oh shit, a baby on board totally changes the game, doesn't it? I nod mutely and touch my stomach as he unsheathes a bone knife and descends into the hold. Stars flick in front of my eyes, and I realize I'm holding my breath. I exhale deeply, then have to concentrate on my breathing. It's so quiet in there. What if everyone's dead? What if... Vectal's head pops up through the break in the hole, and he extends a hand to me, glove removed. Come below, Georgie. I give a loud sigh of relief and gratefully take his hand. It feels strong and warm against mine. And again, I'm reminded how much Vectal had been, has been here for me. I feel a surge of gratitude even as he helps me climb down into the hold again. The stink of the interior washes over me. It smells of urine and poop and unwashed bodies, but not, thankfully, of dead things. Guys? I call out. The blankets are huddled in the corners of the cargo bay, unmoving. It makes my heart clench, and I stumble toward the mound of blankets. Liz? Kira? Megan? I peel the blankets back to reveal Kira's sunken face. She gives me a wan wan smile. Hey, Georgie, you're back. My eyes go wide at the sight of her. She's paler than before, her hair matted. Her eyes are hollow and dull, and she looks so weak that I doubt she has the strength to move. At her side, Tip Tiffany sleeps on, her darker skin ashy and dry. Are you guys okay? Can you sit up? I pull her up against me, ignoring the protest of my hurt wrist. Somewhere in the distance, Vectal is calling for his men to bring food, water, and blankets. I think it's the sickness. Kira says, voice exhausted. She seems to take forever to blink, and when she does, her eyes don't focus. We're just weaker every day. Tiffany, woke, Tiffany won't wake up. I lean over Kira and press my fingers to Tiffany's forehead. She's burning up with a fever. She doesn't stir at my touch either. Are the others alive? I ask Kira. On the far side of the room, I see Rahos stalk towards the blanket. He lifts one corner and then, ever so gently, lifts Liz and cradles her in his arms. He holds a water skin to her slack mouth so she can drink. Vectal pushes a water skin into my hand as more warriors drop into this hole, looking around. They don't comment on the smell, which is good, because that would make me very angry. Instead, they look curiously at the human women who were rousing. I hold the skin so Kira, Kira can drink. There's a strange tension in the air. A faint, familiar purr sounds. My head snaps up. Who's that? I ask. Who's resonating? The aliens are silent. The purr dies away. I narrow my eyes. Someone just resonated to one of the other humans. Yet another problem we don't need, and is hiding it. Georgie? Kira says, dragging my attention back to her. I'm so glad to see you. She says, her voice soft and happy. You brought help. You rescued us. 
I catch the faint sound of someone resonating again, and my heart sinks. I'm not sure if I've freed them, or just brought them to a new set of problems. But we need to talk, I tell her. All of us. Two hours later, the girls are feeling a bit better after eating and drinking. They're still weak and listless, but even Tiffany has been roused by a meal of broth delivered by a Sakui who calls himself Saluk. Warm but rope clothing has been provided, and the men are practically fawning over the women, who view them a lot more warily. Eventually, I give Vectal an exasperated look when yet another male hovers over an alarmed Megan and keeps trying to offer her bites of raw meat. Can you clear this place out? We need space to talk amongst ourselves privately and safely. He looks as if he wants to protest and then bites it back. Instead, he nods, kisses my brow, and tells the men, Come, we will hunt to feed the women. Pashov, Zedek, guard the entrance. The rest of you, come with me. Eventually, the men organize themselves and leave, though several longing glances are cast in it again, and I grab a bowl of the hot broth and sit with the rest of the girls, huddled against one of the walls. So, I tell them, the way that I see it, it's a good thing. Tiffany says in an exhausted voice. Oh, so the way I see it, it's a good thing. Tiffany says in an exhausted voice. What's so bad about a bunch of big hunky aliens asking his babe acting as babysitters? There's more to it than just that, I hedge. But Kira's giving me a suspicious look. How did you learn their language so fast? So I tell them about the spaceship that Vectal calls the Elder's Cave, the language dump it shot into my brain, the whole parasite thing that seems to be a requirement for not Hoth living, the Vectal's try the Vectal's tribe only has four women, and they're looking at us to hook up and become part of a family thing. The women make no comment, except for a few horrified blanches at the thought of a symbiont. I don't really blame them. If I stay here, I tell them, we're committing to an entirely different life. It's not a choice that can be made lightly. We have other options. We can opt not to take in the symbiont. Uh, we can fight instead. Tiffany shakes her head. We're so weak right now. I can barely lift my arms. Others nodded. I'm rather exhausted too. Just not as bad as the others because Vectel's been taking care of me, but in another day or so... I might just be like them. Not to mention, uh, not to mention we don't know when the ship is coming back, Megan says, or if. I think they'll come back to get us, Kira says thoughtfully. They're not going to want to lose such a valuable cargo, and from what it sounds like, we're extra, extra valuable. Uh, goody, says uh, Liz with a sarcastic tone. So they'll be back, and we can fight, or we can make it so that they can't remove us from this place, I tell them. Um, we're a little freaked out at the thought of getting a sim thing, Megan confesses. The cootie. <laughs> cooey, I request, I correct. Then shudder. What if it does look like a cootie? So we fight then? Girl, Tiffany says, I can barely lift my eyelids. I cannot fight. I vote we go with the big guys. Here's the thing, I say, rubbing my brow. I have a headache that won't go away. I don't know if it's cooey sickness or the smell of the hole, but I'm aching and I'm frustrated. The Kui picks mates. So if it decides that you would be perfect having babies with your worst enemy, you don't get a say in things. But it beats being like cattle, Liz chimes in. Even if we do manage to somehow take over the ship, there's no guarantee we'll be able to get ourselves back home or that they'll even take us. They could lie to us about it, and we'd be none the wiser. What do you want us to do? Josie asks me. You keep task asking us. Tell us what you're thinking. My hand goes to my stomach. I'm kind of biased in one direction because I'm pregnant with Vectal's baby. He's resonating for me, and apparently it means that, despite the fact that we're not the same species, he can get me pregnant. So, I'm gonna stay. The moment I say it aloud, I feel cleansed. Of course I want to stay. I'm coming to care for Vectal. I might even love the big guy, and I'm carrying his child. It's not his fault I was kidnapped by aliens, and now I have to get a cootie, as Megan calls it. He's done nothing but love me. Pregnant? Tiffany repeats. In a week? Seriously, girl? <laughs> Damn, girl. Can't leave you alone for five minutes, Liz says. Dead serious this time. I feel like if you leave our sights again, you're gonna show up with a litter. A hot flush comes over my face. To be fair, I thought he couldn't make me pregnant if it was interspecies sex. A Great Dane can still make a Chihuahua pregnant, Liz points out. Guess which one you are. I make a face at her. I didn't want to say anything to influence you guys. <laughs> like, hey, someone buttered my roll while you guys were waiting for me to return, and he left a few crumbs behind? Liz cracks. Ouch. Um, sorry. I, uh... Ah, don't be sorry. 
Don't be sorry, Kira says, butting in. She touches Liz's arm before Liz can make another comment. It's just been rough for us. <laughs> Trust me, showing up pregnant was a surprise for me too. So, we're staying? Josie asks. I look at the tired, exhausted faces of my fellow captives. If you guys are decided, yes. If a guy shows up with a hamburger, he can plant as many babies in me as he wants to, Liz declares. I hear shuffling outside and low murmured conversations. I sigh and look at Liz. D did I mention that some of them learned English from the old ship? The offer stands, Liz says with a grin. Should we wake up our uh, other test tube ladies? I eye the wall and feel a bit of anxiety. They're really going to hate us, aren't they? Why? Kira says. It's not like we kidnapped them. We're giving them an out. An out that involves cooties and mating an alien, I pointed out. You're not complaining, Liz says. If they treat us as good as, half as good as Vectel's been treating you, it's not a terrible thing at all. And it beats being cattle now, don't it? I nod, then touch my stomach. I guess we wake them up then. Maybe we should warn Vectel and the others that there are 11 of us. Around me, eyes widen. You haven't told him that there's six more? Josie asks. Oh, oh shit. They're totally gonna think it's Christmas around here. Liz says and starts to laugh. I can't wait to see the look on their faces. Vectal. Just when I think my mate can surprise me no more, she brings something new. So, Vectal, she says, sidling up to me as I return with my men and a freshly slain beastie for the humans to char into inedible food. Can we talk for a minute? The other men shoot me envious looks as my mate touches my arm and my cooey begins to hum. One of the men resonated earlier as well, but no one is stepping forward, and I don't blame them. With the humans undecided as to if they will stay or go, a thought that is like a knife to the gut, no one is sure how to react. But Georgie gives me an encouraging smile and pulls me aside. Her hand goes to my chest and I hold it against my thrumming cooey. So, I have good news and I've got bad news. Which do you want to hear first? There is bad news? I'm staggered. The urge to grab my mate and run off with her hits me like a palpable thing. If it's bad, you must tell me now. I cannot bear it. She looks a little alarmed at my response. It's a human tease, Vectal, she says. Don't get so upset. I don't know if it's bad news as much as it is uh, more startling. <laughs> I exhale slowly. I'm ready. Well, the good news is that we're staying, she says, a small smile playing on her lips. We talked and we voted. I don't know what vote it is, but the words she's saying filled me with utter joy. I crushed her, I crush her against me and press my lips to her. She twitches and a happy laugh escapes her. Then she wraps her arms around my neck and kisses me back. And for a moment, nothing exists outside of my Georgie and her soft sweet mouth. My resonance, I murmur between kisses. You fill me with joy. She breaks the kiss, and there's a worried look on her strange, smooth little face. You might not like what else I have to say. I want to tell her that nothing else matters, not as long as she is with me. But there's such anxiety in her strange eyes that I bite back the words. What? What is it? Your men are here to rescue five women. She says, her fingers fiddling with the laces on my vest. She won't look me in the eyes. But there are six more. Hibernating. I study Georgie for a moment. Her words don't make sense. Perhaps she still has not grasped the all of her language. Uh, the word, you say, it means... Sleeping? Did you mean something else? No, I mean hibernating. She says again. Her smaller hand grips mine and she pulls me toward the wall with the strange panels and the lights, much like that in our elder's cave. When we get to the wall, she touches it with a pat of her hand. They're asleep in here, and they have no idea what's going on. I'm astonished. Asleep in the walls of your cave? Yes, she says, her expression sad. We were afraid to wake them. And she tells me an incredible story of being taken from her home while she was sleeping and finding herself in the belly of the cave ship. We are the extras. These in the wall are the original cargo. I don't understand her words, but I understand what she's telling me. Your numbers are twice what they seem. I hope you're not mad. Her face is worried. Mad? I'm ecstatic. That there are five women who are young, healthy, and mateable seems as a gift from the gods. Six more is an unthinkable bounty. I want to, to press Georgie against me and crush her in a hug for saving my tribe from what feels like certain destruction. Instead, I must remain calm. Six more females, and they will be frightened and confused and will need to be treated carefully. She nods. 
Your men will need to be careful around them. They haven't been held captive like us. As far as we know, they might still think they're at home, sleeping in their beds. This is all going to be very strange and very frightening to them. She squeezes my hand. We didn't want to wake them when they weren't decided. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. George is telling me that however reluctant the humans are to join our tribe, these women might be even more so, that it will take time and patience to bring them into our tribe. I understand. Some of them might reject the, um, cooey, she says, her mouth struggling to form the word. That must also be their choice. It's not something I comprehend, but as long as Georgie takes the cooey, I care not about what others do. I press her palm to my mouth. I shall leave it in your charge. She nods, a grim look on her face. I'll get the others then. The men retreat. A little aware by the newest revelation that there are yet more human females. I see eagerness in their faces. Excuse me. And they want to stay behind to be the first to lay eyes on the new females. In the hopes of resonating to one. But we know the women will be hungry when they awaken. And a Sakui male's instinct is to feed and tend to his mate. So the men set off hunting, and Georgie and her women get back to work, prying open the compartments. I watch from a distance, unable to let my mate leave my sight. She and her women are weak and listless, and I am worried about the Kui sickness might be too much for them. With Kira's help as translator, they manage to open the strange wall, revealing six long tubes with floating naked women. Georgie is right. Six more women. Incredible! Oh, so similar to my Georgie that it makes my heart clench uncomfortably at the thought of her being trapped inside one of those tubes. One by one, the women are freed from the tubes. There's confusion at first, followed by sobbing. The others wrap the new female in a warm fur and take her aside to answer questions she might have, feed her, and clothe her. Some of the women stare blankly as Georgie and the others explain. One is furious. There is one with flaming orange hair and orange specks all over her strange pale skin. She sees me and chokes back the little scream, only to be comforted with small pats from Georgie and the other women. My mate is right. It will take some time for these women the these women are comfortable. But far these women are comfortable, and it's time we don't have. Georgie and her women cannot last much longer without a cooey. As the women share clothing and chatter together, I head out to check on the men who were exiled from the hold to give the humans time to acclimate. A few of my hunters have stayed behind to guard the hold while the others search for more food. Against them are Ahako and Rokan. Ahiko presses a hand to his chest. I don't know if my heart is beating fast with excitement or if it is my resonance. I clap him on the shoulder. You will know when you see your female's face. Until then, do not worry. I have longed for a male all my years, he says. Now I cannot stop wondering if it was one of the human females to think of having a family after so long. There is an ache in his voice, I well understand. Before my Georgie, I felt the same. Now my life feels almost complete. When she takes the cooey and her life is no longer at jeopardy, I will know total contentment. When can we look up upon them? Soon, I tell Ahiko. The humans are scared. This is all new, and we are strange to them. Give them a bit more time to adjust. It is difficult to be patient, Rokan says. He seems to be calmer than Ahiko, but the hands that grip his spear are white-knuckled. To know that there are mateable females so close by. I nod, but my gaze is on the men at the distance. The hunters are returning, and there is haste in their steps. I watch them approach, and when Rehosh arrives at the head of the hunting party, he is out of breath, but jubilant. A Sakosk is near, a large one. I nod. Then we will bring our humans to it in the morning. My own blood thrums with excitement. The Sakoks are lone wanderers. To find one so close to the human encampment is a sign. I decide it's time to sit back no longer. Entering the human cave, I ignore the startled looks the new humans send my way and call Georgie to my side. She comes, all kisses and smiles. I suspect that for my benefit as much as the wary humans. Hi, is all she says in a cheery voice. She looks tired, though. All the humans do. I take her hand in mine, kiss her palm again, and she gives me another tiny sigh of pleasure. I can smell her arousal bloom in my touch, and it's making my cooey hum in my chest. But I cannot take her tonight. She needs her rest. Tomorrow, we leave here. To go to your caves? To go hunt the Sakaks. We seek cooey for you and the women. She flinches a little and nods. If we must, we must. We need more time. The mouthy one called Liz says she looks a weaker than the rest, thin and wan, but she's got a stubborn set to her flat mouth. Not all of us are sold on the idea. She puts an arm around the new human's shoulders, and the tr woman trembles and leans into Liz's caress. You may not have much more time, 
I begin, but I'm interrupted by a high-pitched whine. In the background, Kira claps a hand to her ear and collapses. Georgie claps a hand to her own arm, wincing. What? What is that? Her mouth opens in pain. She pulls her hand away from her arm, even as the whine dies down. There's a light blinking in her arm, just under the skin. An angry, glowing, glaring red. The aliens are coming back? She tells me. We need to leave. Georgie. We are a sad, sad little party as we set out from the cargo bay a short time later. The new girls are weeping and confused. They want more furs than we have to go around, and they want better shoes. They're hungry, cold, and tired. Maybe it's exhaustion, but I'm frustrated with them because we're doing the best we can, and they just keep crying. I know this is new and scary for them, but I find myself wishing they'd catch up and get with the program already. The women also want to avoid the men who are giving them longing looks. Someone keeps purring, though no one will step up and admit things. It's probably for the best because I'm guessing that the girls can't handle the thought of taking on an alien boyfriend right now, not with everything else going on. My upper arm throbs. It's freshly bandaged, but it still stings like the dickens. Once the sensors went off, we set into action, readying to leave the camp. But before we did, though, we had to take care of matters. If the sensors were trackers, we had to get rid of them. And fast. Out came the knives, and five minutes, and a lot of tears later, the trackers had been removed. Bashav had been sent to, the dump the, to dump them into the nearest metal cave, let the little green men take them if they want their captives. Now the rest of us trudged through the snowy dusk, except for Josie, who's carried by a big male called Hayden. We're trying to ignore the bitter cold in search of something Bechtel called a Sakakts. Kasakots. It would have the cooey we need, and it, he told me, would save us. I'm all for being saved at this point. Um, exhaustion is making it difficult for me to keep up, and Liz is so weak that Rahosh decided to carry her slung over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes. One of the scouts appears, waving his spear overhead. Sakroks! He calls into the driving wind. In the valley! Hurry! Bechtel puts an arm around my wrist. He is now carrying Tiffany, who's too exhausted to lift her feet. Come, my, come, my resonance, he tells me. Not much further. I'm good. I tell him, plodding ahead. I... The ground shakes under my feet. What was that? I ask, stopping. Terror ripples through me as it happens again. Even the snow on my feet vibrates. That, Bechtel says, urging me forward, is a Sakaks. Oh, shit! I'm a little terrified of what we're about to find, but we've come so far. Bechtel and his men press ahead, so we have little choice but to keep up. Have you hunted these a lot? I ask. Not often, not often, he tells me. Only when a cooey is needed. They are too fierce otherwise. This will go well. Oh, oh, great, I say dryly. This will go well. Bechtel tells me and gives me, uh, Bechtel tells me and gives me a comforting pat on the arm, which only sends a flare of pain through my new wound again. At least when I get a cooey, Maluk will be able to heal me. At this rate, all she's going to have left are a bunch of Georgia-shaped pieces. I ready the knife I carry with me. Uh, what's happening? One of the new girls asks, shivering in her furs. Her name's Nora, I think, and she's one of the stronger newbies. The ground thumps again, and Vectel points at a copse of pink feathery trees ahead. Take the women in there over there. If the creature comes for you, hide amongst the trees. By climbing them? I look at the other women. I don't think they can climb. You won't need to climb, Vectel says. He cannot get to you through them. I wonder it. I wonder at his words, but there's no time to talk. He presses a kiss to my forehead and then passes Tiffany off to me. She's so weak that she clings to me, and I have to drag her over the trees with Nora's help. It feels a bit sexist to have all the women huddling under the trees as the men go out to fight, but I look at the women around me and feel a little despair. We're weak, exhausted, and not used to all this cold. If the little green men showed up right now, we'd be helpless to fight back against them, even if we outnumbered them. The ground shakes again, and at my side, Kira clutches a spear while Liz moans unhappily. What the fuck is this Jurassic Park shit? I don't know, I tell her. But I ready the knife. I carry it with me. Some give Something gives a high-pitched roar, and the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It seems close. Really freaking close. And the ground shakes again. Megan chokes back a sob of fright, and the other women are whispering. I hiss for silence, because I want to know what the hell is going on. Damn it! The thought of Vectal out there with some huge monster frightens me. What if he gets hurt? What if he... dies? My heart clenches at the thought. In such a short period of time, I've come to care for him more than I'd like to admit, even to myself. I don't want to be here if Bechtel isn't. A gigantic head rises over the trees. I suck in a breath. 
staring in horror. There's a thing with four glowing blue eyes, two sets stack on top of one of the other. It's got enormous tusks and it's covered in long, grayish, shaggy fur. It gives another high-pitched roar and lumbers forward. The ground's shaking. It's taller than all the trees, and as it moves past, I see long, twiggy legs with wide feet pushing through the snow. An alien hunter hangs off of one side, clinging to a spear sticking through the creature's flank. Holy shit, Liz says. What the hell is that? I think it's a succoxed, I say, feeling faint. I look. It looks like a Macy's parade float with legs, and they're going to kill that thing? Dear God. Be careful, Vectal. I send out quietly. More of their men run past, chasing after it with spears. I trick out, try to pick out Vectal on the group, but I don't see him. He doesn't carry a spear, only knives and a sling, and the thought fills me with dread. I wish I had a bow, Liz says as we stare at the creature lumbering past. That's random, Kira comments, her tone awed. We can't take our eyes off the succoxed. I was a champion archer when I was a teenager, Liz comments, though I don't know if I could shoot that thing. Huh is all Kira says. I stride forward through the snow at the creature as the creature lo uh, lumbers away from the trees, the hunters chasing it. Where's Vectal? Where? I follow behind in the distance as the men harass it with spears. The creature bellows again, and his head swings low, dipping toward the ground. An alien grabs one of my jutting tusks, and as the creature jerks his head back, the man goes flying into the creature's head. Barely holding on, I suck in a breath as I recognize the graceful movements and the long, fluttering black hair. Vectal. My hand goes to my mouth, and I press my fingers against my lips so I don't scream in fright. Please don't get killed for me, you think. Please. I watch as he gracefully flips to his feet atop the monster's head. It swings back and forth trying to dislodge him, but Vectal's holding on tight. He pulls something from his vest, a bone blade, I think, and raises it high into the air. With a battle cry, he plunges it downward, and the creature screams and writhes in pain. Behind me, a few of the women choke out cries of their own. I'm breathless as Vectal raises the knife and slams it home over and over again, driving it into the creature's eye. With a final gurgle, the creature staggers. It takes one step forward and then collapses. The ground shudders with the force of it, and I can't help but rush forward to Vectal. I push through the thick, knee-high snow, ignoring my exhaustion. I have to get to him, to know he's right. He's all right. When I do, I see he's covered in blood and gore from the creature. Wiping his, wiping his face clean on one edge of his vest, he grins at me. And it's so boyish and, did you see me? That I choke back my sob and fling my arms around his neck. You scared the shit out of me, I babble in English, not caring that he's getting my new clothing all gunked. Georgie, he asks, putting my, patting my back. Are you well? I am now, I answer in his language. That was scary as hell. They are strong he admits, but not so strong that I would not bring one down for you and the humans. Just as long as this is not a regular occurrence, I tell him. His hand touches my belly, and there is warmth in his shining eyes. We will need one for our kit, and I will gladly do so. All right, all right, I grumble. So what now? He presses a kiss to my forehead. Now we get the cooey, gather the women. My stomach drops at the thought, but I have forced myself to nod. If they risk their lives to get us the symbionts, then the least that we can do is hold up our end of the bargain, since it's for us anyways. I go to Tiffany's side and help her walk, trying to seem more confident about this than I really am. If I freak out, then so will the other humans. I need to be cool, calm, and collected about these things. I manage to remain cool, calm, and collected for all of five minutes as we gather nearby. The men are watching us avidly, hope and hunger both in their eyes. I ignore them, focusing on the gigantic falling succox. The long, spindly legs are splayed and the fat belly of the creature sticks out. I look for something that resembles a remora. Please, please don't look like a remora. But the thick, bushy coat of the creature hides anything that might be living against the skin. Um, where are the cooey? I ask, since the men seem to be waiting for the humans to say something. Inside. Bechtel says. He moves forward and touches my jaw. Are you ready, my Georgie? Oh god, I don't know that I am. I swallow hard. Ooh. Let's do this. He nods and pulls his longest, thickest blade out of the sheath at his belt. I brace myself as he sets the tip of the blade against the creature's belly. In a swift motion, he sinks it deep and then begins to cut. Blood gushes and dribbles out of the wound, and someone behind me makes a choking sound. There's a sickly coppery smell in the air, and I force myself to ignore it. Two of the warriors move forward, and they peel back the creature's wound, revealing a mass of bloodied organs. Just like skin and a deer, Liz breathes at my side in a cur curiously blank voice. No big deal. No sweat. 
Vectal moves to the ribcage of the creature and steps on one side, then pushes against the other. His big arms strain, and then there's a snap like a tree falling in the forest, and the ribs split open. Really, really big deer, Liz says. Vectal, Vectal makes a few cuts, the sound wet and over loud in the quiet evening. He pulls out a giant organ that must be the heart, still pulsing. It's glowing from within. The light dappled and shining a pale blue. With one slit, he opens it, and the light spills out. There are dozens of thin, wriggling gossamer worms in there. Worms. Oh, God. One of the warriors approaches Vectal, and he hands off the heart before gently pulling one of the glowing filaments from it. I think I'm going to be sick, Kira says faintly. I think I am too, but I force myself to remain in place as Vectal re reverently frees the long, coiling strand of light and comes towards me with it cupped in his big hands. It's wriggling and writhing against his palms. They cannot live long out in the cold, he tells me. We must make an incision in your neck and give the Kui a safe place to reside. His eyes are speaking volumes. In this, I must be a leader. In this, I must trust him. I swallow hard, looking at that long, worm-like glowing thing. What? What if it goes to my brain? Like that's any better than your heart? Liz sputters. The Kui is the essence of life. Bechtel tells me, even as he cups the snake-like thing in his hands, his gaze is on my face, and there is a mixture of emotions there. If I turn away now, I'm turning away everything he and his people are offering. I'm turning away a life here in love, all for the potential of a Hail Mary rescue. In the neck, huh? I say, my voice paints. Will it hurt? I don't know. Bechtel approaches me, and I can hear the thing in his hands flicking and making a purring sort of sound. Fair enough, I say. The thing is pressing against his hands, looking for a way to burrow into his skin. I feel faint at the thought of voluntarily letting it inside me, but what choice do I have? I've made my choice. I choose Vectal and our child, who might even now be inside my womb. Do I need to make the cut, I ask him, or will you? I can, he says, and offers his cupped hands to me. I take the cooey with a small grimace. It feels like a sticky strand of spaghetti, impossibly warm despite the cold wintry wind blowing around us. The light flickers faintly as it's transferred to my hands, and I experience a moment of worry. What if Kui can't bond with humans? But Vectal has pulled out a new clean blade and has his hand and his hands has gone to the back of my neck, cupping it. And then there's a then there's really no going back. Are you really gonna do this, Georgie? Kira asks, sounding ill. I really am. I look into Vectal's glowing eyes as he leans in. He presses a kiss to my forehead, and I'm struck again at how wonderful he is. I love you, I say softly. You are my heart, Georgie, he murmurs. A feel, I feel the cool press of the knife against my throat for a quick moment, and then a sting as he nicks me near my collarbone. Not deep, but enough that the blood crusts up and freezes against my skin. Vectal takes the cooey from my hands and lifts it, and as I see his hand with that weird glowing film and approach my bar barred neck, I think, no, 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 wait, wait, I changed my mind, but it doesn't matter. The moment the cooey touches my skin, it begins to burrow, seeking warmth. I suck in a horrified breath as I feel it push through my body. It's like ice water moving through my veins, and I can feel the thing climbing toward my heart and, oh shit, oh shit, everything's gone going dark. Vectal's face is blurring in front of mine. This is a mistake, isn't it? But then, there, there's a warmth. So much warmth. And humming. And then, darkness. My eyes snap open at some point later. It's curious because I can feel the wind blowing and snow falling around me, but I'm not cold anymore. Warm fingers brush over my cheek and I look into Vectal's handsome face. I feel a little stiff and achy overall, but I don't feel as weak as I was before. I lick my lips. Excuse me. How'd it go? Your eyes are a lovely shade of blue, he tells me, voice warm with happiness. Oh? I sit up with his help and look around. Not much time has passed, I think, since I took in the cooey. There's thunder in the distance and the skies are black with night. I blink and look around. I feel the same. There's no weirdness, no, oh my god, there's a tapeworm in me feeling. Everything is quiet. As a snowflake lands on my arm, though, I look around in surprise. I'm warm? A cooey will keep you warm, he says, his hand brushing over my skin. He's touching me everywhere as if he can't quite believe I'm all right. Well, okay. I glance through the camp, and the men are helping the women to their feet. Did they all take it? The cooey? Everyone, 
he says, a proud note in his voice. He helps me stand, though I don't suppose I need the help anymore. I'm just firing oddly enough. I feel... good. You are brave and led the way. I have a lot to live for. The sound of the thunder increases, and as his hand touches mine, I feel... strange. Aroused. It's weird because all he's doing is touching my arm. I look at Vectal in surprise. I fight the urge to kiss his hard mouth, to climb him like a freaking tree, and drag him into the snow and make me sweet, sweet love to me. Good lord, what's going on with me? The thunder rumbles louder, and I look behind me. Vectal chuckles and presses a hand between my breasts. You hear it? What is that noise? It is you, he says. Your cooey sings for me. I press a hand to my chest. Sure enough, the rumble's coming from me. I'm purring. Oh! <laughs> Interesting! He pulls between my legs and my pulse starts to thrum as if he's touched me in naughty, naughty ways just from his fingertips and my chest. Oh, man. I feel... I know, he says, and his eyes glow with a mixture of need and amusement. I can smell your need, mate. Oh, boy, I say faintly. Can... Can anyone else... If they can, I might die of embarrassment. My senses are attuned to you. The others are too busy helping the humans. Look around you, he says, pulling me against him. God, he's warm and big and delicious, and I really want to shove my hands in his pants. It takes me a moment to focus, and I cling to his vest as I try to get a grip on myself. Is this what resonating feels like, I mean? Wow, but like, good lord. I don't know if I can stand being this sensitized around Vectal constantly. Then again, these orgasms are gonna be amazing. My gaze focuses on the women in the distance. Tiffany's on her feet, which is wonderful, and a Sakui male, male dotes on her. Almost every woman seems to be escorted by a man of Vectal's tribe, and the sound of faint purring fills the air. Are they all? Not all, Vectal says, but some. At my worried look, he adds, they will approach things slowly. This is a pro this I promise. Then he grimaces, except for one. One? I look around at the sea of faces and notice that one familiar lippy one is missing. Where's Liz? Rahosh has slunk off with her like a metlack with a kill. Irritation clouds his features. He will answer to the tribe when he returns. My entire body tenses. Is he going to hurt her? Hurt her? The look Vectal gives me is incredulous. He takes her to mate her. Harming her is the last thing on his mind. Boy, I almost feel sorry for Rahosh. He doesn't know what he's gotten himself into taking Liz. She's not about to let an alien run roughshod over her. I'm sure Liz will have a few things to say about that. He gives a wry smile. I'm sure she will too. I wouldn't be surprised if Rahosh brought Liz back, I think to myself. She's a handful. Can we go after them? Rahosh is the best of my hunters. If he does not wish to be found, he will not be found. We can simply wait for them to return. Let me guess, I say dryly. Barefoot and pregnant? He looks puzzled at my words. Why would her feet be bare? Mm, never mind. I pat his chest and then find myself utterly fascinated with the play of his muscles. Oh, wow, Vectal. I feel very... In tune with your resonance? He asks. Under my hand, he begins to thrum louder, and that makes my nipples kind of perky as my cooey responds. I nod. He clasps me against him, and I gasp because it just feels... Amazing. Shall we go somewhere private then, mate? Uh, but the others, the men will take care of them for the night, he says, and traces a finger down my cheek that leaves me shuddering with need. They will need to keep warm and fed while they, uh, they will keep them warm and fed while they adjust to keep their cooey. And in the morning, we shall all start the journey home. Home. After weeks of being captive, it feels so nice to think of a place as home. Well, where can we go? I ask him, lacing my fingers in his. Lead on. But he hesitates. Do you feel real well, my resonance? Do you need to rest? To sleep? Right now, I want to tear your clothing off and put my mouth all around you, I tell him. And the purring in his chest increases. So does the moistness that I'm feeling right now. If I had panties, well, it wouldn't be dry for much longer. Vectal's nostrils flare and he stifles a groan in his throat. Before I can react, he throws me over his shoulders and begins to storm off into the darkness. We will return at daybreak, he calls to one of his men. Enjoy the resonance, the man calls back, and there is envy in his voice. I wiggle with excitement on Vectal's shoulders. God, I should not be so aroused, but man, here I am. The cooey humming through my system is making me feel warm and good, and the intense arousal kind of feels like a bonus. Why was I so against this thing? I touch my breastbone and feel it humming happily underneath. This is all it takes to live at Vectal's side for the rest of my life? Hell, 
I'll take it. I mean, there aren't many toilets, but living as a barbarian? Not so bad when you've got a big, sexy barbarian male with you. Vectal tromps through the snow for several minutes, and just when I'm about to shove a hand down my own pants and take care of the business, he stops. Here is far enough. He sets me down, and I look around with a frown. We're in the middle of nowhere. A few scattered trees nearby. There's a large flat rock here, about waist height, and the sight of it arouses me because I picture Vectal mounting me from behind and just absolutely fucking my daylights out of me. My thighs tighten. Here? His hand goes to my neck, and he pulls me against him in a brutal, possessive kiss. Here, we are far enough away that when they hear you scream with pleasure, they will not think to come and rescue you. <laughs> I blush at his words, but they make the heat pool within my veins. You are one sexy beast, you know that? All I know is that I'm yours, he says to me. His mouth captures mine again, and I feel the scrape of his fangs a moment before his tongue swipes against mine, the bumps playing against my own tongue and sending a spike of fierce desire all through my body. Men of culture, indeed. I moan and slide my hands into the laces of his leggings, as per usual. I want your skin against my own, I tell him. All of you against me. Now. My cooey hums in, in agreement. A moment later, my wandering hands brush against the head of you-know-what, and I feel drops of things that are coming out prior to the actual engagements themselves against the crown. I lift one to my mouth, sexually. It's kind of like nothing I've ever tasted before. It's sweet, musky, and delicious? Hmm. pre cooey But now, I drop to my knees. Goodness, I'm gonna suck the living shit out of you. It is said that the taste of a resonance mate is like no other flavor, he murmurs, his hand brushing through my hair. I know there is no finer thing than your dew on my tongue. Dew? <laughs> we have to talk about love words in the future. I smile up at him, and I pull at his pants until everything is freed below the lacings. I take him in my hand, and naturally, the pleasure is hot, throbbing even, and I continue to enjoy the deliciousness, each one. Very delicious. More delicious than the last. My hand steals to my own thighs, sliding into my leggings that Melek gave me so I can kind of rub myself in the process. I'm kind of wild here. All the while, my cooey is humming and throbbing in tune to, to, the, to the rhythm with Vectals. It kind of feels amazing. I seek a figure within myself and moan. <laughs> this ain't enough. On your back from me, my mate breathes, his hands caressing me. If you must be filled so quickly, allow me to be the one to do it. Oh my god. I don't need any convincing. I'm already moist and slippery, so I can take that. Feeling naughty? I get up on the stone and press my belly and thrust my hips into the air. <laughs> you want to do it from behind, Vectal? Remember that night in the cave? You'd said you'd never done it that way. He growls. Urgh, and I feel his mouth press against my back. Never. Tails. But I have no tail, I say, and I wiggle my booty. Vectal gri grips my hips and his hands rip at my leggings. I am trying to help him too. And then, well, I'm a bit exposed. And I begin to feel the hard presses. And I spread myself wider. Yes, I breathe. Please. And then my mate pushes within. And he's rather large that I have to catch my breath. I can feel the ridges. I can feel the bumps. All the things that we had seen previously. And I'm, it's kind of tight. But man, it feels pretty good. I claw at the rock that I have in front of me, desperate for something to hold on to, but there's nothing. It's just Vectal, and him, in me. He pushes against me, even more, and I can feel something, something prod at me, toward my butt cheek. And it sends an entirely new sensation to, uh, shooting through me, and I practically leap off the rock. Oh, could you do that one again? And I cry when he pulls back out. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely that again. Then he continues, and instead of the rubbing sensation from earlier, the spur that he had pushes up against the entrance of my behind, and it feels kind of weird, kind of tight, but oddly arousing. We're definitely going to have to add doggy style to our repertoire, I tell him, panting. My sweet resonance, he grits out. You... Something bright flashes in the sky. I free... Wait, I freeze... I freeze on their vectal, and we watch, breathless, as a spaceship, swimming with lights, hovers in the skies over the mountain. It circles and then hangs in the sky over the spot where the old cargo bay was left behind. Where we were left behind. I can't move as I watch the sky, waiting to see what happens. Over me, <laughs> cocked deep inside me, vectal is frozen as well. The ship seems to hover forever. Then the lights blink off, and it lifts up, winking out of the atmosphere. I... 
gasp with relief. It's gone? It seems that they do not want Medlax, Vectal says, amusement in his voice. And you, my sweet human, are now forever part of this world. I touch my breastbone and then I begin to thrum anew, my purring matching Vectals. I'm yours forever, aren't I? Forever, he says, going deeper once more. He continues to do this over and over, and it's swift, rough, just like, just, just like, whoa, just like how he's taken me, Vectal's own release is but a moment behind. This time, when it happens, I don't feel the heat of it this time, because my body's warmer now, and that's kind of how heat differentials work. I'm not sure how it's possible because a fever can damage humans, but I suspect, the, I suspect the Kui is busy inside of me, rewriting all kinds of genetic things to make sure that I live a long and healthy life on this new planet. Vectal lifts me off of the rock and pulls me into his arms, and he just can't stop kissing me. I laugh and kiss him back, and then we fall into the snow together, our pants down. I huff, exhausted, but still humming from within. I stare up at the night sky, checking for more spaceships, but all is quiet. For better or for worse, we are here. I'm thinking it's for better, in fact. I know it's for better, because the man next to me pulls me against him and begins to lick and nibble at my earlobes. I'm pretty sure we're going to have to do that again, I tell him breathlessly. My cooey doesn't seem to be calming down much. I'm told it's most intense during the first few days of resonance. After that, we should be able to walk normally, he teases. Well, thank God for that. And then what comes next? Home, our den together. He touches my stomach, our kit. His fingers caress my flat stomach, hopefully the first of many human and Sakui matings. That sounds pretty good to me. I push him onto his back, noticing that even my busted wrist doesn't hurt much anymore. The Kui at work, maybe? I smile down at my mate. Just as long as you don't go resonating for some or anybody else. He shakes his head somberly. One resonance mate. We mate for life. And I like the sound of that. Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. What a ride. My goodness. That was tantalizing. What's my heart rate at? I actually feel like I've calmed. I, I feel like I'm more calm at the end of this entire stream than I was earlier. That's absolutely incredible. <laughs> this is great. Well, that was actually a really compelling story. I got to say, all things considered, um, and now I feel more confident uh, in, um, in everything else. Sorry, my thing is like kind of, oh, there we go. It's flying off of air. I'm very calm now. Dude, who knew? The release of my, uh, I guess, innermost wiles as I read a book containing, um, well, you know, you know, erotica. And apparently uh, worked out pretty well for my psyche and my heartbeat and stuff. What a very cute book, indeed. The heart rate is way lower previously before, as I said, as I got up walking around. I feel like Anna could actually touch that book and not be too afraid. Yeah, I feel like she'd, she'd kind of stutter like around the, the more like sexual scenes and stuff. But for the most part, I feel like she might actually enjoy it. She's more into like the like the kind of like sappy romance stuff. But I know that she's read potentially <laughs> uncouth books before. <laughs> so it might actually be something that, <laughs> excuse me, she might enjoy. I'm glad that my hiccups decided to wait until the end of the six-hour stream to be able to do this. But this was fun. I enjoyed this. I am very, very thankful for everybody pulling their points together to allow me to finally get to this book. This has been sitting in my collection for, I think, almost two years now, and I've just been meaning to find a good reason to do it. And uh, as I like to do most on streams, I just kind of like to do the things that I don't necessarily normally do, and I really don't do much reading, to be honest. And I certainly don't do much uncouth reading, either. It's just not really my thing but it was actually kind of fun, all things considered. And I certainly enjoyed myself. So thank you everybody much, whoa. Thank you everybody so much. That's the book. Um, all things considered, this felt pretty fun. So maybe we'll do this again. Not so sure. All things considered, despite the voices, my throat is actually feeling pretty good. And I think it's because I kept up with the water. So if you were doing voices and stuff while reading aloud, perhaps you should consider water, water. And I believe honey, Leonard, honey lemon ginger tea. I think we'll work too. I don't know, man. I'm tired. It's like two o'clock in the morning over here. Six hours later and we've all grown a little bit more. And my cooey is now throbbing. In any case, to everybody out there, thank you so, so much for joining me for this little bit of a session here. Reading on stream, not too bad. And we got to watch my heart rate the whole time. That's actually a kind of cool feature. I like that. Should play right again, again around with that some more. I am more or less just going to call it right here. And so we'll see who else is out there to see if we can spread the love to anybody at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
and it seems like things are okay. So I'm just gonna kind of end it here as I chillax back in my in my lounge and chill. I know that I'm gonna be getting myself some sleep. To everybody out there, if the moon is rised where you are, if the if the moon has risen over the lumps of the distance like a throbbing erection, may you have a wonderful rest of your nights. If perhaps the sun is burning like the heat of passion where you are, may you have a wonderful rest of your morning. Somewhere in between, two suns, two moons, or otherwise, I hope y'all have a wonderful one. This has been fun. And until next time, y'all, when I see you again at the bar on Wednesday. Thanks again, everybody, so much. Until then, y'all, bye.